gracious, everybody, if it isn't episode 130 of the Warhammer 40,000 podcast known as Look Out, Sir. My name is Dan, and it's that bit at the beginning of the show where I take it upon myself to introduce my co-host, my pal, my very special friend, Phil. How you doing, Phil? Aww. On this, Sean's birthday, no less. <sighs> it is. Happy birthday, Sean. If you're listening at home, if I think he listens, doesn't he? he I might do. He's like one of many of our friends who, you know, seems supportive to our face, but uh, behind our back are uh, sniggering and, you know, mocking us in the way that only they can. Exactly. Quite, quite likely. But if you are listening, happy birthday for, even though time of recording is your birthday, obviously by the time you listen to it, it won't be. So belated birthday wishes. Indeed. How are you doing anyway, Phil, besides obviously utterly beside yourself for the fact that it's, uh, you know, Sean's birthday at the moment? I mean, I'm doing not too bad. I, 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 you know, I'm glad that I finally finished painting my Minotaurs to, sadly, not quite 1,750 points. uh, Because once I'd finished painting up my two Contemptors, yes, everyone, I'd done it in time uh, for the RFW2 event. Uh, I actually realised I'm slightly low on points, uh, and I've actually painted up 1,735, I think, points. I- I'm short by a few, and there's no way of rounding it to a nice even number. It all went terribly wrong. No, I know. Well, I had a yeah, I had a dilemma when I was going to the event as to whether to drop a few things to squeeze in an assassin to round it up to a nice full number. Yeah. Well, you know, these are the uh, quibbles, the uh, the concerns that we all have to manage when it comes to, you know, building the perfect army lists. I myself cannot help myself but uh, try desperately hard to uh, ensure that I get to exactly the number that I need to hit. Um, I'm currently working on my Imperial Knight list uh, for this weekend's Warhammer World event. Uh, and currently, I hate to say... I'm at 995 points, or 1,995 points. It's a little bit irritating. Um, I'm probably just going to end up putting a melter gun uh, onto one of the Helverins, just so as the points run exactly right. Um, But none of my Helverins have a melter gun modelled on them. Um, So I'm just going to put it on there so as I feel okay when I look at the sheet. But it will probably just have the... uh, the uh, the heavy stubber that's actually modelled on it. Yeah, I mean you can you can always mark it out in some way to rep- represent it. Maybe I could uh, heat it up in the oven before it turns up. You know, have it a little bit warm to indicate that melter like quality. Yes, yes, you could. On the topic of nights, though, Phil, what are we talking about in this? Uh, not week because we don't do it weekly anymore. Although we might do here and there and everywhere, but nonetheless, what's this one about? Well, the big topic is the Imperial Knights Codex. So, but not just that, we've got other things to talk about. So, strap in for another long, 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 long episode. Uh, so, we presume we haven't actually got around to recording the bulk of it, which is the Imperial Knight. Thing. No. But, but if we stick to form, it's going to be pretty long. It should be pretty long. We're also in the outro talking about Warhammer Fest, doing the catch-ups on the bits we didn't talk about in the last uh, episode. So we'll be talking about the specialist games, uh, you know, the Forge World, uh, Necromunda, and Kill Team that happened on the Friday, plus a bit of Horus Heresy, uh, which was their big day on the Saturday. Are we also going to talk about RFW2? Are we going to fit it in? don't know we did or rather phil did rfw2 it feels like we need to give rfw2 a little bit more of its own time so maybe what we'll do is put out an episode next week we haven't discussed this at this point let's not let's just pretend we didn't even say that and we'll move along to the five star review Peter, Peter. Oh, oh, hello, Dad. What are Dad. you doing in here, son? Oh, I'm, I'm what just... have I told you about wasting your time with these little plastic figurines? It's not a waste of time. I like it. How dare you talk back to me, Peter? Oh. It's about time you grew up. I don't want to grow up. Oh, man, maybe there was something on the radio. Yeah, this is nicer. Peter, Peter. What's, 
What's that? That's right, it's me, the ghost of a warm winning TV and radio presenter, Jeremy Beadle. Jeremy Beadle? Yeah, that's right. Wow. Now let me tell you here, Sonny, my dad was always telling me to grow up, and what? I never did. And look how successful I was. So oh. ignore him, Peter, and keep playing with that little plastic crack. And while you're at it, listen to the Lookout Sir podcast, which wow. right now it's time for the five-star review. Wow, thanks, Jeremy. Who are you talking to with there, son? Jeremy Beadle. What? No! All right, Phil. This week's five star review comes from where might you expect? Um, well, it really needs to be Facebook because we need some catching up to do on those reviews. That is absolutely correct, my friend. It may not have shocked you that I have chosen Facebook uh, because moments ago I remarked that I just saw a video of a friend of mine falling over into a swimming pool, uh, which is the sort of thing that you would see within the confines of Facebook, much like this five star review, uh, which is also there within Facebook but quite different from an individual uh, of, you know, relative size and scale falling over into a swimming pool. Uh, you could argue that one far better than the other, uh, but I'll leave it to you to determine which might be which. But um, yeah, Facebook, Phil, well done. Uh, this one comes from November of 2021. Um, so what is that now? November, that's six months ago? Yes. But exactly, because yeah. this is Sean's birthday, and from November 17th to now, exactly six months, my goodness. Um, so yeah, and it comes from an individual called Mike, surname withheld, because you know how that whole thing works, uh, and they have left us a five-star review on Facebook, and if you would like to do the same, you know how to do so, go to Facebook, go to Spotify, you can't do it on Spotify, but maybe you might try, it won't result in anything, but it's one of the places where we are available just not one of the places you can leave five-star reviews. But you can do it on Facebook. You can do it on iTunes. You can do it on Audible. <sighs> Pretty exciting. Uh, and you could potentially do it other places that we don't even know about. So feel free to let us know if uh, you've done that, because otherwise we won't. Uh, so, yeah, five-star review. Pretty cool. We have merchandise. Did we do that at the end? I can always never remember. Yes, merchandise now. That's a thing. And also Patreon. Thank you so much to our lovely patrons, who with which we are in debt to greatly right actual in debt like we owe them money that's how it works that's how it works i didn't read the small print when we signed up yes to it. yeah we gotta pay it. it all back one day exactly that's exactly how it works unfortunately we don't have too many of them so uh, it's a relatively manageable sum still for the moment but uh you know one day maybe it's all going to get a little bit problematic so you know if you really want to create a massive problem for us in the future give us loads of your money now um, and you can sure be be like a loan shark and break our kneecaps if we don't pay back. Well, well exactly. Start with Phil's. Um, you know, maybe end there. That'll be fine. Phil can Phil can take the hit, right, mate? I mean, precious kneecaps. Each one's worth a good few hundred bob. So yeah, why not? You reckon? Hmm. Oh, nice. Fair enough. Fair enough. What I was going to say though is, please, you know, please familiarise yourself with the actual terms and conditions of uh, Patreon before deciding to support this uh project because you know ultimately what we just said there was not in any way representative of what actually happens when it comes to this i don't even begin to know what actually happens so you know t's and c's apply anyway <laughs> mike's surname withheld phil has left us a five-star review thank you very much mike it reads it's a short and snappy one so uh let's indulge found them i presume them being us look out sir one of forty thousand uh, on Spotify and listened to the Hobby Fatigue episode. That was a pretty good episode back uh, way back when, I seem to remember. We were definitely struggling mm. during those lockdowns with maintaining our enthusiasm for all things hobby. So I definitely remember at the time that one went over pretty well, don't you, Phil? Yeah, I think so. I think a lot of people could relate. Well, Mike, surname withheld, clearly did, because after having listened to that episode, it made him start painting all over again. And that's pretty much the full extent of what was said uh, by Mike. So obviously, you know, a great thing, Phil. We made Mike, name withheld, surname withheld, start painting again. I wonder how he's getting on today. Maybe we should leave him a message on Facebook informing him that he's going to appear in episode 130. Mm, and then ultimately, finally. Exactly. 
and then offer them the opportunity to show us their progress. That what has happened nice. in the last six months? Phil has managed to finally finish two contemptors in that time. They've what probably, possibly could Mike have done? They've probably done a whole army, if not two. There you go. There you go. I always use that red dwarf analogy, don't I, where they talk about when uh, Rimmer gets put into the wormhole and he's stuck there for like 6,000 years or whatever it is. Uh, and he, he remarks that he's not the Robinson Crusoe type. and that In that time frame, he won't have finished planing the wood. That's how I assert, you know, yourself into the hobby conversation. Mm. 7,000 like years? I won't have finished scraping the mould lines. <laughs> isn't isn't that the episode where he ends up creating a whole Rimmer civilization, though? Well, it's arguable. Uh, well, he he's the catalyst for the civilization. Oh. I would argue they themselves kind of created it. Oh, he, you know, outside he, he of He created him. the first one. Mm. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Although, it, it, you know, technically they were all his siblings, but don't worry, he was just not going to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> Which, Moving by on. the way... Uh, such a good episode. Anyway, thank you, Mike. Phil. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you so much for listening, contributing, leaving us a Facebook uh, five-star review, even though we sadly have only just gotten around to it. Uh, so, yes, we are very curious as to what you're currently building and painting. Uh, if you're not someone that we somehow regularly chat to on Instagram, because that does sometimes happen, and we don't know what your Instagram is. So what I'm going to say is, if you do in future for other people leave a five star review on facebook and you have a social media uh, 40k account of an instagram persuasion let us know what your handle is we will give that a little plug and we will also go check you out so we can see your hobby progress so uh, yeah mike please do let us know i hope you've uh, painted up a lot but yeah crikey you'll probably paint up a whole unit just from this episode alone Quite possibly, quite possibly. But yeah, thank you very much, Mike. You've been super awesome. Uh, as has everyone who's been kind enough to leave us a five-star review. We endeavour to comment and or, you know, highlight all of you. Um, and we apologise that we are so far behind. One of the pitfalls of our less frequent output. Maybe we might need to go back to a time field where we start doing two reviews a week. Could you only imagine? Have, we've never done that before, have we? We did early doors when it was like a new novelty to us. Oh. Like, oh, look at these. We we're just calling them out as and when they came in, whereas now it's become a bit more structured. Fair enough. I mean, that would imply that we get so many reviews, it would be crazy. I mean, even though it's a bit of a backlog, it's not a huge amount of reviews between this and it finishing. It's just that this one came a little while ago. But then I suppose maybe iTunes, other places. Anyway, the point is, is thank you very much. We're going to get on with the show now. We're talking about Imperial Nights. We hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for everyone listening, supporting. You're all awesome. It's time for Lookout Sir 40k podcast, episode 130, Imperial Knights. Transitional noise. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> all right there, you beautiful people. It's time for the Codex Imperial Knights review, walkthrough, whatever it is that these end up being. What would you classify these segments as, Phil? We, we, I think we tend to call them reviews, codex we do. reviews. We yeah. do. Do we ever... I suppose we do offer a kind of closing for... Should we start giving a score, an overall score? This is too early to introduce this concept, perhaps. Maybe uh, too late, way, you mean, surely. Well, exactly. Maybe when 10th edition rolls around next year, we will start the 10th edition codex review scoring oh, system. Do we have to review the codex? Into, I'm a bit like, this is a 9th edition phenomena and then yeah. 10th edition we do fun stuff where we might do a synopsis of a codex but not do a, a talk through which is what we uh, or a flip through is which is yeah kind of no i agree that, with that these are quite in-depth i think a more casual discussion about the codex uh but that does involve us actually having read it prior to the episode which i know is a rarity for us well um, exactly i hate having to actually do work i like uh this kind of system because although it seems like work it's it's much less so than actually being prepared but that being said i have actually read this codex already um i've even why is that, why is that? well because i've just randomly decided that i'm going to run them this weekend at warhammer world um i thought to myself they're an easy army to run so basically full disclosure i wasn't supposed to be going to warhammer world this weekend uh richie's friend scott was um 
but Richie's friend Scott was unable to attend and Richie unwilling to, or rather preferring not to go through the refund policy of uh, Warhamster World, decided to ask me if I'd like to go. And I thought, cool, blimey, yes, I'll give it a bu- uh, give it a go. But, um, but yeah, in the doing of, I needed to work out what army I was going to take. I own an Imperial Knight army. This book has just come out. I thought it would be useful to actually think about what kind of list I might build with it in light of the fact that we're going to do this review. But also I just find the fact that the army will comprise of seven models incredibly appealing. I'm like, that That will do. I either win big or I lose dramatically. Um, and that's fine with me. You know, that's a perfectly reasonable way to approach gaming, in my opinion, Phil. No, that is fair enough. What happened to you? Because you were like, I'm going all in on my elder. What has happened to your elder? So what's happened to my elder is is that my elder, I am attempting to paint to a relatively medium standard, um, which takes an amount of time to do. Uh, time which I uh, have not had in great abundance. So ultimately, they are a long-term renewed project that I'm hoping I will have ready uh, the first segment of them ready for the doubles at the end of June. Ooh. And then and then moving forwards, I'll go from there. But, I mean, yeah. and, and again, uh, though, uh, there, there's a good chance you'll have them painted up, your entire army painted up before I have the next portion of my Minotaur's army done because it's a good few hundred points that I need to do. There you go. But yeah, so anyway, so Imperial Knights, I have actually read the book beforehand, so I will hopefully have a little bit more of an insight on things than I usually might. Um, I, I've read bits, but not all. So the general vibe is is that we read these for the first time because we feel like, as we've already expressed, it's one, much easier for us to do, but two, uh, it gives much more of an opportunity for you and us to kind of experience the book for the first time together and trying to kind of understand and and, and come together to form an agreement on what some of the weird stuff we might encounter within um that will still hopefully be the case within this but slightly less so um given the fact that uh as i say we read it to some extent but it is customary phil to review the cover of a codex and that is no less the case here so we have the codex of imperial knights what is your vibe on codex cover imperial knights i like it uh it's not one of the greatest it's definitely not one of the worst um i'm trying to think what we last reviewed what was the codex tyranids, tyranids. It, it has a similar motif to tyranids one big thing in the middle you can vaguely see a few things in the background and the foreground but nothing is particularly detailed in that respect um scale wise it looks very good there's a warlord titan in the background but beyond that and some space marines and an armager in the front you can't really see anything and it's not as grim dark as say the admech cover which i have to say is probably the pinnacle of the ninth edition covers um, i think we so say that not... every time phil so i don't think anyone's gonna well, be shocked yes, here you say it. exactly um th- there is some artwork in here that is at that level though i will give that as a small snippet of uh, information as a um, teaser as a taster um but yeah the artwork's good it's strong i like the you know it's very atmospheric with the lighting and the guns and the explosions and there's a nice sense of scale um but there's not much to it i don't think yeah i would agree with that i think one of the things about the imperial knights in the general sense is they are quite a different uh kind of uh you know creature within the world of warhammer 40,000. they kind of stand above um the rank and file which i think offers a lot more opportunity for artists to kind of try and express some of the more chaotic aspects of the battlefield i think they've done quite a good job uh with the various chaos space marines uh being flung around uh at this imperial knight's footsteps um but broadly speaking yeah i think this is a good cover um i think you know for the most part i think almost all of the warhammer 40,000 covers with the exception of the uh default black templar codex are good i think black templar codex resides in its own little special place as the bad one 
not the John Blanche actual. No, I know, I, I know the one you mean. I didn't. I quite liked it. I didn't think it was that bad. I think there's the bad one, Phil. Potentially it's the bad one. some odd perspective stuff happening um, on it, but beyond that, I don't think it was t- terrible. Don't lie to yourself. The bad one. Anyway, nonetheless, this resides firmly in the mid tier, and that is where it will reside. This is as a cover goes, middle, middle. I don't know if it's upper middle or lower middle. I think I like it less than the Tyranids Codex, which I also middle 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 middle. So yeah. now with this existing, perhaps Tyranid Codex goes up a peg. I don't know. It's yeah, underwhelming is what I would say about it, but it does communicate quite elegantly what an Imperial Knight is and what they're up to. So, well, yeah. there's another image which does the same thing. It's almost like for those in the UK know what page three is. This is a page six. There's a beautiful, like, man spreading shots of the, uh, the, the throne mechanicum and the pilot sort of lounging back uh, in his night. Phenomenal bit of artwork uh, over on page six. Also on pages seven and eight. Oh, well, this was the one I was actually talking about earlier. This is super grim dark, uh, hashtag Codex Surf, as I like to call it. Uh, I want these to be models. And if Imperial Knights ever expanded out to have foot soldiers, which I believe it really could do, I agree. Um, these are the kind of people it should be super knightly, super feudal. Um, yeah, really grim dark. There's literally a very kind of Russian Cossack, uh, like kind of uh, Orthodox priest that is uh, an Adeptus Mechanicus tech priest with spider legs. Uh, phenomenal. I mean, this is if this, if this could somehow have been the cover, it would be up there with the Admech one. I agree with that statement 100%. I think this is a beautiful piece of artwork, but unfortunately doesn't really sadly embody the obvious this is imperial knights yes this is a knight yes yeah 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 but that is a piece of artwork that perhaps if it ever comes about as being available for purchase on games workshops rt shop i may well Mm. invest yeah um because that's quite pretty um overall though i would say that like the production and layout of this book is very fitting with the knight's theme like there's tons of banner designs, the household artwork that they've put together. I mean, I didn't have the eighth edition one, but I think I maybe had the seventh edition codex. So a lot of the artwork seems new to me, at least. Um, and I'm sure some the two that we've just pointed out definitely will be new for this edition. Um, but it feels like they, they've done a fair bit of extra uh, little snippets. Uh, so, you know, the households page, like the banner artwork that you get on the households. Fantastic. I mean, it's hard to believe. I think the Knights first got introduced in 2014, I want to say. I think they were first brought to life in 2014, um, maybe 2015. But I'm pretty confident it was 2014. But again, I could be wrong. Irrespective, you know, it's a relatively within the confines of Games Workshop releases, a relatively short time uh, for this faction. And I think, you know, the work that they've done to kind of flesh it out in the way that they've done it is quite exciting. It's interesting with this particular release though um overall not talking codex specifically but knights in general um that knights didn't get anything which is weird um given yeah how popular knights have been i i i'm i'm shocked we didn't get a new armager i'm shocked we didn't get a new dominus potentially as in one of the big the big boy kits I mean, I understand why we probably didn't get the big ones, but the Armager was the one that really threw me. It's like, we should have probably have got an Armager. I understand that they wanted to prioritise fleshing out the Chaos Knights range. And I understand that why that was a priority, but it's just a little bit of a shame that there wasn't a new Knight. Yeah, I, I yeah, I think you're, you're t- you've totally hit the nail on the head, though. Like, they want to make the Chaos Knights Codex on a par with the existing Imperial Knights before Imperial Knights run away with yet another kit. So, it, I mean, they might go, well, we're, we're done. We're, we're pretty good. We don't need anything else. I would always thought it would be good for the Imperial Knights to have a psychic uh, chaos, sorry, a psychic knight, but the Chaos already have that as an option. Yeah. Um, so maybe that feels more specific to the realms of Chaos, even though there is a, 
I believe, a loyalist psychic warlord titan that you can have in Adeptus Titanicus. So to me, it felt like maybe both could have it as like a rare uh, kind of offshoot. Um, going, and I, and I mentioned this now because I was looking through it and I was like, oh, there's no there's no character knights in here. And then I discovered Canis Rex is still in there. Mm-hmm. But do you, do you remember Gerastius, the green knight, which was the first character knight? I do, yes. That they produced, this was back in... It was a white dwarf. Edition. In fact, no, I think it, it was a white was... dwarf. No, You're right. It, it, um... came, it came out in White Dwarf initially, and then it was a free online download. Um, oh no, I think it was part on. of the. Um, I think it was part of the 2015, 2016 Advent Calendar range of uh, eBooks that they did. Do you remember that they did the cipher rules in a in a Advent I, Calendar I, eBook? I think he I, was I, one I, of those. I yeah, but I think prior to that it was White Dwarf because I remember oh, possibly, having it in possibly. White Dwarf when White Dwarf was weekly. And mm. his special abilities were pretty cool. Uh, he had a free up invulnerable save base. Imagine, um, imagine. He had the it will not die special rule, where back when universal special rules were a thing, so it regenerated uh, wounds, and then it got a bonus. It could, um, I think, shoot and charge, which is something you couldn't do back then. Um, so it had that ability as well, which it baked into it. So. And there is a, a photo of it. It's a very green knight, uh, teal coloured knight photographed in the book. So it, it does exist. I'm I'm a little disappointed they haven't bought it back as just an extra character to have because Canis Rex just as one. Oh, I mean, that's OK, but they could have done more. Um, and that feels like a sort of a no brainer, easy thing to do. Um, yeah. But I'm sure they've got their reasons. Yeah, it would have been quite cool to have included yet another free blade character. Um, but hey ho, we are where we are. Um, I think that green character was done in conjunction with the mobile game, wasn't he? He was part of that whole shebang. Um, I, I suspect. I think he's he's included in it, but the character came out beforehand. Okay, fine. So he was like a skin, so you could or a character. No, I never played it. But, uh, I just remember there was some kind of. Uh, Variable. Anyway, there you go. So yeah, look. I mean, in the general sense, the release has been eh. The uh, it feels like this book has been massively overshadowed by its uh, its chaos equivalent, I suppose. But um, at the end of the day, Imperial Knights are a really significant and important part of Games Workshop's model portfolio, if you will. I think they're a uh, you know now become a real kind of staple of the game. And I think overall, just to kind of preface this, I think this book is actually an interesting, you know, quite rich, um, you know, tome in terms of what it offers Imperial Knight players. I think it gives more flexibility to Knight players. I think it will give uh, Knight players more tools to ultimately be able to actually win games in Knight Edition. Um, But intriguingly, with the way that, you know, power creeps and um, overall kind of changes have occurred with other dexes. It feels odd that these guys haven't necessarily received any aggressively over the top kind of power buffs in places. I think we saw leaks, or not leaks, sorry, we saw fake versions of the Imperial Knight Codex doing the rounds online. Oh, vaguely remember that ages and, ago, yeah. Yeah, and that gave the impression that these boys were going to be off the chain. As it is, they're mostly the same, but relatively adjusted. So it's it's interesting. It's almost like the ninth book from 8th edition with a number of changes to sort of make it slightly more balanced and then ultimately a series of tools to help them perform better in ninth edition, which I think in a lot of respects, having played a lot of Imperial Knights throughout ninth edition, I think it's all they needed. Um, so overall, I think, you know, as someone who's been playing Knights a lot lately, I, you know, I would go so far as to say I'm pretty happy with it, broadly speaking. But let's go through it. Let's make sure that, you know, I'm uh, accurate in my assertions and um, we'll take it from there. So weirdly, just to say from the outset, effectively, when it comes to Imperial Knights, there are actually three flavors of Imperial Knights, right? So there's Questor, uh, Questor Imperialis, there is Questor Mechanicus, and then there are three blades. And they all have different kind of abilities and warlord traits and well not warlord traits, but they have different abilities, oaths and things that they can do. Well, not, again, not even oaths, but exalted court things and stuff like that. Basically, they're different while still broadly the same. 
Um, so your army can behave really differently depending on what of the you know free variables you occupy. Um, and then yeah, and then throughout this, we'll probably refer a lot to Armager, um, Questorus, and Dominus class chassis. These essentially refer to the armagers being the armagers, the little buggers, the little ones, the yeah. little ones, the Questorus ones. The, the normal the normal ones, ones yeah, yeah, yeah 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 and then, and then the, was it dominus of the, the big two the, the, the valiant and oh, what's the yeah, other castellan castellan that's it yeah so you know there's a lot of that terminology banded around uh this is definitely one of those books where you kind of have to from the outset have an understanding of the kind of ecosystem of knight units in order to understand and given the way that we normally review these decks we won't start talking about what's what until the end essentially so in terms of data sheet reviews and things so just be aware of that um but beyond that i can't think of any specific kind of um footnotes worth mentioning or kind of clip notes worth mentioning before we get into it mate i don't know if there's anything else super special about knights that we think we need to address before um, we get into it. I, I, th I think we just need to be aware that there are obviously forge world variants as well of course, and i of assume course. um i think i remember checking for one of our listeners actually that the um Forge World ones have already had their keywords updated to be in line with the kind of the new keywords that they've got. Um, yes. Yeah, they, they've updated keywords, although interestingly, unless I've missed something, there are a number of things in this book that are not presently available to the Forge World variants, and that does massively change the way this uh, army plays. And we'll point those out as we get into it, but I would definitely say that... Um, the upside of the Forge World Knights is certainly now offset against some of the things that you're going to miss out on and some of the things that 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 potentially I wouldn't necessarily say you need, but some of the stuff that really kind of makes this whole army sing now. So it's interesting. I think um yeah, there's definitely rules. Unless of course they've FAQ'd to add these things, but we'll get to it when we get to it. Uh, right, okay, cool. So let's get into it. Detachment abilities. This is where we like to start. Phil, do you want to go through that? Yeah, yeah. So obviously Imperial Knights Detachments is one that only includes models with the Imperial Knight keyword, excluding agents of the Imperium and unaligned, which is the standard rules. Um, Imperial Knight Detachments gain the Knight Lances and Wandering Hero abilities. Uh, so Imperium Knight units in Imperial Knights Detachments uh, gain the Unyielding Knight, uh, Household Traditions, and Questor Allegiance um, Oaths abilities. And then you've got Armager class units in Imperial Knights Detachments gain the Objective Secured ability. Um, note that Imperial Knight Super Heavy Auxiliary Detachments still get these detachment abilities, even though Super Heavy Auxiliary Detachments do not normally gain detachment abilities. So that's allowing you to take a Knight in a different army, uh, there are obviously uh, rules uh, which will turn a knight into agents of the Imperium as well, but we'll talk about that when we um, get to so it. It's only one. It's only uh, two away, as it were, or even just one away. Oh, okay. We'll We're almost lances, there. And then it literally will tell you in a second. Okay. Uh, so knight lances, if this detachment is a super heavy detachment, or if you're playing a combat patrol battle and this detachment is a super heavy auxiliary detachment, select one armager class, questorus class, or dominus class model in this detachment. That model gains the character keyword, mm. uh, which is quite cool. Uh, if this detachment contains between one to two questorus class models, or if it contains between three to five armager class models, the detachment command benefits are changed to plus three command points if your war order is part of this detachment. Uh, I'm assuming that means you're effectively getting your command points refunded. Correct. So the the, the, the following bu bullet point is the same, but it's worth you probably reading it out. But basically, in any instance, when you take these super heavy, heavy detachments, because super heavy detachments are weird, because as soon as you have free Lord of War um, of a specific type or something Oh, it in gets there. super expensive, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it gets super expensive, but you get refunded appropriately. But yeah, no, carry on, mate. Yeah, so basically if it contains uh, three or more Questorus class or six or more Armager class models uh, and one or more Titanic units, this detachment gains a plus six command points if you're warlords part of that detachment. So depending on how many you've got in there, depends on how many CP you get refunded, which basically offsets how much the actual... Um, 
detachment will cost you normally. There was uh, people online trying to just see if they could game it to start with 15 CP because of this. Oh, like, there, oh, there, were, there were always is, though, um, and that was the same with uh, Dark Angels, not Dark Angels, um, Dark Elder. Because do you remember Dragaria. if you took their kind of special um, raiding party, it gave yes, you some yeah, yeah. benefit. Although I think that one was legit until it got FAQ'd. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. This so, one, yeah. as far as I can tell, you can't break it unless someone already has, in which case, fair play to you. But to mm. the best of my knowledge, it's there and written in such a way as it will refund you appropriately to put you onto 12 command points and then ultimately you'll spend on stratagems to reduce that down accordingly but ultimately yeah you you there as far as i'm aware at least at the moment you can't start with 15 um due to shenanigans yeah unless of course you can and i'm wrong and that does happen often but um, Mm. wandering Uh, heroes you were talking about that weren't you phil yeah so uh if this detachment is a super heavy auxiliary detachment that contains one free blade unit until the end of the battle, that unit gains the agent of the Imperium keyword. Only one free blade unit uh, in your army can have this keyword. Uh, so that allows you to take effectively a knight in another army as part of the agents of the Imperium. So it isn't, um, well, normally it doesn't use up an extra detachment slot, but obviously it sort of has to for. Yeah, so the way this guys. is done is you don't have agents of Imperium until the game starts. So essentially the way it's done is when you're mustering your army, the model doesn't get it, but when the game starts. Uh, so until the yeah. end of the battle. So you still it's... need the detachment, so you're still paying the CP for yes. the detachment, unlike, uh, say, a freebie Inquisitor or freebie Assassin, which is part of the detachment that you already have, like the battalion. Well, part of example. a brigade patrol or battalion. You can't yeah. add a freebie agent of the Imperium to a vanguard detachment or a spearhead, for example. Mm. Or can you add them to a super heavy detachment? Um, their rules for agents of the Imperium is specific. However, if you did want to add an agent of the Imperium to your knight army, you can still take the auxiliary detachment. So you can take auxiliary detachment and add an Inquisitor or add an Assassin, but you have to pay two CP for the privilege. You can't yeah. just get it. As part yeah, because the because they have the agents of the Imperium keyword baked into their data sheet, so they Correct. always have it. I think as well, there's some ways like with Inquisition where you could theoretically take like a Vanguard detachment and have everyone in it with Agents of the Imperium or I think it's the um, the Rogue Traders specifically have Agents of the Imperium. Um, yes. So you could yeah. do a Rogue Trader detachment if you were looking for some uh, some infantry elements and perhaps Phil could offer you the opportunity to do, express the whole... Uh, you know, nightly assistants, as it were, that uh, that, that that were pictured in uh, pages seven oh, yes. and eight. Yeah, that's true. Um, that would be a good way of converting them up to represent uh, those type of people. I can't remember. Were they troops or were they elites? I think they were elites, but yeah, they I had a special so. rule that allowed you to take them as a detachment. I think. Um, yeah, some sort of weird wibbly thing, wasn't it? Mm. I think it was. They came with the 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 road trader, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I think you had to. Yeah, they all came together effectively. If you wanted to take them, then you had to take the rogue trader. Um, yeah, because yeah, I think they were just like one unit, though, if I recall. But so, yeah. you, it, rather than having like a minimum number of slots that you'd normally have to fill with detachment, you could just take one. Um, I can't. I can't actually remember. We'd have to revisit it. Oh well. Nonetheless, that's how that works. Uh, we've got unyielding knight. This model contains, uh, sorry, this model cancels five models for the purposes of determining um, control of objective markers. However, if it's Titanic, it counts as 10. Um, so obviously the armages are now going to be counted as five models um, and they have obsec uh, baked in. So it's really useful. Yeah, you've that's got, really good. You've got a five uh, man model with obsec baked in. So that's pretty strong. Um, household traditions are essentially uh the um they're the noble household bits and pieces so they're basically the um the chapter tactics but that effectively changes if you're free blades i guess i should probably just read it rather than trying to paraphrase it so all imperial knight units with this ability and all models in them and all the models in them okay gain a household tradition so look i suppose that might be a canis rex uh reference 
Because technically, Canis Rex is inside of Canis Rex, isn't it? Because when Canis Rex dies, it becomes little Canis Oh, Rex. yeah. So you still get the infantry model. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I guess so. Yeah. I haven't really read Canis Rex up to this point. So uh, in theory, they will all still be Imperial Knights u- keyword units, you would assume. Uh, but I guess they've just said uh, all the models in all the units, just to be doubly sure yeah, from yeah, all yeah. lawyers out there. Um, get, gain a household tradition. Uh, and yeah, and you've got to have at least three models. There you go. Um, if a detachment includes any free blades, you must instead select the martial traditions for each of them, as described on pages 76, 79. Each free blade must have unique martial traditions and so cannot uh select a martial tradition for a, a free blade if any other models in your army has that same martial tradition uh, and then there's a whole thing about canis rex um and he has to be a mythic hero uh martial tradition for him blah 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 blah, blah. uh write down all your models household traditions and martial traditions on your army roster fact uh and then there's a whole uh, little section about free blades in crusade um, but we don't talk about Crusade here, um, so we're going to move along. Much like we also don't talk about match play, just for clarity. So we don't north often talk about the secondaries either, just yes, for those no, who are listening along going, what, you're not going to talk about Crusade? It's like, this is long enough already. You no, know, I know. I, I, I would say, however, having a little glance through the Crusade stuff, if you if you want to play Crusade, playing Knights seems like one of the most literally thematic things you could do because you're going on a quest and that effectively is what a crusade is all about in terms of mm-hmm. crusade mechanics so i mean these feel like they would plug and play and fit in perfectly with the crusade um but we're not going to talk about it any more than that there you go. so outside of the confines of the free blades which have kind of been expressed within uh some of the household traditional uh, traditions and the martial um martial traditions here there are broader Questor or allegiances, which uh, are basically how held by either Questor Mechanicus or Questor Imperialis. Um, essentially, when you are mustering an army, you decide whether you're going to use one of the Questor Mechanicus or Questor Imperialis households. There are a selection of households that are preordained to reside within those subcategories, but you can also, with limited flexibility, create your own um, variant. Uh, households, although those again aren't really massively robust levels of options like we've seen in other codexes. It's like three or four kind of custom mm. options. I, I guess uh, for for context for people that have never heard of Imperial Knights before, they're big robots. Uh, but basically, there's uh, there's two. There's uh, Questor Mechanicus, which is where the Knight world is allied very closely to the Mechanicum uh, or Mechanicus and their Forge world, so they're a bit more Admech esque in their appearance uh, or your quest or imperialis where you're only aligned directly to the imperium so you don't really have uh, much to do with uh, mechanicus uh adeptus mechanicus uh so th- there's a, a slight visual differences and obviously they've used a whole bunch of rules to uh, represent those two allegiances that you can have very nicely put mate so yes so in addition to all of that these come with rules so if you're a quest or mechanicus uh, you are a sacrosanct pledge, or it is assumed, I suppose, that you have taken a sacrosanct pledge. Nonetheless, you add one to the wounds characteristics of models uh, with this quest or allegiance oath. Uh, if it is titanic, you add two. And at the start of each of your command phases, a model with a quest or allegiance oath regains one lost wound. Um, so nice. you become extra super healthy, which is uh, no bad thing for the... Uh, the uh, the imperial knights because you know you want to try and keep them as alive as you can um so yeah being able to have two extra wounds and or one extra wound if you're armature regaining wounds is pretty tasty but what's the other one phil uh so the other one for quest or imperialis is a vow of honor so you get to add one to advance and charge rolls made for a model uh, with this oath uh each time an advance or charge roll is made for a model with this oath you can ignore any and all modifiers for that roll. Uh, so if you're going through, I was going to say if you're going through dense terrain, but actually I'm pretty sure super heavies ignore that anyway. Um, 
but you know there are stratagems out there yeah that affect uh, yes exactly um and then also each time a model makes a piling move or consolidation move it can move an additional one inch so these are very fast and speedy uh whereas the mechanicum is a bit more methodically slow but they're getting that you know one up health every turn and it's really dependent on which one overall you're gonna think is better I think objectively you can look at it from the outset and say that being able to gain extra wounds and then ultimately being able to regenerate those wounds is a very, very strong option. Um, and I don't necessarily disagree with you. Um, I think the nuance of that is going to come down to whether or not you are prioritizing combat and what that essentially means to you. And then ultimately the kind of mobility that that affords you i think you know if you're going quite armored you're heavy um you want to reap the benefits of that movement and unlike the imperial knights that are titanic the armagers are not so having their movement hindered by you know dense terrain is a little bit of a nuisance so being able to compensate for that is useful um adding one to advances and, and charge rolls is also very useful for that initial alpha strike so I think if you're going to go really, really heavy-handed from the outset, I think there's an argument that being, you know, one of the uh, the, the Questor Imperialis ones is a good, solid option. But, you know, in the span of a five-turn game, you're essentially gaining um, six wounds, I suppose. No, well, there's every potential you could get four, seven wounds out of it if you go second and you take a little bit of damage turn one. So, yeah, uh, that that assumes that someone is ch chipping away at you, unable to kill you. Correct. Uh, if someone is just focusing on one knight a, a turn and, you know, killing a, a, an, either a knight a turn or a knight every two turns, the extra one wound isn't really doing anything, really. Well, two wounds for the, the larger ones. Oh, well, you, yeah, you gain two wounds, but you're only re at, at the start, but then you're only regening one. Correct, correct. So it, it's one of those things. I genuinely think for me at the moment, I'm leaning more into the Questor Imperialis utility than I'm concerning myself with the Mechanicus, um, you know, um, sturdiness, uh, tankiness. That's a better word for it. Um, but it's interesting all the same. Um, anyway, from there on, it gets into noble households, but as is somewhat tradition, a noble tradition. Uh, we'll skip past those because we want to essentially get into more broader rules that apply uh, to the knights. We don't want to necessarily, you know, start talking about some of the specifics without first viewing some of the extra bits and pieces. Um, so from an abilities standpoint, these are the universal kind of abilities that play into this army uh we have the ion shield ability which essentially is that all imperial knights have a five up invulnerable save uh and then there is the super heavy walk super heavy walker ability um now bear in mind because these models are titanic they are able to fall back from combat and still shoot but because they are super heavy walker this model is eligible to declare a charge in the turn on which it fell back. Each time this model makes a normal move, advances or falls back, it can be moved across other models, uh, excluding monsters and vehicle models, as if they were not there. So that's a really nice piece of clarification as well for these guys. You can essentially now walk over screens and walk over things that could otherwise cause you a bit of frustration. So now it is categorically stated that an Imperial Knight model can be wherever you more or less want it to be, as long as obviously it doesn't end on top of mm. something, which is pretty meaningful because for a long time, Imperial Knights really suffered with being screened out by stuff. So now the fact that you can just go, nah, don't worry about it. <laughs> Mate, yeah, know. makes, yeah, makes total sense that they should be able to do that. Well, you can imagine it, right? You can imagine someone fanning out a line of infiltrators in front of your Knights and just being like, well, you're stuck. Uh, and then obviously the gallant just being like, nope. And just running over the top of them it's uh it's a beautiful thing but one of the more interesting abilities is this bondsman ability 
Um, I'm going to let Phil read it. Take it away. Uh, yes. Mate. So, uh, some Imperial Knights have a bondsman ability uh, that can be used to affect friendly models. Uh, so, basically, you can only use it to affect. Um, uh, one model can only be affected by one bondsman ability at any time. Uh, if you were to then declare another bondsman ability on it, it overrides uh, the previous one and you switch immediately to the new one. Uh, and also, while your army is honored or virtuous, which we'll talk about in a moment, you subtract one from the damage characteristic of attacks made against an armager class model while it is under the effects of a bondsman ability. And if I remember rightly, all the bondsman abilities are baked into the data sheets. Is that right? For the bigger knights that can affect, is it predominantly the little knights? Correct, yeah. So the uh, specifically the Questor knights have bondsman abilities that they grant to armager classes. The Dominus class knights, the big ones, do not come hmm. with bondsman abilities, nor can you give them exalted court abilities, which would in turn give them bigger uh, other bondsman abilities. So it's interesting because essentially... They have effectively made it the 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 army really feels now like it, it it really kind of massively benefits the uh you know the mid tier quest or knights and the armagers and although the big ones have a lot of really really punchy weapons and you know certain levels of power they definitely lack utility and these bondsman abilities specifically are the things that other mid size you know quest or class knights from the uh, Forge World Compendium don't have access to. And these Bondsman abilities are really important because one of the key things about this is the fact that in addition to what the Bondsman ability gives, your Armagers are also gaining minus one damage. So when your Armagers are under the effect of a Bondsman ability, they are reducing damage by one. And if they're not under the effect of Bondsman ability, they're not. So the fact that a, you know... Um, because there's only two um, Forge World Knights of a similar size to the Questorius ones, which is the, the Styrix and uh, I can never remember the other one, uh, but two Mechanicum looking ones that effectively upgrade kits to the yeah. standard plastic kit. You obviously have smaller versions uh, of the similar ones to the Armagers, like the Moirax with the lightning uh, cannons. Uh, so I presume because they, they will just be keyworded to put up. To be armages, I would assume. So they will still be able to gain the benefits of the bondsman ability. But yeah, those two uh, specifically um, mid tier Questorus esque uh, ones won't get bondsman abilities unless they give them in an FAQ to have them, which I would yeah. assume they just wouldn't. And then the really large ones, like Serastus class, um, they're yes, massive, Sarastus right? Class. So yeah. uh, they're they're bigger than the Dominus class of in effect. So they won't get any abilities because they're just big fighty things yeah which is fair enough but we've definitely saw before uh the magira was very very popular oh yeah that's the name of that one yeah and the uh the styrix was you know it was about but the magira and or maybe it was the styrix that was it the was the one, one with the lightning cannon i think that was the yes. popular choice right yeah um I, I always loved the look of those two the most they're the oh, ones i've always liked fantastic liked. I really like the uh, the 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 Moirax, the um, the little armager one as well. I think uh, that's a really, yeah, really beautiful kit. Yeah, D despite having bought some of the plastic GW kits, I kind of wish I would just have Forge World only knights because they look so much nicer. Like from I mean, the little ones to the mid tier, and even the Questor, um, the, the big one, Serastus class. I am I am definitely considering the virtues of adding some Moiraxes uh, to my collection. I think they are good enough that it's 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 worth considering especially now with how the, the the synergy of the army seems to be leaning towards the um the armages but i need to explore it more but yeah but that's important because if you're running Styrixes or um or uh magiras which were pretty abundant they're not giving out these bondsman abilities so then all of a sudden your um your more axes for example that you probably have as well are not really you know working at full capacity so the only knights that currently can offer bondsman abilities are the questorus standard games workshop chassis um i mean there's a few of them there's the gallant the errant the warden the paladin the crusader uh the perceptor so you know there's the six of them right like so there's a lot of them but you know yeah it's a it's an interesting uh you know 
wibbly point as we wait for things to be updated. Um, in addition to all of this, there is the Code of Chivalry. Now, this is effectively similar to the um, Black Templars super doctrine of choose a thing and your army is impacted by the thing. Um, this is the same, except there's a little bit more options, and I'd say it's a bit more better than uh, than, than what the, uh, the Black Templars gain access to. So the Code of Chivalry, which I think we can all universally agree is just called Oves, right? Like, no one's going to be calling this in Code of Chivalry. It's just the Oves, surely. Like, I think yeah, that's so, pretty much Yeah, Well, I mean, it's, it's even actually called Code Chivalric, so it's it's not even Code Chivalry. Oh, God. There you go. You assume things. So that's never going to stick. So they're just Oves, everybody. Uh, anyway, if every unit in your army is Imperial Knights, excluding agents of the Imperium, were unaligned, um, are from the same noble household, uh, where uh, then when you write your army list, you must also swear to oaths from those in the following table and make a note of them on your army list. So that's really interesting, actually, because that's something that we need to basically highlight. You have to have stated what your your oaths are before you've even seen what your opponents are going to be. Um, so, so if you're so playing it's this, unlike Black Templars, where you got to pick. Uh, yeah, I, I had assumed it was a pick, but I'm wrong. You have to pick. You have to have arrived with it selected. It, um, it's okay because there, there's only four, and having yes. read them, you're always going to pick the same two, pretty much no matter what your army is. I think well, personally, we will see. So yeah. at the start of the battle, uh, you have one honor point. So essentially, all of these oves are linked to this honor point system. We'll get into that in a second. But basically, you can gain honor points during the battle, typically by completing the pledge of the selected oaths. And you can also lose points during the battle, typically uh, when the trough of your selected oath applies. You can never have less than zero honor points or more than six honor points. Um, at the start of each battle round, consult the table below to determine your army's current level of honor. So this is a really important thing as well to state because I have watched a few people on the internet and I've seen people getting this wrong all over the place. First and foremost, just because at the end of your turn you have five honour, you are not yet virtuous. You are only virtuous at the start of each battle round. Right? So you consult your table at the start of the battle round and depending on where you're at, you go, cool, I am now achieved virtuous. For further clarity, what virtuous means is is the top tier of your honor system. So essentially, a normal army will start with one honor. And if you complete an oath, you'll gain an additional honor. You can probably gain an additional two honor a turn if you complete two of your oaths. But from there on in, you essentially need to track how that's performing. And when you're at five honor points, you become virtuous. And when you're virtuous, you unlock additional abilities associated to the oaths have i done a decent job of describing that phil or have i gone off on a tangent that no one yeah no that? no you're spot on so when you're dishonored which is where you're on zero you just get no abilities if you've Correct. got one to four you get just the honored ability which is like level one and then if you've got five or six you get both honored and virtuous abilities so they do Correct. stack uh in that respect absolutely um, but yes. one of the things that I've seen a lot of people get wrong is that, yeah, they, they either assert that once they've achieved five honour... Oh, it happens is, straight away. It happens straight away, which it doesn't. And also, I've seen a lot of people talking about, I didn't achieve the pledge, therefore I lose honour. That isn't true. You cannot achieve the pledge and still not lose honour. It's only if you achieve the trough. <sighs> yes, although saying that some of the... But troughs are effectively the opposite of the pledges. So not doing the pledge in some circumstances mean you automatically, uh, you're probably doing the trough. Not always, uh, but definitely in some cases like the first one. Because uh, if you could have done it and you didn't, you definitely are in the trough category. So um, yes, that's, that's, true. that's true. Some of them, though, are definitely a lot harder to do in terms of the troughs. Um yeah, one's almost, I think, impossible to happen. So, you know, that, that's... Wow, well, it's not impossible. You might have lost your senses, but um, we'll get into those in a second. Look, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a, a, a zero to six system. 
Uh, models with this ability gain a number of uh, chivalric, chivalric abilities, depending on which active um, are active for your army. Um, and we've already gone through that. So there are four oaths. Phil, tell us the first one. Uh, the oath, protect those in need. Uh, that's uh, the first one. Uh, so the pledge that you're promising to do as a knightly knight. Um, if one of the following happened during the battle round, then you gain uh, one honor point and only one honor point. Uh, an imperial knight model from your army performed a heroic intervention, uh, or an imperial knight model from your army made a charge move against an enemy unit that started the charge phase within engagement range of another friendly unit. Uh, so you're coming to their aid, basically, and charging into combat with a unit that is already effectively in combat with one of your other units. Uh, the trough, which is the downside, is effectively the opposite of this. Uh, so if one of the following happens, then you will lose one on a point. So an Imperial Knight model from your army was eligible to declare a heroic intervention during your opponent's charge phase, but failed to do so, uh, either because you... Hmm, I'm just trying to make... So I, I presume failing to do so either means A, declaring the charge at all, or declaring... It's a heroic, it, but... heroic intervention in this instance. Ah, yes. So, yeah, it's not actually like you failed the charge roll, which is what no, I'm no, saying. No, no, because you, no, you, this you is were just... within heroic intervention range, but you chose then, not to heroic Yes, range. yeah. So so that it's not like you failed the charge or anything. Uh, but the However, next one is, in your charge phase, one or more Imperial models from your army were eligible to collect a charge against an enemy unit that started the phase within engagement range with another unit from your army, but none of them made a charge move against such an enemy unit during that phase. Uh, so I guess technically you could still declare the charge, fail the roll, so you haven't actually made the charge move. Uh, so even though you had good intentions to make the charge, you actually failed it. So therefore, you are uh, you, you you've you've got the trough. So you you, well, you it, lose it is the question point. though, right? So again, reading it again, just one last time, just for clarity. In your charge phase, if one or more Imperial Knight models from your army were eligible to declare declare a charge against a unit that started the phase within engagement range uh, with another unit from your army, but none of them made a charge move. Oh, yeah, no, no, it's quite specific. So, yeah, so basically if you fail a charge... Or just didn't have... declare the charge. Yeah, if you didn't declare it... I mean, that's the thing. It's one thing to declare and fail. That's obviously another thing to declare and, uh, you know, not declare. Um, I think the aspiration here is is that you have need, you needed to both declare and succeed. Yes, but you could potentially try and argue that declaring it is satisfactory, but I don't think anyone would agree with you. No, because um, it, it, it's. Uh, I think the fact that it says you have to have made the charge move means you needed to have successfully rolled the number required to do the actual charge itself, yeah, um, yeah. which makes sense. So this is at least in this instance, it feels like if you didn't do the pledge, but because you could have, but for whatever reason didn't. Uh, then you definitely are losing uh, on a point automatically. Uh, but there will be plenty of turns where you're not even eligible maybe to do the pledge because you're just not within heroic intervention range or none of your models are in combat, so therefore you can't do the second half. Um, so therefore you're not getting the trough either because you can't do either, uh, which is something to bear in mind. Uh, however, if you do manage to successfully become honoured, you get the selfless heroes ability so models that are eligible to perform heroic interventions um, as if it was a character. If this model is a character, then it is eligible to perform heroic intervention. If it is within six inches, horizontal, five inches vertically, instead of three and five. Uh, and each time that this model makes a heroic intervention move, it can move up to six inches. All other uh, rules apply. So basically, all of your models in your army can do heroic intervention and it's a six inch intervention aura which ultimately makes your ability to do the pledge easier but also it makes it a lot easier to get into combat which i presume if you were choosing this one that's what you want to do um, mm -hmm. and then if you get the virtuous ability so do you remember this stacks with the honored ability uh, you become inspiring heroes so if this model has a bondsman ability it can use it one additional time in each of your command phases which is, which is pretty good. Again, so you need Armages and um, Questorus class to be able to do those, to make the most yeah. of them. Yeah, I mean, again, 
we'll go over all of them and then we'll talk about the ones that we think are good. But that's what that one is. Um, I think it's certainly situational. But um, but there we go. Here's the one that I think, without giving the game away too much, I think everyone's going to take all the time by default because it's just crazy not to. But let's 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 see if you disagree, Phil. Um, I know you don't already, but you know, <laughs> try and play along. Um, uh, what, what's it called? Around. No, no, you got to do it in your most knightly voice. Defend the realm, my boy. No, they wouldn't say my boy. Squire, squire, come forth and assist me as I defend the realm. Brilliant. There you go. I'm getting better. No, no, no. <laughs> Brave Concord. Anyway, um, defend the realm. Uh, yeah, defend the realm. Clip cop. I feel like I feel. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that would have been. It would be really good, actually, to have introduced that by having the, you know, the, the running noise. And Anyway, um, look, it's a defender of the realm. You pledge to, at the end of your turn, control more objective markers than your opponent. And you gain one on a point for that. I mean, given that's what the whole game is about, I don't think that's probably an unreasonable aspiration, right? Like, I think it's... most people are trying to do this all the time, so... You know, it doesn't feel like a stretch uh, at that point. It's, it's a it's a win more mechanic, isn't it? It's it's. Do you want to double down on what you're already doing? If you're losing the game, then yeah. you, you won't be doing it. So you're potentially going to become dishonored. Um, so it, it's hard of you to catch up. But in an ideal world, you'll already be winning. In which case, this is a no brainer to do. Exactly. And then when you see the trough element of it as well, you start to realize that this is the obvious one to go for because. If at the end of your turn you control less objective markers than you did at the start of the turn, then at the end of the battle round you lose one honor point. Well, in my turn, if I even had one, or even if I had zero, I'd just be like, okay. But if I had one, I'd just stay on it. Or if I was able to, I might take a risk and go after another one that was owned by my opponent. But there's a high likelihood with obsec and on on armages with five models and all that goodness is probably going to work out all right. But um, yeah, if yeah. it was the start of the battle round and end of a battle round, it would be a lot harder to do uh, because mm. your opponent gets to counter what you want to do, whether they go yeah. first or not, uh, because it's just your turn. It's, it's almost impossible to lose an objective in your own turn. Obviously yeah. as a knight, you're going to be charging in to combat and stuff. So you might, um, you'd effectively have to, either be in a combat on an objective and lose that one which might happen or you would uh, have to leave an objective to go do something else which maybe might happen in a non-gt mission so for example you're doing a narrative game or you're doing the tempest of war where you've got to go off and do specific things so maybe in those cases um it's not guaranteed and i guess it would be harder to do if you've just got big knights if you've got lots of armages um that can sort of sit around on objectives and allow your big guys to go off and do stuff then uh this should be uh, quite a comfortably easy one to do and it feels like it's going to be very hard for you to get the trough and actually lose any honor points from this one yeah totally agree and then look in terms of what you get your honored ability is is you gain an additional command uh, command point so essentially where you would normally generate one command point if you're honored you generate two so in your command big, phase, yeah, that's, that's phase, huge. Yeah. That's that's way better than being able to do. I don't know. To me, that's heroic better than doing a heroic, heroic intervention. Hundred percent. So that's huge. And then, if you manage to become virtuous, you all gain everything. Gains obsec, right? Um, but if the model already had this ability, that model instead counts as three additional models. So all of a sudden, your armagers become eight models for the purposes of obsec which again is just silly good. It's like all of a sudden I've got an armager that counts as eight models with obsec. It's like, okay, cool. Also a lot of people out there will probably be taking one of the warlord traits uh, to make one of their quest or knights um, obsec as well. And in so doing will essentially then also have like a knight that counts as 13 models, um, which starts to just get a little bit silly in terms of the obsec potential of these knights versus uh your opponents so yeah I mean, it, it, 
that I can't imagine any set of circumstances where someone is not taking that. It's just it's 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 an absolute no brainer. It may as well have just been their universal. It may as well have just been locked in. It should have been <laughs> this plus one other. You know, <laughs> it's like why did they even give you the option? Yes. Yeah, so, well, let's let's see what the other options are. Okay, um, please tell me. So, so the next life is <gasps> Waters. You have laid down the gauntlet. No, I refuse no challenge. Uh, okay. So refuse no challenge. Um, uh, the pledge is at the end of each battle round, so not turn battle round, if two or more enemy units have been destroyed by melee attacks made by Imperial Knights units from your army during that battle round, then you gain one honor point. Uh, if Imperial Knights units, sorry, this is the trough now. Um, if Imperial Knights units from your army fall back during a battle round, then at the end of the battle round, you lose one on a point, which, you know, might be something you want to do because you can um, you can fall back and charge, can't you? Uh, or at least fall back and shoot. You can, yourself. yeah. You can. You can fall back and charge. Yeah. It's highly okay. likely that, that, that you will find yourself in situations where you want to fall back. And if your opponent knows that you've gone for this one and they're smart, they will create situations where you might want to. Yes, just go. I'm just going to lock you in combat with something rubbish, but maybe durable, but um, yeah. will be difficult to kill. Um, then, uh, if you are honored, you get to the noble display. So each time this model makes a melee attack, if it made a charge move, was charged, or performed a heroic intervention, it gets one to uh, adds one to that attack's hit roll. So plus one to hit. I think that's pretty good. Uh, especially good. since most knights hit on threes, right? So yeah, uh, yeah. hitting on twos, super good. Uh, yep. And then if you are virtuous, you gain mighty display. Uh, you can re-roll the advance and charge rolls made for this model. Again, I think this one's quite good. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, look, both the uh, yeah honored and virtuous abilities are quite good. The pledge maybe not so, especially matchup dependent because you've got to kill two or more enemy units in combat a turn. Um, if you're up against should be doable, or Death Guard, that might not be. It's the fact that it's very combat dependent as well, which makes it a little bit irritating. But if if think. your whole army was like Gallants and uh, Armagers with a chain, is it chain glaives? Warglaves. Uh, Warglaves. Then, um, th then maybe it's not a problem because if you all you're planning to do is combat, but if you've got a mix of shooting and combat, that suddenly makes it a lot more difficult. Yeah. The last one is Lay Low the Tyrant. Bye, Cracky. There's a fella over there causing some mischief. I'm going to go down there and lay them low. Bye, Eck. Anyway, um, <laughs> that was, I don't know what that became. Uh, a pledge if an Imperial Knight model from your army destroys one or more Warlord, character, monster, vehicle unit during a battle round with melee attacks, then at the end of your turn, gain one honor point. So again, melee attacks. Um, so pretty much with the exception of Defend the Realm, all your oaths involve killing something with a sword, um, which I guess makes sense. And then the trough is if less than two enemy units have been destroyed by attacks made by Imperial Knights. Fortuitively, this is attacks. So this is not specifically um, combat. This is, this is shooting as well. Uh, then you will lose honor. At the end of the day, right, Oof. for an Imperial Knight army, if you're not killing two things a turn, you're really, you're not winning anyway, right? So I think, anyway. No, which, which... But, but potentially the last few turns, you might end up running out of things to kill. Yeah, true, true. But in terms of the honored ability, each uh, time this model is selected to shoot or fight, you can reroll one hit roll or one wound roll. It's not massive, but it is something. Uh, and then you've got uh, the Virtuous ability, which is uh, Martial Legacy. Once per battle round, when making an advanced roll, hit roll, wound roll, or saving throw for one Imperial Knight model in your army, you can change the result of that roll to a six. So, quite tasty. Yeah, that's all right. So this is the thing. I mean, overall, I think Defender or Defending the Realm or Defend the Realm is quite clearly the go-to. Where you go outside of that really ideally is going to be matchup dependent. But according to this, you have to put it in your army list. For me, I'm torn between refuse no challenge and lay low the tyrant. I think 
protect those in need is just not worth the hassle because it's two situations. I, well, here's the thing. I would actually say that's the safe bet because really? if if you can heroically intervene into a unit, why wouldn't you, right? Uh, is, is there something, uh, unless you're up against something so scary you don't want to be in combat with it, why would you be that close to it, right? You could, you could easily position yourself to not have to uh, at least do the heroic intervention part if you if you with positioning you can avoid that if you really wanted to the tricky bit is if a unit's in combat and you're within effectively 12 inches you've got to declare it and charge it so you've then got to be very careful about if you're going to be within 12 inches of a, another one of your units that's already in combat you need to be really close to it or you need to stay out of 12 inches so potentially you could through positioning avoid having to do any of that if you didn't yeah. want to and ideally i'd be like i actually want to be heroically intervening and getting in my knights into combat because mm. I, mm. i'm a super heavy i'm a vehicle i can shoot in combat i can do all this cool stuff why wouldn't i be wanting to well, i suppose the upside as anyway. well is it's there's no negative for falling back with this oath as well which is kind of yes yeah that's... fundamental to the army's con construction i suppose and again yeah. here's, the, here's the thing it doesn't punish you doesn't punish you for failing charges. It punishes you for failing charges against something that's already got one in engagement range. So yeah. If you're so chucking so, up a model and trying to charge in, you don't have to worry about failing well, that well, charge. Here's the thing: if you're already stuck in combat, you can just fall back. So it's yeah. like, so you don't have to do the charge uh, because it doesn't say at the start of the battle round if you can um you have to then charge into it but it's like no because i in my movement phase i can fall back therefore when it comes to declaring charges i don't have to uh i mean people could i mean can even can the armages effectively you said they can't fall, fall back over infantry they can for, they they can't fall back over but they can for stratagems fall back and charge right okay yeah so people could try and lock up your armages and then it's a lot more tricky for them to fall back so therefore your Correct. big knights have to effectively come rescue them which is you know thematic i mean yeah, I agree. If, you, if you don't mind getting stuck into combat with the stuff why wouldn't you um yeah that, that one feels like a more safer bet whereas yeah falling back might be something you really need to do uh, to be like, okay, right, I need to get out of this combat to next turn, get onto an objective somewhere else uh, on yeah, the yeah. table or something. Um, but then maybe you, you could just do that and be like, right, cool, I'll take the one one hit uh, and that's fine because I know probably with my Defend the Realm, I'm gaining one, so I'm netting out at zero. So I'm not, uh, I'm not gaining any, but I'm not losing any either. Yeah. And yeah, I'm just yeah, going to yeah. stay at whatever level I'm currently on. So you could you could play it that way as well, because to me, defend the realm is such a safe bet. Um, yeah, and I do like the uh, the abilities with the um, refuse no challenge as well, like getting the uh, extra uh, to hit roll and the reroll advance and charge rolls. I think that's quite strong. I agree. I agree. I think this is the thing. I think. There's arguments for a lot of them, but I think actually if, if you're looking at it from the perspective of managing the negatives rather than prioritizing the positives, I think protect those in need and defend the round probably do become the the safe, consistent bet. Um, but personally, I do kind of like aspects of, you know, refuse no challenge, except for the reduction of fallback, because I think with the way you're going to play knights, you're going to want to fall back a lot. So I think you can possibly cancel that one out. And then this one is dependent on community things. So yeah, actually, in retrospect, yeah, maybe yeah, protect those in need, defend the realm is the way you want to play it. Yeah, because I, I think lay low the tyrants, while quite good uh, abilities, I think it's actually going to be quite hard to do on certain matchups at least. So if you're trying to pick something that's quite broad, uh, defend the realm and protect those in need, if, if it, you can if do regardless of matchup. Yeah. Yeah, if you're going for tournaments, I think you probably want to go protect. And um, yeah, so that's those abilities. Um, so this is all the kind of fundamental stuff uh, that makes up the army. Um, so we should probably get into the noble households. Now, what I'm going to say for the noble households, there's a lot of them here. Once you start to add in free blades and the stuff that goes on, 
there and in the interest of time i don't know do you want to read through every well, household or do you... there there's nine of them plus the uh no but the martial traditions which i assume is the uh pick and choose uh options um correct yeah so there's all the, the... the free blades uh and then there's also martial traditions for questor mechanicus and um there's a lot of it is basically what i'm getting at yeah we'll, 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 maybe we'll let's pick we'll what, get through it let's let's just pick a couple i would say i know we'll get through it Phil. we've done it for every other thing we're going to do it for this so uh, the nobles strap households. in for five hours everyone well you already said that's what we're going to do in the intro mate so that's what we're going to flip in well do right noble household house house who's who's turin turin yeah so the quest or allegiance oath is vow of honor uh so house turin models in this detachment gain the vow of honor quest or allegiance oath Oh, page 65. Uh, yeah, oh, that's just they're, they're describing the Quest or Imperialis. Um, yeah. if the, all right, if it, oh, right, it's just saying they're Quest or Imperialis. Okay, Correct. Right, yeah, nice. there you go. Moving You're catching on, up. Moving on, right. <laughs> uh, so the household tradition, which is their ability, gallant warriors. Each time an advance or charge roll is made for this model with this tradition, roll one additional dice and discard one of the dice. Very strong. Uh, 3d6, pick Solid. the lowest, basically. That is very good. Uh, glory in honor is there epic deed stratagem for one cp um use a stratagem in the fight phase when a house terrain model from your army is selected to fight until the end of that phase add one to the attack's characteristics and each time a model makes a melee attack re-roll a hit roll of one i mean for one cp that's great mm. um the warlord's trait is champion of a household you can re-roll advance and charge rolls made for this warlord that's very good especially when your charge roll is 3d6 pick the highest um yeah that's good and then your relic is thunder of voltaurus whatever that is it's a it's a cannon uh so you get to replace a rapid fire battle cannon with this relic so it is a 72 inch range uh type heavy d6 plus six so rather than 2d6 it is effectively you've already rolled six for one of them uh, plus your d6 strength nine which I believe is one from normal, because it's effectively a battle cannon, so which is normally strength eight, right? Um, mm -hmm. Minus two AP and flat three damage, which I think is what the new battle cannons are everywhere. Uh, rapid fire battle cannon, yeah, 2d6, strength eight, minus two, flat three damage, blast. This still has blast. So you're gaining an extra strength and basically you're getting an automatic uh, six shots, well, seven shots minimum. Be crikey, that's good. I can yep. tell you as a Lehman Russ owner who loves a uh, when I got the chance to have a relic battle cannon that was flat free damage that was crazy good the fact that I'm doing an amazing minimum number of damage uh, I think that's what's that average. so I'm doing nine shots on average uh, that's that's pretty good and in fact it's now strength nine oh crikey that's good um yeah they're great brilliant moving on right on then moving on house Griffith Griff, Griffith, 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 like from Berserk. You watched and or read the manga House, of House Berserk, Gryffindor. Right? Oh, Gryffindor, not Gryffindor. Griffith, you know the guy who sold his soul. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, you don't know Berserk, do you? Phil? No, we don't. We don't have time. But you really should read that manga. It's super good. Uh, their quest for Imperialis, uh, and their household tradition is that when they charge, are charged, or heroically intervene, uh, they add one to their attacks characteristic. So that's a stratagem for them in Terran, but for these guys, it's just what they get. Uh, Dragon Slayer is a 2CP epic deed stratagem. Use a stratagem in your shooting phase when a House Griffith model from your army is selected to shoot, or in the fight phase when a House Griffith model in your army is selected to fight until the end of the phase. Each time a model makes an attack, if that target of that attack contains any vehicle or monster models, add one to their attack's wound rolls which is super helpful because obviously knights tend to wound everything that isn't a monster or a vehicle on oh. twos. So, Yes. Oh. So it's uh, from, from threes down to twos. And well, I mean, a lot of things are on twos anyway. Uh, yeah. So they've been taking a lot of these stratagems and abilities from the white scar supplement 
the uh, <laughs> the three d six charge. Um, you know, pick two the highest or the reroll advance and charge rolls, and and even this one plus one when you're attacking monsters. And it's all from White Scar's uh, supplement. There you go. These um, are the White Scar boys. Exactly. Uh, also, the Warlord, the Master of the Jousts, can uh, advance and charge. Oh, like like a White Scar's. Like a White Scar's. That's exactly what go. they can do. And then they've got a relic called the Mark of a Lance, uh, which is when they have charged, uh, you roll a d6. On a two or three, you do d3 mortal wounds. On a four or five, you do flat three mortal wounds. Um, and on a six, you roll d3 plus three mortal wounds. I don't think anyone's going to take Mark of the Lance anytime soon. No, I quite I quite like it. Um, nah, not it doesn't stack were... up versus the other relics. Oh, I guess. But if you were just charging around, falling back and charging in every turn, yeah, if, yeah. if you can do that, then that would be great. I mean, that'd be a heck of an achievement if you could. But uh, there you go. They're pretty good. I like Griffith. Um, they are my house of choice at the moment. Anyway, what about the next one, Phil? House, uh, what's it called? House Cadmus. Uh, they look very cool. There's like a weird goat icon for them. Cadmus, um, maybe. Is that what Cadmus is? Cadmus, maybe. Yeah, goats, clearly. Uh, so they are Questor Imperialis as well. Uh, so household tradition, hunters of the foe. Each time a model with this tradition makes a melee attack, uh, unless the target of the attack contains any vehicles or monster uh, models, re-roll a wound roll of one. Uh, and if the target of the attack contains six or more models, then this model, um, when this model was selected to fight, you can re-roll the wound roll. Oh, that's very strong. Um, mm. Yeah, re-roll wound rolls of one uh, plus re-roll. Um, uh, oh, plus just flat re-roll the wound roll. Yeah, so that's pretty good. So monster, sorry, horde clearing, clearly. Um, they've also got a stratagem, uh, which is a war gear stratagem, bio scryer cogitator array, uh, which is odd because you would have thought they'd be um, mechanicum if this was the case, uh, is a 1 CP, 2 CP strat. Use a stratagem at the end of your reinforcement step of your opponent's movement phase. Select one house Cadmus model from your army that is not within engagement range of any enemy units. That unit can shoot as if it were your shooting phase, but its models can only target a single eligible enemy unit that was set up as reinforcements this turn and is within 12 inches uh, of them when doing so. I, it's all spec scan. Uh, if this model is armager class, it costs 1 CP, otherwise it costs 2 CP. I mean, so if someone tries to deep strike next to these guys... A big guy, <laughs> two CP, just getting a whole turn of just shooting at it. Crikey, that is good. Um, mm. The warlord trait is veteran of Griffin Four. Um, oh yeah, Griffon, Griffon Four. Um, each time a melee attack is allocated as warlord, subtract one from the damage characteristic of that attack to a minimum of one. Not cumulative with any other rules that reduce damage characteristics. By crikey, that's also good. Uh, especially mm. since you'll put on your big boys rather than your little yep. ones. Uh, and then the relic is the Hunter's Eye, House Cadmus Armager class or Questorus class models only. Each time the bearer makes a ranged attack, the target does not receive the benefits of cover against that attack. I mean, that is quite good. Not, not I mean, it's really but pretty good. It, it's it's pretty big now with Armour of Contempt, though, right? Yes. So it does yeah, because you want to you wanna make sure they get as much AP on those um, Power Armour boys as possible. Now we have House Hawk Shroud. Uh, they are Questor Imperialis, and their household tradition is Oath Keepers. Uh, models from this tradition uh, whose characters can charge as they suffer damage are considered to have double the number of wounds remaining. Oh, uh, sorry, not change. Change, for change. not charge. Change, change. Basically, they count as having double the amount of wounds. Uh, and when you are very determining... Strong. Very strong. And then when you are uh, determining your chivalric oaths uh, ability are active for the Imperial Knight model in your army, providing your army is not dishonored, models with this tradition count uh, the number of honor points your army currently has as being one higher than it actually is. Okay. This, uh, this may mean that different chivalric abilities are active for models with this tradition that are active for other Imperial Knight models in your army. This is obviously done on the assertion that you're running an army of multiple Imperial Knights from multiple different houses, which isn't something so. you will yeah. be doing. Well, you might have a Knight plus a, f a free blade, but then free blades don't get uh, that ability. So, yeah. Hmm. Oh, no, they still can. Oh, free so blades still, still have oaves. Oh, yeah, okay. they still have oaves. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, there you go. Um, their epic deeds, 2 CP, 
strat is uh, use the stratagem in the heroic intervention step of your opponent's charge phase before making any other heroic interventions. If any, select one house hawk shroud, hawk shroud model from your army and one enemy unit that is doing 12 horizontally and five vertically of that uh, um, if um, uh, of it that made a charge move during this phase. Your model is eligible to perform a heroic intervention. A 12-inch heroic intervention? Madness. Keep reading. That's, keep reading. It gets great. Mad. Oh, hang on. There's more. Move this phase so long as it ends that move within engagement range of the enemy, and so that it can move up to d6 plus six. Oh, okay. So you say it can move up to d6 plus six. Fine. So it's not flat twelve. It's no, but you, you're you're almost there. So if you're within seven or eight inches, it's probably going to happen. Um, especially since what, if it you need to be it... within one inch of them, so you kind of gaining an extra inch on top of that so yeah and if you make that heroic intervention you fight first well done uh the warlord trait is duty of the forsworn uh, at the start of your command phase select one unit in your opponent's army each time this warlord makes an attack against that unit add one to that attacks hit well uh hit roll it's all right uh and then the relic is the angel's grace hawk short uh shroud armor -ger class uh, words have gone for me today uh, and house hawk shroud questora class models only each time the bearer would lose a wound as a result of a mortal wound roller a d6 on a five plus that wound is not lost and the bearer has the following ability angel's grace aura while friendly house hawk shroud amateur class models armature class models uh within six of the bearer each time that armature class model would lose a wound as a result of a mortal wound okay fine. so five plus they shrug stuff overall eh all right it's got some nice bits uh not it's super strong funny but i think it's good yeah it's pretty good it's all right it's all right it's all it's right, right. oh now we're on to some cool boys house mortan uh these are questor imperialis uh they have the the hog icon uh as part of their noble household emblem um so they've got close quarters killers uh, each time a model with this tradition makes a melee attack, re-roll a hit roll of one. So inbuilt captains. That is very good. They've also got Slayers of the Shadows. Fantastic name for one CP. It is a battle tactics stratagem. Use this stratagem in your shooting phase when a house mortar model from your army is selected to shoot. Or in the fight phase when you're selected to fight. Uh, until the end of that phase, each time a model makes an attack, you can ignore any and all hit roll, ballistic skill, and weapon skill modifiers. I mean, that's pretty big. So going through that, so that effectively is ignore cover, because that is a ballistic skill modifier. Uh, mm -hmm. Especially when you're fighting uh, combat, there are always people that are like maybe minus one to your weapon skill, for example. Um, yeah, that's, that's nice. That's nice. Um, your warlord trait is legacy of the Black Pile. Um, each time a range attack is made against this warlord, if the attack is more than 18 inches away, subtract one from the attack's hit rolls. That's great, especially for turn one and turn two. Um, and then the relic is Honor's Bite. Uh, so House Mortan model with a Reaper Chainsword only. Um, I'm right in thinking that is the Questorus uh, Knight model uh, Chainsword, because the little ones are called Chain Glaives, aren't they? Um, Correct. Yes, so the Reaper be... Chainsword is the main is the main uh, chainsword. For yeah. The... So it gets the following uh, profile. You get to obviously select uh, your normal strike and sweep. So strike is your big stabby one, which does more hits, and then sweep does more attacks. Um, so strike is uh, a melee plus six strength minus five flat six damage. Hold on for comparison. Let me actually just dig out what the uh, chainsword. Uh, weapon actually uh, does so reaper chain sword is normally uh, plus six so you are strength eight so that's strength 14 minus four flat six uh so you so get an extra at, ap an extra okay, AP. So, and it's also got an ability yeah so each time an attack is made with this uh weapon profile on an unmodified wound roll of six the target suffers three mortal wounds in addition to any damage uh that's pretty good and then the sweep is uh, strength user minus four, two damage. Uh, again, this is an extra pip of AP. 
Uh, yeah, same amount of damage. Uh, but it also has the ability, each time an attack is made with his weapon, make three hit rolls instead of one. That's what you normally get. But also, each time an attack is made with his weapon profile, on unmodified wound roll of six, the target suffers one mortal wound in addition to uh, the normal damage. Um, yeah, I like that. That's pretty good. It's really good. Really good. That's a nice weapon. But then, to be fair, most of the time, the thing you're hitting with that sword is probably not in the best of best of ways, regardless of the mortal wounds. But y yes, and is the extra, you know, minus four to minus five is very niche. Um, but you know, there are Could some come cases in handy where, in where it might be useful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, gets other imperial knights; they don't get invuns in uh, combat. For example, well, that that is true. It is a uh, is a knight killer then, clearly. Quite possibly. Uh, we're going over now to the Quest or Mechanicus. So the first of the Quest or Mechanicus is House Raven. Uh, these guys have a relentless advance, which essentially means that if they advance in your movement phase, uh, they ignore any and all modifiers to their move characteristics, but also they uh, count stationary for the purposes of shooting. So basically, Ooh. these guys can advance without any hindrance and then they can shoot as if they had stood still. That is great. It's a very, very strong shooting army. Uh, for one CP, you've got the Order of Companions uh, Requisition Stratagem. This used to be horrific. Uh, so let's see what it is now. Uh, use the stratagem before the battle when you are mustering your army. If your warlord has a House Raven keyword, select one House Raven quest or class model from your army that gains the following ability. Each time this model is selected to shoot or fight, Reroll one hit roll, one wound roll, or one damage roll when resolving the model's attacks. So where that is, I mean, that is significantly worse than what it used to be. However, the upside of it is, is it's basically one CP to give a unit in your army the ability to reroll damage rolls or reroll hits or reroll wounds. But I think moreover, you're going to want to reroll those damage rolls consistently. Right, so, so that's it, actually it gains it for the whole game, basically. The whole game, yeah, basically, for, yeah. for one CP. Yeah, yeah, but okay, compared to what it used to be, this one's becoming a bit of a, a winner already. <laughs> oh, and also, you can only use the stratagem once unless you're playing a strike force battle, in which case, uh, in which case, you can use the stratagem twice. So you can put that on two knights. That's a bloody hell. That's good. Or three if you're a crazy Doing person a, yeah. playing onslaught. Um, and then they've got the warlord trait of master of the trial. Each time an attack is allocated to this warlord, if that attack has an arm penetration characteristic of one or two, the arm penetration character, uh, it, it, uh, the attack is reduced by one. That's also armor of massive. contempt, sort of. That's massive, yeah. sort of. I mean, again, though, if you uh, gave them uh, the armor of sainted iron, which is the um, two plus armor save, or if it's a dominus class, because those are actually two plus armor saves now as well. Oh yeah, that's a new change, oh. isn't it? Yeah. So essentially at that point, if you get shot with a minus one weapon, you're still two up. If you get shot with a minus two weapon, you move to three up. And then anything over that is going to be on a four up in run if you pay the CP to, to, to so rotate. rotate iron to so yeah. yeah, so yeah, meaningful. Uh, and then the banner of uh, inviolate is the uh, is, is the relic. Uh, House Raven Questorus class models only. The bearer gains the following ability. Uh, wall friendly house raven armager class models within six of the model. Each time that armager class model uh, makes an attack, reroll, hit rolls of one. That's okay, but not extraordinary, but still good. So, house raven, still a very, very strong. I, I, yeah, I was going to say what's interesting, and there's been no clarity on it yet, is obviously house raven had the uh, raven codex supplement from the warzone books. Yep. Will that now be null and void, similar to the Leviathan one, because it came out? Before, before the actual codex came out, although it didn't feel like it came out that long ago, but then the Leviathan one actually came out even sooner, and that has now subsequently been written off. Um, so, as far as I'm aware, I'm just looking at it now. So, valid until January 2023. House Raven is in there. As uh, but being... does it say or until a new codex comes out? Uh, up to date, because most say. Um, most said, here's an end date of when it's valid to and overwritten if a codex comes out. Uh, yeah, unless superseded by a codex. So by that statement, then yeah, the, the House Raven stuff is gone. 
but then that will now meet. Yeah, well, yeah, no, it's gone. So there you go. I think it's gone. I don't know if it is or isn't. But, but it's not yeah, been overwritten. I mean, it, it's yeah, because the codex supplement is like this is yeah. It was always in addition to what you already get from this. So technically, it's not been overwritten. But you could argue well, it says it either way. Seeded. So mm. I mean. I What's House so. Tyrannus like, Phil? Uh, so, again, this is Mechanicum. You get the Household Tradition Omnisize Grace. Each time a model with this tradition loses a wound, unless the wound was lost, uh, was a result of a mortal wound, roll a d6 on a 6 plus, the wound is not lost. So, 6 up, Phil, no pain against non mortal wounds. That's pretty good. Uh, our Darkest sure. Hour is an epic deed stratagem for 1 and 2 CP. Oh god, it's a big boy. Let me get my glasses on. Um, use a stratagem <laughs> in any phase when a house tyrannous character model from your army is destroyed, but do not ex uh, but does not explode. Place a okay, place a marker on the battlefield in the center of where the destroyed model's base was. You can then choose to roll one d6 at the end of the phase instead of using any rules other than the explodes, uh, which uh, must be rolled for first that are triggered when that model is destroyed. If you do, then on a 4+, plus, set that model back up on the battlefield as close as possible to the marker you placed uh, and within 6 inches of that marker and not within engagement range of any enemy models um, with 3 wounds remaining. Uh, if it is not possible to set the model, it is destroyed. This stratagem can be used once per battle, if a model is an armager class, it costs one CP. Otherwise, it costs two CP. Uh, so you place a marker down uh, on a four up. It can uh, come back with three wounds, but you've got to be very careful with your positioning because you've got to be wholly within. Uh, oh no, just within six inches, not wholly within. Uh, but it does say uh, you can choose to roll one d six of the phase instead of uh, using any other uh, rule. All oh, right, yeah. So you can't use if there was a fight on death stratagem. You can't do both. They don't stack. You have to do one or the other. Um, yeah, that's quite good. Um, obviously, you can't re-roll that one anymore. So um, a bit more risky because uh, you could just throw away two CP and it not do anything. Um, the warlord trait is Knight of Mars. Once per battle, after rolling a d six or a d three when making an advance roll, hit roll, wound roll, damage roll, charge roll, or saving throw for this warlord. After any re-rolls, if any have been made, you can change the result of one of those dice to a 6, uh, or in the case of D3, a 3. Uh, so that's a once per battle uh, ability. And then while your army is virtuous, this warlord can use the above rule once per turn instead of once per battle. Uh, that's quite good, although I think it will take you a minimum of at least two turns to get to virtuous, because that's the top uh... tier one, right? Yeah, it's not impossible to get it turn two. Uh, well, yeah, so you start on one and technically you could get an extra two. Uh, so, yeah, you could get it. Uh, you could get it at the start. Of, you could so be virtuous are, by turn three, right? So there are relics and warlord traits that can give you plus one. Ah, uh, okay. And you can, for a stratagem, put an additional warlord trait on this guy. So you could Ooh. give this guy the warlord trait or in addition to this of plus one honor. And then you could take the relic which is additional plus one on it. Um, and then basically that would give you three. And then there are, um, in the case of match play games anyway, uh, secondaries that grant honor if you perform them and then you roll over. Ah, okay. So there are, there are a bunch of stipulations where you can gain more honor. So it's theoretically possible to have uh, gotten to five honor by the end of turn one and thus and then so it, turn two know. yeah have it okay that's pretty good uh the relic fury of mars um house tyrannous models only select one melter gun twin melter gun thermal spear or thermal cannon that model is equipped with uh, the weapon is now relic for all rules purposes add one to that weapon strength characteristic to delete that weapon's abilities mm. uh and what's add, super weird about this adds is two that... to the weapon's damage characteristic so what's super weird about this is the fact that they didn't just, like, put a weapon profile in here. It was I guess because there's, there's one, two, no four different it. profiles, I guess, that they would have to do. Uh, so some of them are... Oh, so some of them are... I, right, if you're doing the thermal cannon, you lose the blast ability, but you also lose the... Uh, if you're within half range, you do D6 plus four damage. But I guess you're already adding that. So you you effectively 
are you you're effectively giving the melter weapon the plus two the, the within half range at long range and an extra bit of strength interesting that you highlight it that they, it loses the blast ability as well i mean that could be a pro and a con right because obviously the pro if you is, want to be shooting in combat yeah 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 but then at the same time yeah all right no yeah it's interesting interesting i don't know if that's an oversight yeah. type situation i mean why would i know but interesting all right cool man there you go house tyrannus now we have house crest um not to be confused with crest anyway they're uh crystal mechanicus uh they have cold fury as a household tradition each time a model with this tradition makes a melee attack and a modified hit roll of six automatically wounds the target and if it is titanic and unmodified hit roll of five automatically wounds the target what? now what? well you haven't got that many and the, the thing is is like it's a nice ability but when you're wounding most things on twos or threes it's not dramatically better it's not like um it's not like the the the, the mechanicus vanguard who get get to do it on five pluses for a gun that would be wounding most big monsters on sixes you know like there there are there are levels to this i mean sure you could potentially build a knight gallant that could do 18 attacks for example but you know not massively massively better yeah i i know what you mean because I, I guess most things you say are wounding on twos possibly freeze for vehicles mm -hmm. so if you're suddenly turning that into an auto wound on a five plus i think that is pretty you, you're just optimizing your dice rolls right so yeah yeah i mean the less dice you roll the better um or rather the the you know the less times you have to roll the dice to get achieve this you know basically to achieve the same outcome the better you are but like i think um yeah i think that I've, it's, it's like it's like guard's ability but better because you can well, get look, on a fight here's up. the thing house crash used to just be when they enter combat they re-roll all their uh, hit rolls when they enter combat which was really strong this is okay anyway uh controlled aggression is the one cp track um it's battle tactics use the strategy of the start of fight phase select up to two house cross uh crossed armature class models uh or one house cross unit from your army uh until the end of the phase add one to the attacks characteristics of uh selected models that's good each time selected model makes a melee attack improve the arm penetration characteristic of that attack by one it's a good strap plus one attack plus one ap lovely uh, yeah, especially when if you wanted to do, say, the sweeping attacks, that plus one extra attack actually translates into uh, on the armages uh, two hit rolls instead of one. Uh, oh, the so, armages, yes. Yeah, so on the armages it gives you two extra attacks, but that is working on two models, so technically you're getting four attacks. Uh, yeah. And that is minus three on the sweep, so that becomes minus four, which is really good against Armour of Contempt now, so... Yeah, that's quite good. Warlord trait is first knight. Improve the warlord's weapon skill characteristic by one to a maximum of two plus. Uh, and at the end of each of your command phases, if your army is honoured, you can select uh, one virtuous uh, ability from your selected oath. Until the end of your next command phase, that virtuous ability is active for this warlord. Uh, this may mean that different chivalric abilities are active for this warlord then are active for other Imperial Knight models in your army. I'm sure there's a situation where that's true. Uh, and then, well, yeah, because it only affects the Warlord, right? Not everyone else. True. Well, I mean, that, well, anyway, let's not let's not procrastinate over that one. And then lastly, it's the Relic, the head, uh, the Headsman's Mark. House Crash models only. Well done. Uh, each time an attack is made with a bearer is allocated to a monster or vehicle. The damage characteristic of the attack is increased by one. So that's meaningful. Uh, and each time the bearer makes an attack against a titanic unit, add one to that attack's wound roll. That is also significant. That is strong. I'll give them their dues there. That is, uh, that is, that is strong. Yeah, no, I like that one. Uh, the next and last one is House Vulcan. They are Vulcan or Vulcan? No, it's, it's Vulcan. I was making uh, a Star Trek reference. Um, see? they get hey, the force uh, be with you. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the quest on Mechanica cycle, the others have been recently. They get Firestorm Protocols. Each time a model with this tradition makes a ranged attack. If the target of the attack is the closest enemy unit to this model, reroll hit rolls of one. 
that's not bad but does limit who you're wanting to shoot at um i don't know if you can hear there is a, a raging storm happening outside in are you in the middle of a raging storm i am in the shed i don't know if it's coming through on the recording not on my side not. mate not on my oh, side oh that's good that's good I i've mean, got no. all the silly people driving their loud motorcycles past my uh, always the always um, just, they anyway. love, there's, there's a bridge nearby they just love it just makes them so zooming happy. over and uh, they just brum brum the as the bikes go um so they've got the saturation bombardment battle tactics stratagem uh, for one CP slash two CP. Uh, use this stratagem in your shooting phase when a house or Volker model from your army is selected to shoot. Until the end of the phase, each time the model makes an attack, a uh, ranged attack, on an unmodified hit roll of six, one additional hit is scored. If the unit is armature class, it uh, costs one CP, otherwise it costs two CP. So exploding sixes for shooting attacks um i mean that could be really strong um you could that would be great on a lightning lock moirax because you're already getting exploding sixes so would it mm. you, you're getting an extra hit so you'd just be doubling down on the sort of output that you get with those guys um the warlord trait is adamantine knight each time an attack is made against the warlord an unmodified wound roll of one to three for that attack fails irrespective of any abilities uh so you sort of transhuman that's really good although you also need to factor in the fact that very few things can wound a knight on a two or three anyway probably except other knights in combat uh, and then the relic is auric mask house volcar model only they've got the the following ability so it's an aura ability one on enemy unit is within 12 inches of the bearer subtract one from the leadship characteristic of models in that unit and while an enemy unit is within six of the bearer subtract an additional one from the leadership characteristic for a total of minus two leadership and each time a combat attrition test is taken that unit subtract one from the combat attrition test i mean it could be good it'll be it could be an interesting build to see how that uh plays out yeah I mean, it's all right. Some some of the stuff's good on that one, I think. Yeah. yeah. It's all right. Yeah, all right. All right, okay. We've got martial traditions. We'll just smash through these as quickly as we can. So basically, if you want, you can take a custom version of a Questorus, uh, um, Imperialis, or Mechanicus. If you decide to go down the Imperialis route, uh, there is one called Glorified History, which is basically pick one of the ones you saw before. You just can't take the relic. Um, but in addition to that, there are some other ones. So essentially, you pick one of these abilities, and this becomes what your army does. So there's Frontline Fighter. Each time a model with this martial tradition makes a ranged attack, and the target of that attack is within 18 of this model, add one to the strength characteristic of that attack. Right? From all over myself to take it but there might be situations where having the plus one strength is useful mm. uh what's the next one phil not glorified history we've kind of established that one yeah uh we've got hunters of beasts uh oh there's thunder Ooh. now Ooh. i like that you said beasts and then there was thunder yes. that's uh, quite incredible creepy that's close i think as well on um, the moors on the yes. moors uh, oh the hounds, Ooh. the hounds of a Baskervilles. Um, so each time a model with this uh, martial tradition makes an attack against a monster or vehicle, add one to the attack's hit rolls. Um, each time an attack uh, made by a model with this tradition is allocated Titanic, add one to the damage characteristic. Um, if you have sw uh, sworn the lay loaf, lay low the tyrant's oath, and one or more models with this martial tradition destroy a monster or vehicle during a battle round then at the end of the battle round you gain two honor points from that oath pledge instead of one so that's quite clever um yeah that's all right if you want to go monster hunting or vehicle hunting that's quite cool mm -hmm. uh you've got noble combatants each time a model with this martial tradition fights if all of its attacks target one enemy unit and none of those attacks are made using the sweep or strike profiles of a melee weapon after resolving all of those attacks it can make a number of additional attacks against that enemy unit equal to the number of attacks that did not reach the inflect damage step of the attack sequence during that fight. Oh, God. This is that Drakari rule that broke um, the uh, 
the the trip tech witch thing where it had yes the, or whatever it was yes i whip. remember the whip thing yeah oh god this is that so these additional attacks cannot be made using sweep or smash profiles so what's really weird about that right the sweep and smash profiles are the sword profiles and if you read this it sort of sounds like the implication is is this is supposed to be a noble combatant so you would assume that you'd be using the sword but it appears that the only thing that you can do this with is your fist or more specifically your feet which is a very odd situation sweep strike which one has the smash smash is the very very it's sweep or smash isn't it or strike uh, strike or sweep oh these um, are just made using the sweep or smash profiles of a melee weapon I assume that is a no, typo? Is it, uh, that is a typo. That is it because they say sweep or strike earlier. That is clearly a typo in the same rule. They You're right, but but all, as you say, all the chain weapons have sweep or strike. Obviously, yeah. maybe it was called smash at one point. So yeah, you're forcing them to. Let's have honourable combat with, with my, my feet. feet. <laughs> yeah, have it. That makes no sense. Uh, can I? Can I? And we may as well talk about it now because you may as well hear it. I'd love to hear your opinion on it. So there is a uh, stratagem. And that stratagem is called. Is it crushed? Uh, uh, no, that's the freedom hand. It's um, oh, it's like thunderclap or something. Oh, here it is. Yeah, thunderstorm. Use the strategy in the fight phase when an Imperial Knight Titanic model from your army is selected to fight until the end of the phase. Each time model makes a melee attack with Titanic feet. Subtract one from the attack's hit roll. Phil's got the rain coming in. The thunder stomp is happening for Phil right now. Um, but you subtract one from your hit roll. Uh, but if the attack successfully hits the target, unless the target of that attack is a vehicle, monster, or character unit, the target suffers two more wounds and the attack sequence ends. Here is the thing. Technically, 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 Phil. You can do Thunderstomp and you can use that in conjunction with this ability. And because technically mortal wounds are not damage allocation, because basically you've successfully hit the target and then in place of resolving damage, you do mortal wounds. And because of the way the sequence technically works, you've not allocated damage, you've allocated mortal wounds, which are different from damage. Thus, you can use this stratagem in conjunction with that tradition or that thing to yeah. do infinite mortal wounds. Well, here's the thing. It's like, so they did the whip one, right? And they yeah. had to FAQ it just to say, these attacks do not then generate more extra attacks. So why for the life of me, they haven't put that caveat on this one. Yeah. Because people could now argue, okay, cool. Uh, I've done 10 attacks. I'm basically going to keep attacking you until I've damaged you 10 times because ultimately any that don't get to that step, I just keep re repeating and repeating and repeating, which isn't how it's meant to be. And wait, actually, maybe they don't need to because I actually think the errata wasn't for the weapon. It's now a rare rule that states mm -hmm. um, if you have something that generates extra attacks, it only does it once. So maybe that's why it's not in here but as a novice gamer as someone that is just picking up this and you read it for the first time or someone that isn't as uh, who doesn't know about that rare rule for example just state it on here because it is super obvious because that is the first thing most people look to it goes oh yeah it doesn't say i can't do it again so i'm going to keep doing it having to trawl through a massive document of rare rules to find the niche paragraph that says actually it doesn't stack isn't going to be found for everyone. So I would just add it in just to make it super obvious for everyone. Yeah, because that's the thing. I think the thing is, is that the argument is, is that because it goes to mortal wounds and mortal wounds aren't the damage, they're just mortal wounds, you just keep going and going and going and going. And yes, going. no, I, 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 I see what you mean with that one. Yeah, but even yeah. so, it still should only repeat itself once, not um, yeah, yeah, infinitely. Yeah, but yeah, but in this instance, again, I agree with you, and I wouldn't ever dream of, you know, trying to utilize that. But I think, I, I think this is one of those instances. If if anyone rocks up against this, and they basically go because of a loophole for one CP, 
I'm killing anything that isn't a monster or vehicle. Basically, I'm running into infantry. It doesn't matter what it is. It's dead. It's like, mm, little bit silly, but um, and clearly not how it was intended. But at least the saving grace is the only thing you can do it against are cavalry, swarms, bikes, you know, infantry. At least you're not running into other Imperial Knights and going, ah, stomp you into oblivion. Yeah, yeah here's the thing. I was looking uh, at the profiles earlier before we recorded, and I was basically thinking to myself, you would never take the feet ever because they are arguably worse than any of the combat weapons. The only time you will use the feet is if you have the Questorus class or Dominus class that has no close combat weapons because you're all shooty. That is literally the only time. If you're uh, like a Helvrin, uh, because it's got two auto cannons, that'll have to use feet. But if you have the Armager with the chainsword, because you've got the sweep profile, you'll always use the, the chainsword over the feet because they're just better. Yeah, um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, if you wanted an all shooty army and you wanted to then pick this to give yourself a bit of bene extra benefit, if you did get into combat, maybe, but I'd arguably say there's there's just better things to pick to make your shooting better if that's what you're focusing on. Yeah, I agree with that statement. I think that's the thing that's interesting about it all is like you know it's yeah I think I think it's a, a strange and wonderful uh, mishap, but I think we can all broadly agree that it's clear that that isn't intended to be what that is. But anyway, there you go. That's an interesting one. Tell us about the next one, mate. Yeah, so Paragons of Honor. So if every unit from your army has the Imperial Agents, uh, sorry, Imperial Knights keyword, excluding agents of the Imperial more unaligned, uh, then after you have sworn two oaths from your army, you must, if any models in your army have this martial tradition, swear one additional oath. <laughs> Okay, this oath applies to all models in your army with this martial tradition, i.e. that oath's pledge, trop, and chivalric abilities only apply to models in your army with this martial tradition. Uh, again, clarifying if you're running multiple um, sort of households. I mean, I, I can't see why you would want to do that, because at that point you're probably coming up against the the downsides of maybe some of those um, oaths. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you could get a load of benefits on the plus side, but all of a sudden it's like, okay, I've got to charge stuff. I can't ever fall back. Uh, I've got to hold all of the objectives. Suddenly that becomes a lot of plates to juggle to make yeah. sure that you're you're pulling off your oaths. Um, it's cool, it's cool though, because you will get a ton of abilities. So. The, uh, the storm is making its way over to me now, Phil. I've seen the lightning. I've got no, the rains. No. It's all kicking off. Anyway, uh, strike and shield. Ooh, a bit of lightning there in the background. Beautiful. Hear that? Oh, I did. I did, actually. Yeah. Oh, blimey. Anyway, exciting times. Uh, each time a melee attack is made against a model with this uh, martial tradition, a modified, unmodified hit roll of one and three always fails in respective abilities. And each time a melee attack uh, with an armor penetration characteristic of minus one is allocated a model with this martial tradition, that attack has an armor penetration characteristic of zero. So again, all... all Okay, stuff, but I don't well, think you're gonna. Good. That is a good one, but even then, I don't think you're gonna take well, it over. Here's above. the thing: yeah, you're you're losing out a wall or trait, a relic, and a stratagem. Yeah, uh, and there is some of those elements are in some of the other households. I like that it's for everyone, uh, but it's melee only. Um, but if you're gonna get stuck in, maybe it would, maybe it'd be fine. So we're going to move on now to the Mechanicus martial tradition. So uh, do you want to kick that off, Phil? Again, yeah. there is one where you pick the last one that's now called Fealty, Fealty. to the Cog. Yeah. Uh, so the first one, I don't know why that one's not at the top. Um, I know, it makes little to no sense, but there uh, you go. I assume it's, is. I think it's in alphabetical order. I think that's, well, although saying that, the free blade ones aren't, so a classic Games Workshop messed it up. Um, anyway, <laughs> Blessed Arms adds six inches to the range characteristic of ranged weapon models with this tradition. Uh, if the model uh, has this tradition, the type of every Cognis Heavy Stubber is equipped with its change to Assault 6. I assume it's normally, what, Assault 3 or Heavy 3, maybe? Uh, heavy uh, 4. Oh, okay. 
that's not too bad. Um, and if it, every model has this tradition, but armor penetration characteristic of every cognus stubber is equipped with is improved by one. Uh, have you got the cognus stubber up there? Yeah, so the uh, cognus stubber is uh, AP zero, um, so it becomes AP one. Assault six AP one. That's not too bad. Yeah, it's all not right. too bad. It's all right. Shabby, uh, honored sacristan stand sacred something anyway. Sacristans each time an attack with a damage characteristic of one is allocated to model with martial tradition, add one to any armor saving throws taken against the attack. It's pretty good if someone's shooting you with damage one stuff, which inevitably they will have some of. You get a plus one to your save. It's win win. Yeah. It's all right. Uh, next one is machine focus. Uh, each time a model with this martial tradition is selected to shoot, you can reroll either one wound roll or one damage roll. I'd say that's pretty strong. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Damage rolls, yeah, not bad. Not bad at all. Uh, next one, we have the... Sorry, I just have a large, crazy insect jumping through the window, trying to escape the rains, no doubt. <laughs> anyway, yeah. anyway... Uh, we've got steel sign wood aim sign wood aim S sinewed maybe sinewed aim whatever that would be each time a range attack is made with a model with this martial tradition against enemy units within uh, that are within engagement range of that unit add one to that attack's hit roll okay fair enough uh, all right what's the last mm. one uh unremitting uh um, each time a model with this muscle tradition is selected to shoot for the purposes of determining how many attacks are made with blast weapons, double the number of models in the target unit. So, for example, you're shooting at something that contains six models, uh, you count it as having 12 for uh, meaning that it would do the number, uh, maximum number of attacks against the target. I think that one's actually quite good because uh, trying to get in maximum number of shots is quite difficult sometimes. Um, so but then loads of like space marine players will never have run six models, they would always run five, and then that only doubles to 10. So you're still only doing a minimum of a D3, uh, which D3 shots when you've got a rapid fire battle cannon that does 2D6, uh, sorry, flat free. Uh, so you've got 2D6, uh, to a, a minimum of flat free is rubbish. Because uh, it should be free per dice, but it never was. Maybe that will be something that will get fixed in uh, tenth edition. Perhaps. Uh, we've then also got free blade martial traditions. Uh, now I'm not sure what the deal is with this. Is this the actual de facto what you get for free blades, or is there? Uh, I thought there were some pros and cons to these guys before. There's an army of renown for free blades. Uh, it says, uh, remember that each free, free blade must have a unique martial tradition and you cannot select a martial tradition for a free blade if any other model in your army has the same martial tradition. Um, so is it the expectation then that free blades... Okay, hang on. So can free blades each have a different martial tradition, as in you could have a Questor Mechanicus one that is um, blessed arms or uh, even like... Um, uh, crest, for example, uh, free blades uh, from your army must have a martial tradition from the list here. If your army includes Canis Rex, he must have a mythic hero martial tradition. Remember that each free blade must have a unique martial tradition, and so you cannot select a martial tradition for a free blade if your other models in your army have the same martial tradition. Unless otherwise stated, Questor Imperials units must have one martial tradition from Questor Imperials, Questor Mechanicus. Uh, must have one from the tradition of Quest of Mechanicus. Free blade units can have one martial tradition from the free blade martial tradition list instead of the other list. If you so choose, you cannot select the glorified history or felty and cog traditions for free blade units. Yeah, so you can pick them from all the lists, uh, uh, but free blade, but not the ones that are select a household one. Um, gotcha. And then free blade is specific to them as well. So yes, they, there's only four here, and I was like, that's a bit low, but that's yes. because they effectively get um, five from each of the other other lists plus their four unique ones as well. Um, gotcha. It all becomes clear. Fine. 
Okay, so they've got last of their line. Each time a, 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 model, a model with this martial tradition makes an attack that targets a unit containing 11 or more models, you can reroll the hit roll. And each time an armature class model in this martial tradition makes an attack targeting a unit that contains six or more models, you can reroll the hit roll. Fine. Next one. Uh, Mysterious Guardian. If a model with this tradition is placed into strategic reserve, it can arrive from strategic reserve in the reinforcement step of your movement phase as if the battle round was one higher than it currently is regardless of any mission rules. That's all right. Yeah, it's it, it, it sort of outflanking knight. Yeah. Then Peerless Warrior. Once per battle, when you're using Imperial Knight's Epic D stratagems, if you select a model with this martial tradition to use the stratagem, it costs zero command points. I have to familiarize myself with what the epic deeds were, but I assume there's some good ones in there, so probably yeah. all right. And then uh, the last one is Mythic Hero, which is the Canis Rex one, I believe. Um, when you're determining which of your abilities are active for Imperial Knight models in your army, models with this martial tradition count as the number of honor points your army currently has being too high than it actually is. This may mean different Shavrik abilities are active for models with your tradition, blah, blah, blah. They keep repeating that on every single time they do this. I don't know why. Um, okay, but obviously only one can ever have this. Um, so, yeah, that one gets to be too higher, uh, which is quite cool. Nice. There we go. Oh, my God, we've finally done it. We got through those martial traditions, mate. I mean, it only took a real long time. But we flipping well did it. We're now in the realm of stratagems. Yeah. So as is tradition, we just pick one each from the colours. Uh, the red ones we tend to ignore because that's usually gain a warlord trait, gain a uh, gain a uh, a relic in addition to what you already have. I think there's a specific one for these guys. In fact, there is where you can give an additional warlord trait uh, to your warlord. And, specifically. Uh, oh, there's one that uh, model gains of a character keyword. Uh, well, I think they all, yeah, so as a result of gaining the wall of trait, they gain the character keyword as well. So basically, you can give a guy that isn't uh, a warlord a wall of trait, and they gain character. In yeah. yeah. So that's all pretty standard. So we won't do red, but we're going to do blue. Um, and I'm going to start by talking about line breaker. Uh, line breaker, I think, is probably one of the most significant abilities that they've given um, Imperial Knights. I think it's probably one of the strongest stratagems uh, they have access to. Uh, and the reason I think that is because, thusly, I uh, use the stratagem in fight phase when a quest or Imperialis vehicle. So this won't be available to any of your quest or Mechanicus units um, or Free Blade, for that matter. Uh, although it could be, actually, because your Free Blade could still be quest or Imperialis. So scratch that. Anyway. The point is that uh, you make a consolidation move. So the end of phase, we're making that consolidation move. That model can move up to six instead of three. Um, so uh, if it is uh, Questor um, Alliance Oath, it actually moves seven rather than uh, rather than six. So basically, yeah, you move seven uh, and can move in any direction provided it ends that consolidation move either within engagement range of an enemy model or it ends at at least three in, uh, inches closer to your opponent's battlefield edge. So why that's important is basically you've got an additional seven inch move. So you've got to think that you are basically going to do your pile in, which is going to be four inches because you're a quest or thing. So you, you can move four inches. Now bear in mind that as an Imperial Knight of a considerable stature, you're just going to walk over other infantry stuff, right? So basically, you could effectively enter combat, move four inches into a position where you can kind of almost leapfrog uh, a part of the uh, uh, you know infantry unit you've charged into. And then once that combat's concluded, you move an additional seven inches into something else. So there's a high likelihood that you can effectively run in, fight something that could be slightly bothersome to you, like, I don't know, Bellacor or, um, you know, other big crazy things. And then you could essentially uh, leave him or they or whatever it is in the dust because you can manoeuvre in such a way as you can fight and then leave and then maybe, you know, in the case of Bellacor, charge into it or rather consolidate into a unit of, um, of um, you know, plague 
whatever's you know the what are they call the plague bearers yeah so you can move into them or something and then be relatively free of the uh, concerns uh, of bellicor hitting you back so it's super strong is the long and short of it um and it has a lot of uh utility so line breaker strong recommendation you're going to see imperial uh night players doing that to you a lot because it's bloody good all right, that's very cool. So for the next stratagem, I'm going to pick Martial Prowess. It's a one or two CP battle tactics stratagem. Uh, use a stratagem in a fight phase when Imperial Knight's vehicle unit from your army is selected as the target of the attack. So no no naughty, naughty Canis Rex, because surely he's the only non-vehicle unit in the entire uh, I believe so, list. yeah. Um, yeah. So, in the, I mean, why would you spend it on him anyway? Uh, until the end of that phase, each time an attack is allocated to that model, add one to any armor-saving throw taken against that attack. If it's an armor, do it costs one CP, otherwise it costs two CP. So two CP for plus one to your armor save, not too shabby. Um, only in the fight phase, though. Uh, that's key. Um, I was trying to say if it, if it suggested when, at what point in the phase can you do it? Because it says until the end of the phase. I mean, technically, they could have rolled to hits, to wounds. You know how many you need to save. I'm going to pop this stratagem now. Mm -hmm. um, once I've seen how the dice rolls, it's not like used at the beginning of the phase or anything. Um, so, that, so that's an interesting one about when you can actually activate it. Yeah. Agreed. All right, we're going to move over into the Browns. Um, the epic deeds the epic deeds uh i think machine spirit resurgence is uh one that people used a lot in the past and they will probably continue to do so if they are quest or mechanicus so let's talk about that it's an epic deed use this stratagem in your command phase select one quest or mechanicus model from your army until the start of your next command phase that model is considered to have its full wounds remaining for the purposes of determining characteristics on its profile to use if that model is an armager, the stratagem costs one CP. Otherwise, it costs two CP. So that is a change in so much as before it was just one CP, regardless of the chassis. Oh, yeah, um, that, but that'd it, be too cheap. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's an incredibly strong strat and a very compelling reason to want to take Quest or Mechanicus, it's fair to say. Uh, Yes, or but also another reason to take the uh, the oath where you can get two CP a turn because if you're able to do this every turn, uh, and you're effectively not reducing your pool of CP because uh, from from doing it, that's incredibly strong if you can do that. Uh, so anything that's slightly weakened, fight on full proof profile. That's uh, pretty huge. Uh, I'm going to do the one. Oh, there's some on the other page as well. Uh, but I'm going to do Crushed um, for 1 CP. Uh, use oh, a strategy in, in the fight phase when an attack made with the Freedom's Hand or Thunderstrike Gauntlet uh, or Relic that replaces such weapon by an Imperial Knights model from your army is allocated to an enemy model. Before any saving throw is taken against that attack, both players roll off. If the strength characteristic of this Imperial Knight is greater than that of the model uh, the attack has been allocated to, add one to your results. If you win the roll-off, invulnerable saving throws cannot be taken against that attack. Otherwise, the damage characteristic of the attack is zero. Wait. Oh, harsh. So it used to be crush them, right? And this is a replacement of that where you used to roll off plus your strength. Um, oh, you're thinking of death grip is what you're thinking oh, of. Was it, oh, no, crush them. What? Oh, no, that's the, the Lehman Rust tank one. You're right. Yes, uh, yes. Death grip, yeah. Which I guess is sort of what this does. Um, but yeah, basically, if you fail that roll, you're doing nothing, uh, yeah. which is pretty brutal. But it depends on the what ability instances. to ignore invulnerable saves is pretty good, yeah. It depends on what instances, right? Because, like, there are some irritating minis out there with some very high uh invun saves, you know, four ups, three ups, in some rare instances. So, being able to neutralize those in buns yeah. can make a huge difference um so i suppose the question you have to ask yourself is say for example if you were hitting a target with a paragon gauntlet or not paragon gauntlet sorry the um thunder strike gauntlet that's damage eight and i think it's minus three ap 
but you were fighting against a model with a four up in one, like say a Harlequin character. And you knew that you were likely only going to get a few hits off. The fact that you know as long as one of those hits gets through and it ignores the invun, it's guaranteed dead is worth it in that context because the the invun saves, or say for example, you're against Drakari and they've got their, you know, Archon with two up invun. Like the idea that you could literally just be like, yeah, that two up invun is going to be trouble, but for the sake of one CP, I can just go smush as long as I roll off against it then. yeah but it's, so it's like it's one cp and then i don't know the actual stats let's say you've got a 40 percent chance of it meaning you're gonna do nothing yeah like, okay that's fair yeah. that's it that feels quite high because all you get is plus one now obviously before with the death grip it was add your strength versus their strength so there were times when you basically couldn't fail unless like you rolled a one or something that naturally yeah. um which seems almost too unfair, but potentially more realistic. Uh, whereas this one's more balanced, but it will make you think about it. Because if you if you want to guarantee that thing's dead, do you play the risky gamble of uh, using this stratagem and it just not going off? Or do you just hope that they're going to roll badly on their saves? Uh, I mean, it doesn't do you many favours against Custodes, for example, because Custodes still have two of armor saves, right? So even with you ignoring their invun, they're still potentially saving on fives, um, which, you know, reduces the odds of it. But then is it worth it versus the loss? I mean, again, it all comes down to... Yeah, it, it, it feels like you're going to try and use this on someone like a Bellacore or a, not another knight, but maybe a knight that does have an invun save in combat, which like the uh, Serastus uh, one, for example... Um, or some other big character, uh, like a Primark sort of level, that's when you'd probably use this. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's an interesting one. It's definitely not as um, as awesome as it used to be, but no. that's only only to be expected. I think there's, I, I think this is the thing, right? It's like, why they didn't just go, I'll roll off and ignore Invuns, and 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 then any fails you still resolve against invents. You know what I mean? Like it's weird that they also stipulated that it does zero damage. It feels it feels like to me it almost would have been like just make it two CP and get rid to, of that get, zero to, damage. Get to stipulation. guarantee it, yeah. Like um yeah, add it as you say, adding the extra zero damage bit on it is almost makes it not worth taking because the risk re- reward isn't is just isn't worth it. Is it's a, yeah, I'm it's try, a big I'm trying gamble. To think of, I'm trying to think of any situation where you're going to want to prioritize that, but yeah, it's um, it's not likely. All right, okay, so we're going to ignore the reds because we talked about those already. So we're going to go into the greens. Uh, I'm going to go with flanking maneuvers. Uh, use the strategy at the start of your movement phase. Select up to two armature class models from your army that are more than six away. Uh, that uh, are more than six away from any enemy models and within six of a battlefield edge. If the mission you are playing uses strategic reserve rules, place that unit into strategic reserves. That model cannot arrive from strategic reserves in the same turn it's placed into strategic reserves. So essentially, if you've got up to two armages chilling near the edge of a of a um, you know table, you can slap them back into reserves and then have them re-enter the battlefield, which is level of flexibility that could potentially be quite useful for you especially in situations where your opponent has essentially made it impossible for you to get line of sight turn one for example um you know if you haven't got any viable targets for your uh, halverins turn one it's cheaper than putting two halverins into reserves using the standard reserve strat i think the standard reserve strat for two halverins would have set you back two cp so the fact that you can spend one CP and put them in reserves, admittedly meaning that you have to be on the board to one. But again, depending on the circumstances, there might be situations where that's beneficial for you. Um, not always, because you're a low model count army, so it's not always going to be beneficial, but there could be instances. Yeah, I think they're the, all also... I was going to say they're eight power, so two of them would be yeah, two CP yeah. to just put them in reserves normally. 
Yeah, um, and then the last the last part of that would be that I think there are also some stipulations where, like, there's certain um, secondaries uh, that have stipulations around moving back towards your table edge. Like, it's it's considered a negative to move back towards your table edge. So, for the sake of one CP, you can still move somewhere back on the board, but you're not, you know, you know, suffering the negative as a result of moving back towards your battery uh, towards your edge for some reason again there's it's 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 obscure instances where that matters but it can and does make a difference I, What's the I, next one for you? I was gonna say i like the idea of doing it as a bait and switch so you deliberately deploy them not necessarily out in the open but very aggressively to uh for your opponent to have to react to them and like maybe shift some stuff away from them uh, especially if they're the war glaives. And then you can sort of then in your turn just swap them over to the other side or move them or, or just keep them off for a few turns and then bring them up further up the board. Um, like a poor man's uh, uh, pre-game redeploy, but obviously you can't do it uh, before the game like Ultramarines and Eldari. And you have to do it at the beginning of your turn, but you could do it beginning of turn one basically just to nip them off. Um, yeah, yeah, you could definitely uh, bamboozle people with it, but certainly not to the same extent as you can with other armies. But no, no, no. Um, I'm going to go for point blank barrage uh, for one CP. Uh, use a stratagem in your shooting phase when a knight model is selected to shoot. Until the end of that phase, that model can make attacks with blast weapons against units within engagement range. And each time a model makes an attack with a blast weapon against a unit with the engagement range of it. On an unmodified hit roll of one, this model suffers one mortal wound as a result of the attacks uh, after they've been resolved. Um, so you can fire blast into combat and you suffer the damaging effects on rolls of a one to hit. Uh, very cool. Yeah, it's, I like it's it a lot. lot. Yeah, I think you you were telling me about this uh, earlier in the week and you were like, why just isn't this part of the core mechanic rule for blast? And... I, I kind of agree with you. It'd make Blast a lot, more, <laughs> but a lot more viable, but also still quite interesting to to use that people could sort of do a self-sacrifice uh, close-range shot. Agreed. All right, uh, when we get into the greys, the last part of the strats, um, I have a feeling I know which of these Phil will choose. Um, so I'm just going to choose Rotate Iron Shields. Uh, because it's the thing that is most synonymous uh, with um, with the um, uh, with the Imperial Knights. Basically, uh, use the stratagem in the opponent's shooting phase when an Imperial Knight vehicle model from your army is selected as the target of range attack. Till the end of the phase, that model has a four plus invulnerable save against range attacks. If that model is an armature class model, this stratagem costs one CP. Otherwise, it costs two CP. So they've done a lot of really good work with the way they've worded that to alleviate some of the weird wibbly instances of which it occurred before so for example if you took one of the uh, styraxes or or magiras um they have invuns uh, in combat and before you could rotate iron shields to improve their armor saves beyond what they were being granted normally so you could rotate in combat um additionally if you had um the four up invun that was a war gear option for knights. Again, you could potentially rotate that, but they've obviously now made it clear that you can only do it in your opponent's shooting phase and you can only do it against ranged attacks. Um, so if it is not their shooting phase or they are not targeting you with ranged attacks, you can no longer rotate. And also no. rotating just gives you a four plus. It doesn't give you plus one, two, one, which again is a big difference. That makes sense. Um I'm going to talk about hurled wreckage. That's but, what I thought you'd talk about. But before that, I want to briefly talk about Ion Aegis, which is uh, allows your Dominus class to have a Invun Aura ability. I'm, and it just works on Armager class models uh, within six inches and gives them a four-up save. Pretty good. Didn't it used to work on all Imperium units? believe it might have done yeah well, i think it did sure. um it, i'm sure in eighth edition it, it gave it to everyone which is a shame it still doesn't especially since there's a whole rule that allows you to take them as um as a 
God, what's it called? Uh, Agents of the Imperium uh, for other Imperium armies. So you could have had had that providing a cool like um, invon bubble to to the rest of your army. But then maybe they deliberately didn't do that because it would be a bit broken if that was the case. Um, anyway, hurled wreckage uh, for one CP. Uh, use a stratagem at the end of a fight phase. Select one Imperial Knights model. Um, from your army equipped with the Freedom's Hand or Fun Strike Gauntlet or Relic that replaces them. If a vehicle or monster was destroyed within engagement range of the selected Imperial Knights model during that phase, I guess noting that it didn't have to kill it itself, it just needs to be within engagement range when it happens, you can now select one enemy unit within nine and visible to the Imperial Knights model that is not within engagement range of any friendly models. Um, roll 1d6, subtracting one from the result if the enemy unit you selected is a character uh, with a wounds characteristic on nine or less. Uh, on a three to five, the enemy unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. On a six, the enemy unit suffers three mortal wounds. Pretty cool. Um, not very many mortal wounds, though. I mean, if a land raider falls on someone's head and only does three mortal wounds, that doesn't feel like a, like a huge amount. Was that always a separate stratagem from the... Um, not the crush them, the death grip. Or I thought it was actually part of the death grip strategy before, but I can't quite remember. Uh, so it used to be baked into the weapon profile. So it used to just be a thing that they uh... did. So the thunder gauntlets used to just have the ability to hurl. Um, but now they've obviously turned it into a strategy, which makes sense. Uh, yeah, because you don't want it happening every single turn. As, well, as I mean, you would do if you could do. It'd be fun. Well, that is true. Here, but, catch yeah. this. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's very circumstantial that you're going to use it, but I think it's interesting. I think it's a cool rule. Um, again, I think, you know, there will definitely be some instances where it will be useful for you to use it. So, yeah, why not, man? I think it's cool. I think it's a really fun thematic thing that they've given them because at the end of the day, if you've picked up and smashed up a vehicle with your big scary fist why wouldn't you hurl the wreckage uh in the general direction or something else so, yeah, yeah no, exactly on. i dig it all right cool well that's the stratagems we'll move on to the next bit which i believe is the relics is it not? uh exalted court oh not the exalted court that's a that's a lengthy one all right well we'll just uh we'll select a couple from each because um exalted court has even though, again, can I just say from the outset, they have done a terrible job of making it clear. I mean, why they didn't go Exalted Court, Questor Imperialis, Exalted Court, Questor Mechanicus. Like, it's just, I, I mean, as it turns out, the top half is uh, um, um, ugh, Imperialis and the bottom half is Mechanicus, but it's, it just, it's a really weirdly. Dumb thing. And again, they've got the usual thing where the first one in text is Master of Justice, but the first one in here is High Monarch. I don't quite understand what Games Workshop's graphic designers are smoking when it comes to laying out these books. It's yeah. just there is I, I think there the are times where they perplex me. Yeah, I think the reason why they haven't uh added the whether Imperialis or Mechanicum into the table is because that table is like a bit of a template that they do. Uh, and probably wouldn't fit within the boundaries of that single column. Um, but you're right, they could have done something or color-coded it in some way to make it clear or put a little icon, maybe, uh, so you knew which were which. Um, and yeah, with the ordering, I suspect they, that got reordered at some point and they forgot to update the table, which which happens and we've seen it in a few places uh, before. But I, I see what you mean about it being a bit fiddly. Also... There is an unnecessarily large amount of words to essentially say that if your army's battleforged, you can give your characters these abilities when mustering your army. Um, and again, you can't do it with free blades. Uh, so with the exception of free blades, you can upgrade any Questora class characters or Dominus class character models in your army to be a member of the Exalted Court. Now, that is, um, yeah, handy to say, obviously, the very least. Um, because obviously, yeah, being able to add abilities 
to the Dominus class ones is actually quite useful because otherwise the um the uh the, the, the dominuses wouldn't always be able to get access to things like the uh bondsman abilities but some of these do issue um as well so there is some interesting stuff to it but yeah it's a lot of words um to basically say give this upgrade to a character and increase their points accordingly um but there you go go figure so yeah we'll pick a couple or, or one each from each section um and uh yeah, it, it is worth noting though. So it says, um, it basically, it gains the exalted court keyword. Uh, and if the bearer has a bondsman ability, it can use a bondsman ability one additional time uh, in your command phase. Uh, so that's just something they all get when you uh, upgrade them. I'm assuming you can only upgrade one uh, each unit once. You can't do Correct. multiples, which is usually uh, the case. Um, and then they're obviously you get an ability and then you get a noble exemplar ability as well, uh, which only takes effect when you're honored or virtuous uh, in terms of the oath system. And then there's a crusade duty, which just talks about the requisition points if you're doing crusades. Obviously, we ignore that when we're going through these ones. <laughs> Indeed. So let's start with the Imperialist one. The High Monarch is the one I'm going to go for because it's the most expensive um, and uh, it's linked to giving you additional honour. So you can understand why it is expensive. Uh, so it is a quest for Imperialist character only and that character has to be your Warlord. So basically, if this, if this model included in your army, it must be a Warlord. Unless, of course, some other thing has to be a Warlord. But in such uh, cases, you get to pick which one that is. But yeah, basically, if you achieve any honor on a D6 roll of a 5+, plus, you gain one additional honor. Um, each time this model uses its bondsman ability, it also applies to every friendly noble household armature class model within six of this model. So that's pretty big. So it gives a six-inch aura um, to uh, armagers around it. So that makes a big difference. Uh, and then there's specific crusade rules. Uh, which essentially uh, states that while this model is in your crusade force, each time you use Exalted Court Requisition, it costs one fewer requisition points to use, which is obviously... Oh, we said we weren't going to talk about that. No, I know, but it's um, specifically here, so I felt like it's worth calling out, but the point is is that, yeah, it's a, it's a thing. But, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, I, uh, yeah, it's funny, because as you were reading it, I was like, that's not what this one says, and I realised I was looking at the Master of Justice, because that was... See, the there you go, you already... Already bamboozled. Uh, so yeah, your one was 45 points and two power, not too shabby. I'm going to go for the cheapest one, Master of the Vox, one power, 20 points. Um, well, that is a uh, that which, is a which again, one. You're jumping around the place. Uh, no, I know. It's also second from the bottom in the table, but last one on the list. So again, this list isn't uh, in order either. Uh, so, Crestum Mechanicus, uh, while on the, um, so while this model is on the battlefield, each time you spend a command point to use a stratagem, uh, roll a d6 on a 5 plus, you get it back. Uh, your exemplar ability, when you're, um, you know, you're, you're doing well in your oaths, you're honored. Uh, each time this model uses its bondsman ability, it can select any noble household armager model on the battlefield for that ability. Um, and obviously it's got something to do with Crusade, which I'm not going to read out because I am a man of my word. <laughs> well, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, I mean, I'll go back to one of the Imperialist ones just to round it out. I'm going to do the Gatekeeper. Oh, 35 that one. That's fine. Well, you're going to have to pick one of the... I'll do uh, a Mechanicum one again. So then it is an Please. order of sorts. Exactly. Um, so Questor Imperialis, character only. While this model is wholly within its deployment zone, uh, an unmodified wound roll of one, two, or three always fails, irrespective of any abilities. Uh, and while armature class models is under the effect of this model's bondsman ability, or that armature class model is in range of an objective marker, add one to that model's toughness characteristic, which is really, mm. really That's good. good. That's good. So, they yeah, are, you, uh, what are they going to be? Seven. Toughness seven? Yes, yeah, yeah, so it makes it toughness eight. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, what's the last one, Phil? Oh, I'm going to do princeps or or princeps if you are Latin. I hear this is um, good. So this is uh, one of the more expensive ones. It's uh, two power, thirty five points. Um, so Mechanicus character model only. Uh, if this model is included in your army, it must be your warlord. 
if uh, more than one model in your army has rules for this effect, then one of those models must be your army's warlord. I'd, I'd assume it would be. Um, each time your army would lose an honor point, roll a d6 on a 5, plus that honor point is not lost. Ooh, that's quite clever. Um, and then your exemplar ability is once per command phase, when this model uses its bondsman ability, it can select a noble household Questorius class model, excluding itself for this ability instead of an armager class. So you can do one of the normal big guys, not the biggest, we have a dominance class with the, the middling size, uh, normal ones. Well, that's pretty strong. Mm. Um, just that alone. And the fact that it stops you from losing points as well. Um, if you do muck up, that's, yeah. No, I like that one. The um the Forge Master is worth uh mentioning randomly by the way, just because it's minus one damage, which is pretty mad. So Forge Master is pretty good as well for the Mechanicus ones, but um Ooh, tasty. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Cool, all right, wicked. Next thing on this list of things, Phil, to talk about is the Free Blade Lance Army of Renown. Um, so I guess we'll get into that. You would be forgiven for assuming it's exactly the same as how it appeared in the pages of Warzone. No, Caradon. Oh, uh, Caradon, yes, yes, yes. Warzone, uh, Caradon, uh, Act 1, Book of Rust. The very ah, the Book of Warzone, Rust. Warzone uh, book. How much uh, of so the Book of Rust is still now valid, Phil, after the release of this little or none? Uh, I, I suspect, based on the PDF, nothing is... Um... Well, that was a valuable proposition. The the other thing in that book, if I just open it up for a second, so you had your House Raven um, Codex supplement, which, as we mentioned earlier, I don't think exists still. Oh, no, actually, you still have the Mechanicus Defense Cohort and Codex supplement Metallica. Yes, I mean, th those are still valid. Those, those are, should still be valid. Oh, and the Terminus S Assault Force. Um, and uh, should be valid, and Codex Supplement Cult of Strife, which is that the uh, Dark Elder one? So, yeah, Drakari one. I think. Oh, the Cult of Strife, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, fine. Well, yeah, yeah, you go. So, still a fair bit in there. This was the thing that kind of felt like it broke everything and everyone lost lost their minds. What, the Book of Rust or this specific uh, no, Free Blade the, the, the Book of Rust, because you had um, uh, Terminus Death was pretty minor. Uh, you had the Metallica update, which was pretty good, and you had Cult of Strife, which was huge for Dragari players. Uh, the Free Blade thing was really good for Knights, but no one really complained about it because I don't think too many people were running it, and Knights were in such a, a poor space anyway. So, what's interesting is that that Free Blade Lance Army is renowned, is being printed in this new codex mm. uh, and and it's basically updated so the rules for the most part are similar but a lot of the time it used to have rules referring to burdens and qualities for the um three blades which was their old sort of system but now we've got the kind of the oaths and martial traditions and stuff so now it sort of has been updated to reflect those things and a few sort of stat changes as well which we we just sort of talk about as we go through it um so it's interesting that they've done that and they've kind of effectively reprinted it but updated it uh and but they haven't done it for other things so obviously the codex supplement for house raven sort of i mean it does exist but the metallica one is in addition to the Codex book, yeah. Metallic rules. So it's interesting that some have been overwritten, some are still valid. It's a bit of a mess, I guess, in that respect. But that's, that's why there's a PDF to help clarify it for everyone. Exactly. A PDF that, in and of itself, isn't overly helpful on account of the fact that uh, it's, um, there's, well, there's some nuances to it. But anyway, look, I think, yes. What do we, do we really want to go? Because the fact is, is if you really, really care about what our opinions are on this, they're broadly going to be the same as what we would have said when we reviewed the Book of Rust and the Free Blade Lance specifically. Um, I should probably do the due diligence and actually say which episode that was. So I'm going to do well, it well, thusly. Well, but well, what's well, different, well, Phil? Oh, God, you're going to make me go through what's well, not, different. Not, not everything uh, is different. Broadly. If you were uh, to top shelf, not top shelf, elevator pitch, whatever it is, 
what this is. What 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 is it, and what's different about it this time? Well, I'll I'll, I'll do the the key rule, which is uh, indomitable heroes. Uh, so at the start of your command phase, a model with his martial tradition regains one lost wound, and each time an advance and charge roll is made for the model with his martial tradition, you can ignore any and all modifiers for the advance or charge roll. So that's a completely new benefit. Uh, and then you've got Legendary Knight, which is basically a free blade lance character can be upgraded to the Exalted Quartz upgrade, even though they are free blade, and they get some keywords. So those things didn't exist in the previous one because those that rules mechanic didn't exist. Instead, it used to have like plus one to their leadership. You could upgrade one per uh, one knight to a character, and there's a couple of other things. Obviously, the restrictions are the same uh, in terms of they all must be free blades. Uh, the Warlord trait. Uh, is similar. It referred to burdens and qualities before. Uh, now it basically uh, deals with getting access to the martial tradition. So you can uh, take the uh, the warlord can gain the glorified history martial tradition as if it was a quest or imperialist keyword, or it can have uh, filthy to the cog martial tradition as if it's quest or mechanicus keyword. Um, so it can gain access to. Uh, it's kind of the, the generic rules if you are an Imperium Knight or a Mechanicus Knight, um, which is quite cool. Again, a bit similar, but also a bit different from what it was before. It's got the Bringer of Justice, which uh, is the Relic Chainsword. That's ultimately the same as before. It was the same Relic, uh, but the stats have changed ever so slightly. So instead of when you do a strike, instead of doing times two strength, it's plus eight. Uh, and Similarly, uh, like the sweep's been modified ever so slightly. I think just bringing it in line with the, the new profiles of the new stuff. And then there's a bunch of stratagems that all have the same names. Again, burdens and qualities um, have been updated to the martial traditions and oath system. Uh, ultimately, similar but different. Indeed. It's basically a way of you being able to take a better force of free blades uh in episode believe it or not phil potentially episode 82 we talked about uh, no that I, was time ago time ago wow. but i'm looking through i think it's episode 82 because in episode 82 the title is army of renown um so we talk about army of renown and then shortly thereafter the adeptus mechanicus book arrives um, so I'm fairly sure that that's where it is. It, yeah, it would have been around that time. I, yeah. I presume after the Mechanicus book, because they, they came out pretty much. It, it came out, weirdly, it came out before the Mechanicus book, if you remember. It came out around the same time as Drakari Codex. So episode 79 is Drakari Codex, Phil. And then and then it's um, the... Um, Obelisk Invasion Campaign from Warzone Char Charadon. Then Stratagems, which I think was us just ranting about Stratagems oh, yeah. in episode 81. And then Armies of Renown, uh, which yeah, I'm pretty confident. it would have been that one, because that, that yeah. would have been the Warzone book, yeah. The Broad um, Strikes, if I remember correctly, was we quite liked it. And actually, in actuality, at the time, we were saying that this is one of those things that actually is really strong. I even remember some of our listeners saying to us that they would even consider running the thing after listening to our well, general... I... I, 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 I'd met people, I can't actually remember where now, where I met a night player and he was like, oh yes, I, ru I run my knights as this because it, they're, they're so much better because you get you used to get two burdens, and sorry, two qualities and one burden uh, and you couldn't have duplicate qualities but if you took enough knights once every single quality had been taken you could then double up so the really good ones you could make sure you got two of. Um, so that was a bit of a way of, I guess, gaming the system to an extent, but it definitely was a, a better way of running knights. Um, and I, I think, in summary, it's the same uh, sort of result. If you're running just all free blades, take this because why wouldn't you? It's only benefits to you because literally the only restriction is you must take free blades, which is as a free blade knight player, what you're going to be doing anyway. And mm. I, but I suspect the same is true as what we said then taking an imperial or mechanicus uh knight household is way stronger 
than the free blades because you predominantly get access to much better warlord trait stratagems and um well definitely relics uh, and stuff uh so that it does make up for it here where you do get some stratagems and a relic but that's just one sort of build whereas if you're going i'm going to be imperial potentially you, you know if you've done a custom paint job you can pick like you know five or six different i mean you could pick all of them because it does, your allegiance doesn't really matter right you could one day go my custom paint job is a quest or imperialis and then the next day go it's quest or um mechanicus so you know the choice is m much more um flexible in that regard well indeed i think that's the thing though broadly speaking uh it, again if you're going free blades it's a good way to go i actually think free blades overall are potentially one of the stronger options within uh within uh the the knights now um again it's too early to say for certain but i think the flexibility of being able to pick specific um you know attributes that favor each type of knight is that going to be uh is going to be beneficial potentially but again uh you know it's I also mean, probably one of the coolest ways of running a knight army because you can paint mm -hmm. each one up individually and go to town on them customize them power rangers esque or super sentai as they're known in japan phil i'm sure you're aware of that you're a bit of a fan yes. of the old godzilla and things and all that old crazy nonsense so i'm yes. sure you're very familiar with that but, I, um, I I too watched that Netflix episode of how was it the toys that made us. Well, I knew this Power before. Rangers. I mean, I, I've I've even got I've got the uh, the DVD box set of uh, Zoo, Zoo Ranger Nerds. to my side. There. I, know, Nerds. I know. I know. Look at me on a Warhammer Forty Thousand podcast. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Who being a total dweeb? What a shocker! Well, anyway, there you go. Is, this is this is the cool cool nerd club here. Is it the cool? I feel like Warhammer. this is lower. I feel like there are probably cooler nerds that like you know Power Rangers than like Warhammer. I mean, I'm. Uh... That would be a top ten list to do one day. What? What? Who's the? Who? Who is the nerdiest nerd, of nerd, nerds? Nerd fandom. Yeah. Yeah. Top ten list. Like, and where yeah. does forty k sit within that? Well, exactly. Exactly. Somewhere. Well, anyway, who knows? Let's talk about relics, Phil, because we don't need to dwell on the free blade thing. It's good if you got free blades. It, it's. I, I, t I suppose the thing that's more interesting about it is the fact that there's an army of renown in an actual codex for the first time ever. I know that's uh, mad. That is that is interesting, but I mean. Not interesting enough that I want to talk about this book for too much longer. I'm at that point now where it's like, oh, God, enough is enough. Um, do you ever feel like, Phil, that these Codex reviews are just eating away yes. at your soul? Yes. Like, yeah. like every, every time. But we, we um, I was going to say, we do it for the fans. We do it for the listeners. I don't know if they even enjoy them, to be fair. but No, I don't think they do either. I think we need to really massively reevaluate these. But... Um, we say this a lot. We'll get around to it. Anyway, um, relics. I mean, look, they're relics, right? I mean, let's get into them. We'll pick a couple each. They go across multiple pages, which is interesting. I've, I've got a good one already. Well, hit me up with it, mate. Tell me. Tell me which one you're going for. Content warning. I'm about to swear, everyone. It's the bastard's helm. Ooh, Ooh the bastard. It, yeah, exactly. It's an armager class model only. Uh, each time the bearer makes an attack, add one to that attack's wound roll. Uh, the bearer can't be affected by any bondsman ability or any knightly teachings, so that's a big minus. Uh, but the bearer does gain the following ability. Uh, the bastard's helm, it's a, in brackets, bondsman ability. Um, in your command phase, you can select one other friendly noble household armager class model within 12 inches of this model until the start of your next command phase. Each time that armager class model makes an attack, add one to the attack's wound roll. Um, so you get plus one to your um, wound roll, and you can give uh, one other friendly uh, model armager uh, within 12 I mean, plus one to it, wound as well. That's not give bad. It. Given that not having your bondsman ability means that you're not getting minus one damage, I would say that this is rubbish. Oh, yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you're going to be... But plus one to sense. wound is very strong. Sure, fine. But, like, minus one damage is potentially stronger. Plus a bondsman ability that would have been granted to you, which could have been advanced and charge, which could have been plus one to your weapon skill. This one's a skill. Reroll ones. I'd rather that. I'd rather that than 
than this. Fine, fine. You pick a better one then. I don't know if there is a better one than that. I mean, you know, that's that's top shelf, but I'm going to try. Um, I think the thing is, is there's a bunch of stuff that has been doing the rounds for ages, right? Like Sanctuary, the Armour of Sainted Ion. Cold I was just Wrath. looking at that, which is, uh, uh, well, let's just talk about those two. So Sanctuary is uh, a four plus invulnerable save against melee attacks. Yes, so that yeah, is that's what that is. Baller, as and the armor of Sainted Ion is the two plus armor save, and both Kulsraf very good. A, yeah, Cool's Wrath is a is a better version of the. Um, so, so it's always on overcharge, isn't it? The basically, yeah, you never the overcharge plasma. Correct. Yeah, that's basically how that goes. But some of the stuff that's new and interesting, I suppose, Banner of uh, the uh, Marcus Triumvirate or Triumphant Triumphant Triumphant. Whatever it's called, it's a banner, and it's a quest for Imperiara's quest or class model only. Uh, the bearer gets obsec, which is big, because um, mm. as uh, was uh, established a long time ago now, if you've got that oath and you're obsec already, you're going to get plus three, so you're going to your knight's going to count for thirteen models um, and still be obsec. Um, but what's interesting is it grants an additional honor, which is obviously valuable. So it is doubling down. It's helping you get to the ability that gives you obsec plus free yes plus an ex- yeah plus yeah i think that's i think that's a nice i think that's a nice wall or uh, not wall trade i think that's a nice relic um i think a lot of people will do that one of the ones i actually wanted to talk about is the changes to the endless fury um because endless fury was a pretty synonymous weapon or pretty you know regularly featured weapon within most yeah I, I looked at that earlier and i was like oh that looks good and then i looked at the regular gatling gun and was like yeah. oh it's not that much better no the endless fury before was like a no-brainer it was 14 shots but every six to hit was two hits rather than one so you were rolling 14 dice which potentially would mean on average that you could expect to get 13 hits or something or like you know, with a regular ballistic skill with no re-rolls for whatever reason, you'd probably be talking 30, maybe even 14 hits out of the thing. Plus, I think it was strength 7 rather than strength 6. I think it was an extra pip of strength or something or whatever. But the point is, is now it's basically just assault D6 plus 12. And that's a bit like, oh, okay. So, However, it's if you want to kill Space Marines... This is probably still the gun to do it because I don't. I, I it is the thing though, right? With armor of contempt, oh, it's minus I mean, three. Minus three, so it it, okay. it gains. A, so it gains basically uh, d six extra shots and an, an extra AP. pip of AP. Um, so yeah, being minus three is technically minus two against marine. So they're saving on fives, but flat two damage. I mean, it is only strength eight, but sorry, strength six. But you're winning on threes. Uh, yeah, whereas hit, I, I was, I was hitting on oh, freeze, on. winning on freeze, right? So let's say you get an average of what are you going to say on this one? Uh, I suppose the average is going to be 15 shots, uh, which means you're hitting 10 times and then you're wounding roughly seven times, more or less. Seven yeah. wounds, of which the Marine player theoretically, if they're in the open and getting a five up save. Plus the third, or plus, yeah, You're plus the third. So that'll be yeah, maybe say, say it saves two or three. Uh, let's yeah. say two. Oh, yeah, you could kill five. Marines. Whereas, whereas tra- Traitor's Pyre, which is the uh, Valiant Flamer one, so that's range 18, heavy 3d6, uh, strength eight, minus two, flat two damage. Uh, obviously, you're also hitting because it's a, a flame weapon. Uh, but also, an unmodified wound roll of six invulnerable saves cannot be taken against that attack. Oh, nice. um, interesting, a bit niche, uh, because it's a, a much more of a horde clearer, but if you could... I don't know, there are some uh, units that just have invulnerable saves, so then maybe that would be quite useful. I, I wonder if it nets out as being the slightly better one, uh, because you're doing 3d6, so you're doing probably less shots overall, although you could statistically do the same number. Um, but because you're auto hitting, uh, and you're wounding marines on twos instead of uh, threes, uh, you're going to get to the wound stage much more, although it's only minus two, so they're getting a four up save. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see how it statistically balances out. Well, you would um, like for the uh. Knight Valiant to uh, 
to be doing more damage than a than a than a warden, but yeah, I mean it should be. Uh, I t- well, I still think that's quite a good one. If if you if you're going to take a, a dominus class, you you want to probably take traitor's power or cause wrath anyway. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, is there a harpoon variant? No, it doesn't seem like there yeah, is. That's a shame. A relic harpoon gun would have been fun. The Paragon Gauntlet always used to be fun. Um, so model with this yeah. strike gauntlet only. Now it's okay. So there's two versions of it. Normal Thunder Strike Gauntlets have two versions? Yeah. Do, do they? So, um, well, let's find. No, Thunder Strike no, Gauntlet is. does have Strike and Sweep ability. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. So normally it's plus six uh, strength, minus four AP, uh, flat six damage. This is times you're, two. You're, you're, re- you're reading the sword, mate. Oh, God, I am, aren't I? <laughs> Why is it pictured? Why is the Warden pictured with a gauntlet, but then the gauntlet isn't on his profile? I know you need to, uh, even though it can swap it out. Okay, right, hold on. If you find uh, the uh, gallon, oh, right, yes, see. yeah, okay, I've got gun, yeah. So times two minus three, uh, eight damage. Uh, it's now times two minus four, nine damage. God, is that it? right? And, and then an attack made with his weapon on an unmodified wound roll of six, invulnerable saves cannot be taken. So, same with traitor's pyre sort of ability, yeah. and then the sweet. Uh, the normal one is plus two, minus two, flat three damage, and two hit rolls instead of one. This is uh, plus two, minus two, four damage, so just one extra point of damage. Uh, you make the same number of extra hits, uh, but wound rolls of six uh, ignore invulnerable second goes. Not that much better, to be fair. Like it. Well, it makes a di- it makes a difference if you happen to be up against a lot of death shroud terminators. If you're up against a lot of death shroud terminators. And you then go into the Paragon Gauntlet because they are minus one damage because of um, because you know. Death yeah, guard. no, I see what you mean. So your four becomes yeah. a three, which will kill them. But you know, and the thing is, to be fair though, it's not dead. It's Blight Lord Terminators, isn't it? There are Blight Lord Terminators everywhere these days, so useful in that regard. But you know, not extraordinarily useful, but certainly not bad. Um, I, I suspect most people will, as you say, be going for Sanctuary, Armour of yeah. the Sainted Iron, and potentially the Banner of Macarius' uh, Triumph. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that's gaining pretty Gaining obstacts, much... pretty solid. Well, and... from, in my army list I'm taking the weekend, those are the three that I've got. <laughs> All right, okay, so, <laughs> yeah. well done. We are yeah, in yeah, agreement yeah. then. There you go. Warlord traits, let's get into that. There's a Cunning Commander, Phil. Do you know what a Cunning Commander does? Uh, are you about to tell me, or my? Yeah, about gives to tell you, you. No, no, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. He gives you back command points when you roll a five plus. Nice. Uh, yeah. Is that when you spend it? Yeah. Oh no, at the start of your command phase. Oh, okay. So it's not when you spend a, a command point you are not refunded. So just at the start of your command phase on a five up, you gain command point. Oh, nice. Okay, so fair that's enough. actually quite that's good because that. Uh, w- w- Actually, yes. you have more chances to roll. So basically, actually, on an average game, you'll get one command point. Yeah, it, yes. Because a five plus is one in three. Yeah, because you're not getting it refunded. You could potentially gain two CP. Of stuff That's the rubbish. Um, that is poo. Yeah, the fact that it only happens at a five up. If it was a <laughs> four, four, four up, up, I'd be okay. Yeah, yeah. You, four you up, would I'd be probably okay. Because it. It, then you'd at least get probably an extra three CP per game. The old way ability in the old Elder Codex was you rolled in every each turn. So in your opponent's turn, in your turn, you could roll for it. And that was a five up. No, that was a six. But that was back in like eighth edition where command points were hard to come by. Mm. That's terrible. I thought that was just the standard five up, I get CP back thing. That's that's bonk. That yeah. is rubbish. All right, cool. Um, tell me about what it is to be uh, blessed by the uh, Sankrasan. Uh, S- Sacristans, yeah. Uh, each time this warlord makes a ranged attack, an unmodified wound roll of six. Uh, that attack inflicts mortal wo- uh, one mortal wound on the target in addition to the normal damage to a maximum of six mortal wounds per phase. So that is on your wound roll. Yeah, I guess if you had that on, you could double down on like Traitor's Pyre or something. So if you're doing something with it, which is like 3d6, uh, like just a ton of attacks. Well, bear, bear in mind that knight has more guns. The harpoon would do it. The uh, 
siege cannons on its shoulders, the melt true. guns on or its you could, uh, no, I mean, that's true. Everything could do it. Or you, you put it on the, the double shooter with the Gatling and oh, the Crusader, the yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, to be just, fair... It's just volume of shots, basically. It's a really good warlord trait to chuck onto a onto a Castellan. Because Castellan has truckloads of shots. So. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, that'd be good, but there you go. Uh, Iron Bulwark. It's a four plus Inver. It's what it's always been. It's good. Pick pick that one. Yeah, pick that one. <laughs> Make sure that's in there somewhere. Because mm. that's good. Given the is that, is that in your list? Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> you always have a... the thing is, right? In order for my so it cost me one CP to give this to a knight as a warlord trait. But if I wanted to give myself a four up in run in the game, it cost me two CP. It's just it's a it's the economy. And, that, and that's that's two CP per turn, right? To rotate. Per turn, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so yeah, why, so basically, why you spend one at the start of the game. Yeah, exactly. It's just it's it's it, it, you'd be mad not to. Yeah. So and you can put that on a Dominus as well, I presume. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can put it on anything. Nice. You can put it on an armature, Phil. Madness. I know. Um. Although it says you can only have the first uh, three, so with Armager you can have Cunning Commander, Blessed by Sacrosanct, and Iron Bulwark. Yeah, the first three. Um, so the next one they can't have, uh, which is Knight Senshal. Uh, add one to the Warlord's attack characteristics. Even if your army is dishonored, the honored chivalric ability for your selected oaths is still active for this Warlord. And then again it says this might mean it's different between your knights in your army. Obviously. Because that's accounting for free blades in it. Yeah. Um yeah, good. Good, good. Uh Landstrider. Landstrider is pretty strong. I like Landstrider. You're adding two to your warlord's move characteristic. Uh nice. and each time you advance uh roll each time an advance roll is made, treat a dice roll of one or two as a free instead, which is pretty reasonable. Uh and when they uh charge, treat a one or two as a free as well. Wow. So you think about that yeah. with like um the gallant. uh the gallant but then you think about that with like the uh fact that you're a um you imperialist, know, a imperialist one gets an extra is it was it plus one to your advance plus one was so it just advance or advance and charge advance and charge yeah oh. so worst case scenario you're getting a seven inch charge worst case nice but it's the fact that you basically so the thing is, and the thing is you can with the stratagem where you can add the warlord trait to warlord, you can give uh, the griff of warlord, you can give the griff of warlord advance and charge, and then you can give it um add the two and do the thing. So basically you can advance with uh, a CP um oh, the seven. Full tilt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For full tilt. So you can go seven with the full tilt, your move is fourteen. <laughs> Um, so you go 21 inches and then your charge can not be less than a seven. So you basically can go 28 inches in a turn guaranteed fret range, which is flipping massive. Uh, um, oh yeah. Cause in the charge roll, even if so, both the dice rolls get treated as a, a, a minimum three plus yeah, one yeah. for your ability. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. So I mean, basically, you almost want to be like, oh, I'm going to do that outflanking job. Oh, what was that? Armages only, though. Yeah, it was armages yeah. only. Yeah, I'm sure there's a well, you just put one in reserves because you like, yeah, I can do a nine inch charge it's super easy. Well, no, the, the thing is, the odds of getting a nine is still the same as if you didn't have this ability. As well, oh. no, actually, it is increased gradually, isn't it? Because you could, you could still get a nine with a one and a six or a two and a six, so your odds are increased, aren't they? Yeah, and if you get plus one to charge anyway, so you're doing an eight inch charge. Oh, yeah, gotcha. That. There you go. So actually, you could achieve it with a one and a four. I'm just double checking that ability. Oh, no, not one and a four, one and, one and a five. That's all right, isn't it? Um, oh, yeah, add one to advance and charge rolls. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there you go. So yeah, I, I, I at the moment, my. My 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 um my gallant is is sporting the. Uh, Does he also have this? So you've got two warlord traits. Okay. Of course, he's, he's he's all in on the warlord traits. He's just he's, he's this, two warlord this, traits. This list of yours writes itself, basically. Basically, yeah. No no well, skill required. It's not that's, that's it. Good. That's it. That's my favorite kind of army, Phil. 
That's my okay. favorite kind of army. The ones where uh, I don't have to think. I basically, if I go first, I'm going forwards. If I go second, I'm going forwards. That's the that's the plan. A simple matter. strategy. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. If anyone, well, hopefully, theoretically, no one should have necessarily have heard this by the time we're at the event on Saturday. But um, yeah, that's my plan. If you come up against me on the Sunday, maybe, and you're listening to this. I'm going for you. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so the last one is Revered Knights, which is one Canis Rex gains. Um, so this is at the start of a fight phase. If those war orders within engagement range of any enemy units, it can fight first that phase. If every unit from your army has the Imperial Knights keyword, excluding agents of the Imperium or unaligned keywords, and this war order is part of your army. Um, I mean, how would it not be part of your army if you... <laughs> You've given it a warlord trait, but okay. Then at the start of the battle, with uh, you start the battle with one additional honor point, but if this warlord is destroyed, you lose one honor point. I mean, that's not too bad if you want to try and, you know, if you're trying to get from to to like get upset from like turn one or something. And there are, as you say, there's ways of stacking uh, several other abilities to do it. Then maybe you would do it just for that. Yeah, uh, I thought Revere very strong though. I put Revered Knight on my errant um, because I just think it's it's a perfectly reasonable thing to have. Um, so I put the Revered uh, Knight on my errant, and then I've put the Banner on the Crusader. Right. How, how many CP are you starting in your list? Eight. Well, still a decent amount. Um... Is it eight or is it f- seven? It might be seven. No, 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 because I haven't put a Warlord trait on the... Um, on the Crusader. That's that's how that enough. So the wall there's no there's no warlord trait on the Crusader. But there is on the um Aaron and the and the and the Gallant. Um I was thinking about putting a warlord trait on the um on the uh uh on the Crusader. It's just it's like what do, what do you what are you gonna put on it? I could give it cunning commander, but it's rubbish. I could give it uh I could give it blessed by uh, Sancra Sands or whatever to give it the yeah wounds because it yeah no I, if could do yeah I mean you could do it because it's just body of shots right so yeah I mean why not well there you go oh no that's not true I've given it Iron Bulwark of course I have Doi. there you go it's all come back to me now oh because do, do you not have a you got a castle down there you're not taking that. No, I'm not taking the Castellan. I'm taking a Crusader, a Gallant, and a Ward. Oh, and, and uh, uh, right. Aaron. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Though. Because right, should, uh, should, should we move on to the nightly teachings? Yeah, so interestingly, because Games Workshop love just regurgitating the unnecessarily... I loved it when... Do you remember when Chaplains just let you re-roll all your hits? Back in the day where you just had a Chaplain and they went, I'm angry! And you're all angry too. That was, a, <laughs> that, that was fine. I was like, it's we're simple. all, we're exactly. Whereas now it's like, lead, I will lead you in prayer. It's like, oh God, not the prayers. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, I, on one hand, it's kind of cool that every army sort of has this kind of ability. But yeah. at the same time, it's like, oh, it's just a chaplain, right? It's sort of the exact same mechanics, just repeated, yeah. but with different kind of aura abilities. Now, yeah. Yeah. off the top of my head, I can't think of anything, but it would just be cool if it had a different kind of mechanic for each army that was maybe a bit more flavoursome to them, as opposed to on a free plus, this thing probably goes off uh, and it's probably an aura ability or a pick a unit within six uh, yeah maybe the actual individual things that they do are thematic but yeah. the kind of core uh you know recite a litany type thing tends to be the same i mean does this work at the same in the same way do you have to uh, yeah you basically roll a d6 on a free plus you you teach a teaching to the that you mentor the little armages so only I mean, that, is, that is sort of thematic though like the way yeah you... well it's like the bondsman thing already though you're already kind of doing it but now yeah, it's yeah, an that, extra that's doubling of down. It. Yeah. But it's not a bondsman thing. It's it's a, a knightly tea. Anyway. Um the virtue of courage, Phil. Um sit here for a moment, Phil, as I tell it, you the virtues of courage. Is it, can, can we before we do that, is it worth saying so who gets to the do this? Is it just the preceptor, right? Just okay. the preceptor. So it's, and it's, Canis Rex. 
it's a way of making preceptors uh, be yeah. bought. Yeah, exactly. Basically. Someone buy a perceptor, please. I, you know, to be fair, well, it makes well, sense. Technically, quite technical. you are you're forced to buy a preceptor because they've now put it the sprue in every box, and That's your true. night That's now costs a hundred pounds. So exactly, I bought a preceptor yesterday. Yes, I don't think you intended to, but you you've I've unintentionally got bought one. Yeah, I've got one. Might even make it. Anyway, uh, the virtue of courage. If this teacher is inspired while an armager is within six of the mentor, um, an unmodified hit roll of six, one additional hit is scored. Ooh. And that's anything. That's shooting and stuff. Fine. Lovely. Yeah. Next one. So, uh, over, uh, the oath of justice or ability. If this teaching is inspiring while a noble household armager cast model is within six inches, uh, it's, uh, I think that's very similar to almost all of them. Um, if that model is being affected by any chivalric abilities, you count as having two more on a point that you currently do when determining what those abilities are. This means that different abilities are actually... Yeah, okay, you get it. Um, I mean, that's okay, but confusing because it involves bookkeeping. Uh, I mean, you're doing that anyway, but it's then additional sort of separate mental bookkeeping to, okay, this is what this thing has. Oh, I've got a warlord trait, which means this thing is now getting both on a point, and maybe uh, you know this armager's now got it as well. Yeah. The folly of mercy. Uh, if this teaching is inspired, select one armager class model within twelve. Uh, the model can perform an action and make a normal move as if it were uh, move and shoot without that action failing. That's um, a good one. Yeah, it's all right. I mean, obviously, the actions that they can take a relatively limited to well there's a few now actually there are a few more can they raise the banners days. they can't raise the banners no got no um, arms they've got no arms even though they even though it's in their name but they don't have them <laughs> <laughs> oh that's a good one that yeah <laughs> I'm glad you like that anyway uh yeah tell us the next one mate right <laughs> Right, okay. Uh, you can tell knight... we've been doing this too long. It's like, oh, God, no, no. let's just get the, through it. The Knight's Faith, uh, again, aura ability. Uh, so if it's inspiring, sex an armager within six of the mentor. Each time the armager would lose a wound, roll a d6 on a six, the wound is not lost. If the armager model is under the effects of a bondsman ability, the wound is not lost on a five plus instead. So a uh, five plus sort of feel no pain is pretty good. Yeah, really good, actually. Fair play. Uh, the Warrior's Hope. Uh, if this teaching is inspired, select one armager within 12. Uh, select one oath from Code Shivaric. Uh, that is not active for your army. The oath is active for that armager model. Uh, and you gain the relevant abilities for your army's level of honor. It does not gain the oath's pledge or trough. Okay, fair enough. Note that this oath is active even if the every unit from your... Yeah, whatever. So basically, you get the other abilities from something, so you can be like, oh, "I now have heroic intervention." Yeah, uh, and then the last one is the wisdom of nobility. Uh, if it's inspiring, select an armager within twelve inches. Uh, each time uh, that armager model is selected for a bondsman ability, you can select one other armager class model within six inches of that model. Both the armature uh, models are affected by that bondsman ability. That one's actually quite good because you're getting yeah, right. three, an extra uh, bondsman action. Um, I think there was, yeah, there was a way of allowing a Questorus to just do two actions twice. I think maybe that was uh, that was the, uh, the noble houses. No, that was um, that was uh, you could do the bondsman abilities twice as an aspect exactly. of having the. Uh, Oh, the exalted court, yeah. The oh, exalted the exalted, court. oh, exalted court, yeah. That was it. Yeah. So um, if you're if you have an exalted court ability, you can double up on your bondsman stuff. Mm, nice. If it's a specific exalted court thing, anyway. So not not all exalted court specific, anyway. It doesn't matter. Let's talk about these profiles, Phil. There's armages, right? Like I'm gonna just say what the armager profile is for both instances, and then we can maybe just you know spitball about the differences between them. Yeah. Um, they're moving 12, weapon skill 3, blood skill 3, strength 6, toughness 7, 12 wounds, 4 attacks, leadership 8, and a 3 plus save. As they degrade, their movement, weapon skill, and ballistic skill go down uh, 3 times. 
Uh, so when they've got between four and six wounds, they're moving 10, ballistic skill, weapon skill, four. And when they've got one to three wounds, they're moving eight, uh, ballistic skill, weapon skill, five. The thing worth noting is that the armature movement has taken a significant, well, not significant, but they've taken a hit. They were 14-inch movement before. Now they are movement 12. Feels more appropriate for the board sizes that we play on these days. Um, yeah. But it is nonetheless a change. You either have a Helverin or a Warglaive. Helverins are good at shooting. Warglaives are also good at shooting, but they're also good at fighting. Broadly speaking, I think the Warglaive overall has actually come out a little better overall in this variant. Um, the Thermal Spear becoming heavy too. Strength 9, minus 4, D6 damage, D6 plus 2 when you're within uh, a range has healthily kind of made it more consistent. Um, and obviously the combat prowess, given the way that this book really emphasizes melee combat, means that, you know, from a utility perspective, these guys work better, more synergistically with what the army wants to be. Helverins used to be the cool, awesome thing that everyone wanted before um, in 8th edition, but, you know, I still think they're good. Mm. The thing is, if you're looking at these two in isolation, you're going to probably still think that you're, you're probably going to want to go more Warglaze than Helverins these days. But to be fair, the Morax uh, is better still, so you're probably just going to want that. Um, but, uh, but there you go, there's them. Gallant, or rather uh, Gladitus, uh, uh, were they? No, Restorus class. I was just going to interrupt and say, weirdly, the Helverins are 10 points more expensive than the Warglaves, even though effectively the Warglaive <laughs> is active in two phases of the game, both yes. shooting and combat. But I guess its shooting is quite, it's great at anti tank, but that's all. Whereas the Helverin is much more of an all rounder, let's say, because it can. Do a, a fair bit of damage to infantry, uh, medium, and even heavy vehicles. Because um, it's Tramp 7, so it's not too shabby. No, it's true. Plus, and they've given it. That. Plus one to wound, remember, with one of those weird relics. And also, they've given a minus two AP, which is a big buff to that auto cannon, because it used to just be minus one. Yeah. And That's yeah, big. each gun does 2d3, but you're effectively doing 4d3 shots. Correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, actual Helverins. That's not too shabby. Lots of. Yeah, Helverins are good. I'm not, I, you know, but I think moreover, I think of the two, I think Warglaves just fit more synergistically with what the army wants to do. Yeah. But I, I think either way, um, you know, I think, I think you want a mix of both to an extent, but I think you're probably going to go more Warglaive than you are Helverin. Um, the, uh, Questorus class. Now, there is actually some differences with the Questorus class. Um, however, that is basically just the Gallant. So yeah, there's Questorus class, attack. and then there's the Gallant. And then, if I'm not mistaken, but I probably am, perhaps the Perceptor has some specific guff that make. No, they're the exact same as everyone else. Fine. So yeah, so the Gallant is different, and then there's the uh, Questor class thing. So talk us through the Questor class chassis, and then we'll just do the Gallant, and then... Uh, yeah, Sure thing. Uh, so it's a movement 10 inches, uh, weapon skill, ballistic skill, 3+, plus, uh, strength and toughness of 8, 24 wounds, 4 attacks, leadership 9, and a 3+, plus save. Obviously it degrades in a similar way. Uh, so your movement of... 10 inches goes down to 8 and then 6, and then your weapon skill, ballistic skill of 3+, plus goes to 4+, plus and 5+. plus. Uh, the Gallant oh, is slightly different. So not only do you get plus 1 attack, uh, your weapon skill starts on a 2+. plus, uh, And your movement is 12. Three and, four. and yes, and your movement is 12, goes down to 10 and then 8. Uh, so an extra 2 inches. So actually it's quite a fair bit in terms of uh, little, uh, little tweaks. Um, well, that's two inches of movement, plus one weapon skill, plus one attack, and yet it's the cheapest one. It's because it's it doesn't really have any shooting, I think. And no, true, like... I understand that, but it's interesting. Because it's worth noting that the major change to these guys is Titanic Feet. Titanic Feet used to be the default attack methodology of knights. But what it meant for knights before is you could have shooty knights that were super efficient in combat. They've now moved into a system where in order to be efficient in combat, you need combat weapons, which I think is appropriate. Yeah, but I... before the feet were just busted good and you'd almost never actually take 
the never use the main weapons unless Correct. you're up against something like another knight. Yeah, I think the thing that's become really interesting though with this particular chassis is the fact that it's not dramatically different. If, if anything, for the most part, it's worse than it was before. They've added these bondsman abilities that we've kind of spoken through throughout. Um, and, and we'll, I guess we can just highlight these just quickly. So Errant gives plus one to advance and charge and allows your uh, armagers to advance and charge, which is massive. So it's selecting uh, one armager within 12 Correct. inches for each each uh, bondsman ability, right? Yeah, so all bondsman abilities are 12 inch range, um, as far as I'm aware, anyway, bar the ones that come from Exotic Court that become nine for some reason. Um, Warden's duty is it gives uh, the armagers a body count of 10. So you go from counting as five models to counting as 10 models. Um, and because armages are obsec, that's pretty useful, but it's very situational. It's not often that you're going to massively see reap the benefit of that. Uh, the Night Crusader gives plus one to your ballistic skill stat, and it's important that you note that that's your ballistic skill stat. It's not plus one to hit. I saw a few people talking about the Morax, which is the lightning cannon armager, suggesting that with this plus one to hit, their lightning strike thing or whatever it is that does the exploding sixes would go off on five. No. Doesn't. No, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Night Gallon. People, people love to try their luck, don't they? Ah, oh, mate, it's 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 all they do. It's all they do. Uh, the Knight Gallant gives you plus one to your weapon skill stat, and the Knight Paladin, quite a strong ability as well. Uh, you reroll hit rolls and win rolls of one. Um, oh, Captain the and Lieutenant. Nice. Yeah, the Paladins, the Paladin and the Errant, actually very very strong, very very oh, strong. And what about the Preceptor? That's surely got an ability as well. That's got um, that's got all of the uh, Chaplain abilities we just spoke about. Ah, uh, so it just has those. It, it just has those. Also have uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is interesting. I mean, again, if you make it a character and if you give it an exalted court ability, there are bondsman abilities within that. So there are ways that you can still perform bondsman abilities, but they have to be exalted court specific bondsman abilities, as opposed to ones that they've got natively. Um, so you can have that, and then you can have that in conjunction. With the uh, with the with the, the the nightly teachings, the the chaplain stuff. I think yeah. you know I overall. It, 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 am I right in thinking that the going back to the uh, Titanic feet, the Night Crusader is the only one you'll ever use the Titanic feet on, correct? Because it's the only one that doesn't have a close combat weapon, correct? Because uh, if you because it used to be with Titanic feet did. Uh, was it three attacks for every attack on profile? Correct. So it would always do like a volume of shots. Now that's the sweep version of the attack on the actual close combat weapon so and the titanic feet stat wise is just worse because it's strength user minus two two damage every other thing like the gauntlet or reaper i mean the sweep on the chainsword is still strength user but it's better ap and does three attacks instead of just one uh, yeah. and then everything else has bigger uh, strength modifiers or ap modifiers and more damage so I think I think yeah. the thing that's really interesting, I, I don't think Titanic feet are dramatically worse. I just think the problem is is that in a game where we've seen massive power creeps for certain units, you think about how many attacks they're throwing around for other armies and, and units, you know, you get a you get charged by a unit of banshees, they're slinging piles of dice at you. It is interesting overall with the Questorus chassis because you are paying roughly the same points. In a lot of instances, you are paying the same points. Like in a couple of smaller instances, your points cost has gone down and a number of other instances have gone up ever so slightly. And what's weird about that is, is that in a lot of instances, those actual knights used to kind of be better or were potentially a little bit more kind of sensible within the confines of the game as it was in 8th edition. I think, to me, a knight only having four attacks on profile feels like a mistake for the points that you pay for them. To me, right now, it feels like every knight should have had a 50-point reduction 
Like it feels like, to be honest with you, I think the gallon actually is probably okay at 400 quid, but you know, to pay 425 for the errant, 435 for the warden, you know, 480 odd for the crusader. It's like, it's a lot of points for something that broadly speaking, you could suggest is remain the same, if not actually potentially got a little worse. Well, than before. I mean, here's the thing. So the, the standard one has four attacks, gun has five attack charge, but realistically that actually translates to 12 attacks uh, for most of them and 15 attacks for the gallon. If you're going to use a sweep profile, which is, the, you know, just the volume of, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, again, against horde clearers. Uh, but as we said, the Crusader is the one that kind of lucks out because it doesn't get, it, it will only have about four attacks. But that's good because I think that's a good trade off. Like, that's a real shooty knight. It's not meant to be good in combat. And I think in previous editions where the feet were so good, it's like, cool, my knight that only has guns is just going to blow up at everything. It's just going to shoot everything. Then I'm going to charge into combat and I'm going to stomp everything to death. And that became the default all rounder. Whereas now there's much more viable choices and reasons to take other knights as well um yeah. so there's a bit of pros and cons i do like i know what you mean about how on profile it just looks pretty bad um but i think the the, the dual profile of the weapons is what sort of brings it back to um sort of fix that issue i think yeah i hear you and i think that's the thing i don't want to come across like i'm griping too much but i think I think the thing is, is it, it it feels to me when compared to some of the other options out there, I, I'm kind of looking at this and I'm sort of going, okay, cool. Like what, why again, the bondsman stuff, all that. So it just sort of feels like, again, if I compare it to like the Rafe Knight, like the changes to the Rafe Knight, which are about the same points as these guys, right? Like Rafe Knights are surprisingly cheap. Um, in fact, how much is a how much is a Rafe Knight by comparison? Just give me a second. So a Rafe Knight, fine. So a Rafe Knight can run you something like four hundred ish points, also, and it's got less wounds. It's got two less wounds, but it's got a four up invun all the time. It's got minus one damage, you know. And, and okay, it hasn't got abilities and things that benefit it in the same way as the knights but you know this is the thing you, you're gonna see things like wraith knights running around and in a lot of ways wraith knights potentially outperform um you know imperial knights and, yeah, and that's a, a weird one yeah i mean i was just looking at bellacore right because he's 380 points he's got six attacks on profile strength eight so his sweeping attack is strength user so strength eight minus three one damage and you do two hit rolls instead of one. Whereas fair enough, um, fair enough. Even the uh so in comparison, the Reaper Chain Sword is also strength eight because it's strength user minus three, three sorry, minus three, two damage, but you do three attacks instead of one. Here's the uh, thing. Bellacore's got psychic powers. Bellacore can't be re rolled against Oh Bellacore yeah, he's got, one to hit. He, he's got a bunch Bellacore, of crazy other stuff. Bellacore's got like, the fly keyword. I, I, like... I was just looking more the the kind of base attack profile uh, and the sort of you know, weapon stat line. But, that, but that's the thing though, right? And I think that's the interesting thing is when you look at a thing like Bellacore, who should be amazing, you've got to ask yourself what's the, what's the justification for Bellacore having all that utility and being that point cost? I think the justification is the fact that he's the only objectively strong thing in all of Chaos Demons at the moment, although I think there are some interesting builds out there and people do amazing things with Chaos Demons. But, you know, Bellacor is obviously good and Chaos Demons overall is definitely lagging because they haven't had a codex and they haven't had a lot of support. So I think in that case, Bellacor being that price point is useful for, you know, up up weighting um demons overall but it's just interesting it's an interesting thing anyway um and this is the other thing just to finally say with the exception of the swords and the and the fists all of the weapons pretty much have remained the same with the exception of the um the thermal cannon so it's gone from 
heavy d6 to heavy 2d3 um and uh it's always d6 plus two damage unless you're within half range uh which is d6 plus four noting that they've reduced the range of the thermal cannon by six as well I think. I think it's 36 inch did, range. did it gain blast or did it always have blast uh it gained blast it did get oh. it did have actually that's not true it did have blast because they add they they did a thing didn't they where they said when stuff got blast but there you go anyway they are the backbone of uh of the knights but the, then you got the the big ones the big ones the big which boys. as far as i'm aware have the same profile um so yeah movement eight weapon skill four plus ballistic skill three plus strength and toughness eight 28 wounds four attacks leadership nine and a two plus save which is exactly the same for the other one and their movement degrades. So they go from movement eight to six, then four, then weapon skill four, five, six, and then ballistic skill four, then five. I mean, it's crazy to think that if you make this thing a Mechanicus Knight, it's 30 wounds at the start, um, which is pretty uh, Jason, pretty strong. And a two-up save, very good. Two-up save is, yeah, that is, that is a very, very compelling uh, model. There's a lot of reasons to want to, Add one of those to your army. Um, in terms of uh, standout things, um, I do not honestly understand how we ended up in a situation where the Volcano Lance does not ignore Invuns. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's yeah. a super heavy sort of Titan killer, tank killer. It's like, yeah, it shouldn't ignore Void Shields because... yeah. Void shield save against stuff like that, but the fact that it doesn't ignore or even degrade an inbun save would be yeah, yeah. sort of feel thematic. Um, yeah, because it's minus five AP, but yeah, it's just going to potentially bounce. On. I mean, maybe you'd argue the whole point is inbun saves do save against even stuff like this. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, doesn't give me hopes for the shadow sword when that comes comes around. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. It's like, again, if you're shooting at a land raider, great. If you're shooting at, um, well, a great many things. I mean, the fact you wound them on twos, it's just that thing, isn't it? It's like they set the precedent with towel. They went, there you go. Here's a towel thing. It ignores invuns. And it's like, yeah. okay, cool. Or volcano cannon, you know, it basically if a piddly little tank with a rail cannon is ignoring invuns and doing more wounds and strength ridiculous and doing all that damage. I mean, don't get me wrong, the fact that it is uh D6 plus eight is pretty reasonable. But they've also made it heavy D3. It used to be heavy D6. So they've reduced they've reduced that. It used to also be free D3 damage which obviously could never be as good as D6 plus 8, because the minimum you can do with this if you get through is the maximum you could have done with 3D3. But the but the thing is, is it's like, you know, best case scenario, I'm getting three shots. Out of that, I'm getting two hits. Out of that, I'm probably getting two wounds. But if I'm shooting something with a four-up invul, I'm getting one through. So my best case scenario is I can expect to do 14 wounds to something. And a lot of the time, that's probably not enough to kill the thing that that, that, that you wanted to. Noting, obviously, you've still got other melter guns, you've got other things, but it's an interesting change. It's an interesting change. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Um... And then the um, the harpoon doesn't inv- ignore invuns as well. It doesn't? Which is crazy. I don't think so. Each time it's one of the monster, I wanted the attack to hit roll. Each time attack made with this weapon, I'll look at it, model, it's always deep in more wounds. Yeah, it doesn't. You think a harpoon? That thing's a flipping great. It's like a harpoon the size of a house. Yeah. So, shopping. so even if you, but if you are, even if you make your inbun save, you're still taking a few mortal wounds. Though. Yeah, fair enough. For I imagine uh, the impact of it. But like... um, but as you're right, yeah, minus six. And it's like cool, but pretty much anything worth shooting at is going to have an inbun save, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, that's one, one of the shot as well. That's one of the interesting issues with the way they've kind of designed the game now, though, is like. So much stuff has invuns. It's crazy that you're creating weapons 
that ignore invuns, but then not giving it to stuff that thematically well, should be, right? Maybe why? Because the Shield Breaker missiles, which was, as far as I'm concerned, the first thing in the game that it did ignore invuns, still ignores invuns. So maybe they've not put it on the big guns because that's what the Shield Breaker missiles are there for. They're the things that are meant to like pop the invun saves. Um, yeah, I was just tr trying to have a look through to see if there was still that stratagem that allowed you to target characters. Because so, I remember it used to be, be like a really annoying like sniper moment where you'd use your shield breaker missile, you could uh, spend uh, some points for a stratagem that they target characters, they don't get an inbound save, it does a crazy uh, number of, you know, you're pretty much wounding on twos, it's minus four, so they probably won't be getting a save and does d6 damage, so you've got a high chance of just one-shotting character off the table i can't see it in there so i presume they've taken that one out and probably understandable because i imagine it just annoy people more than uh, anything else yeah well there you go that phil was us we talking know. about all the stuff we could reasonably talk about in nights i imagine do you, do you want to have a quick look at the old canis rex no what does he do he's a free blade perceptor and he's got a weird little man that pops out of him if and when he dies. He's basically um he's basically um uh, Sergeant Kronos, but for knights. Yeah, he can uh, disembark uh, when it's destroyed. Um and he's got his own profile. He obviously doesn't have iron shields or super heavy walker ability. That makes sense. Um he also, when he makes an attack against a non-Imperium unit, unmodified hit roll of six scores one additional hit, which is all right. Um, once per battle, you can reroll one hit roll, wound roll, charge roll, or saving throw for him. Um, oh, and he can inspire people like a preceptor. Okay, all right. Oh, what is the is the Laz Impulsor any good? So low intensity, thirty-six inches, heavy two d six, strength six minus two, two damage, blast, and then the high intensity version, twenty-four inches. Heavy D6, strength 12, minus 4, 4 damage and blast. I mean, that is better than what it used to be. Mm. Yeah. Is it? I mean, yeah. I, I mean, Canis Rex is definitely cool. Um, I think if you're going free blade, you're going to want to... Why not Canis. take him? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah. He's... Um, yeah, I think they've done a better job with the Perceptor. I think there's some interesting layers to it, for sure. Um. There you go. That's us talking about more or less everything that is Imperial Knights. What is your vibe on this one, Phil? I'll just come out and say it straight away. I am... Here's the thing. Well, the, 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 the very fact you're taking Imperial Knights to the tournament this weekend probably says everything anyone needs to know about it. Well, no. See, so here's the thing. I'm taking them because, they're, because I couldn't be bothered to take something with more models. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. It's the lazy I mean, man's army, is what you're saying. It is. It is. Look, here's the thing, right? I hope I'll go three and two. I expect I will struggle to achieve that with this army. I think the problem is with it is is that it's a one trick pony, right? It's just I'm just going at you. You either take it, and if you take it, you'll probably push back against it and win easy, or you'll get overwhelmed by it. And if you get overwhelmed by it, I'll win. But the thing is, is that, like, it's, as an army list, I think the the problem is with this book, and it's a problem they've, again, I hate banging this drum. This is the old man ye yells clouds section of things. The problem is with this stuff is it's like, I've, over the last week, have spent the time reading this and understanding it and getting under the skin of it. And I understand it now. I understand the oath system. I understand the exalted court system. I get it. The bondsman system. But it is unnecessarily complicated at times. It's one of those books where I'm like, there's a lot of creativity in it. There's a lot of fun things you can do with it. But it's it's quite difficult to get into. And I think the thing, the charm of knights before was that they were, you know, not brainless, but they were just sort of, you know, they broadly made sense to people. They, were, they weren't hard to get your head around. They're big robots with big guns and big feet and big swords. They're just going to shoot and smash, and that's how it goes. Whereas now it's like, oh, God, I've got to manage. They've added a lot of admin to it. Um, but 
again, I want to see how they go. I think, you know, I think I can't for the life of me imagine that I've constructed a list with these, un- these knights that are going to win me a-, a tournament, but I'd be thrilled if I managed to go three and two with them. But that's always what I shoot for. I always shoot for three and two, but I'd be happy to just come away with one win. Um, I think the thing is, right, Tao will eat them for breakfast um, and, and, and delight in doing so. Uh, Harlequins will probably eat them for breakfast. Um, and then Sisters will definitely smash them to hell. So it's like you got three armies there that they're going to have a horrible time with. Um, I don't think they've got enough damage output to chew through Death Guard. I don't think they've got um, enough uh, mobility to combat the trickiness of like elder armies like Drakari and all the rest of it. I think you're basically banking on, can I alpha strike hard enough? Can I survive long enough? Can I, you know, basically it's an army that relies on you rolling five up in buns all day. Um, and if you, if you can't do that, and it falls over. It's too. It's a swingy mm. army. Oh, that's fair enough. But um, I mean, I like it because it's knights, right? And I'm gonna have a fun time playing it because I don't have to think about it. I'm just gonna put it down. I'm gonna run at people, and they will either deal with that or they won't. <laughs> and that's how it's gonna go. That's uh, that's fair enough. Yeah, but what's your vibe on it, mate? Um, when I when I was flicking through it originally, just like looking through the artwork and stuff. And uh, to an extent, the rules, but most of the artwork, I was like, because to, to to for people to remember, several years ago, I actually bought some knights, planning on doing a knight army. Uh, it still never quite got off the ground, but I've always planned to add one to an army as an ally when you could do, and obviously now we can again, or to flesh that out into its uh, my own custom uh, knight household, which I've done a load of background and lore on. Uh, so it has reignited my passion and uh, and the idea of doing that again so it has made me go oh yeah maybe 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 at some point I'll I'll get around to doing it. Um, yeah, the rules all seem pretty good. I do remember when I flipped over to the chivalric uh, ability page, I was like, dear God, what is this? Because initially, when you glance at the double spread of rules in some kind of tabular column you're like oh my god this looks quite complicated and then i read it and i was like oh actually it's not too bad okay you pick a knife great okay it's quite straightforward positive negative there's some bonuses um and at that point i was sold as oh this is quite a good idea and then i saw you actually have to select two of the oaths uh not just one and i was like okay this makes it a bit more complicated and as you're saying uh there are tons of extra abilities, Warlord Chase, um, Exalted stuff that all play into that. So actually, it's not just your whole army being affected by this at any one time. It could potentially be every single unit is affected in a different way, or at least some units are affected in a different way from the rest of your army, which is much more admin and bookkeeping, which isn't a good thing in my mind. Uh, so it does make it one of the more complicated mechanics. I'm sure some people will love that because it could be an easy to uh, easy to learn and pick up, but hard to master, which you know a lot of people like as a concept uh, for a tactical tabletop game. So maybe that is a good thing in the long run, um, but it could potentially just put off a lot of people or new players. And as you say, people often want to play knights because they just want a nice, easy army where they can go, cool, my turns will be really quick. I'm a slow player or whatever. I've got five things. They're just going to point and shoot the stuff, and then I'm going to charge into stuff super easy. But now all of a sudden you're like, okay, well, because of my chivalric honor, I'm dishonored if I don't charge into these things, so I even need to position myself to be near them to complete the charge or away from them so I don't have to do the charge. Um, and now I've got bondsman ability, so I need to make sure my armor is near my big things. Part of me is a bit like, just ignore all of that or try and build your army to avoid those abilities as much as possible just so you can have fun playing with the knights and not having to worry too much about it. And then maybe once you're comfortable with that stage of the army, you can then start getting into the bondsman abilities and uh, all the other stuff. Um, overall, though, I think it looks like a really solid um, solid army. Like There doesn't seem to be any real duds in the codex 
uh, the preceptor always used to be the unloved, ugly duckling of the <laughs> army. And it finally feels like it's finally had its glow up, as the cool kids say. Um, so that's good that that f- hopefully it now has its place. And we'll, you're actually, see- I've never seen uh, a Knight Preceptor or Canis Rex on the tabletop ever because no one ever takes it. So hopefully we're. we're Richie seeing- took seeing- them all the time, mate. He won't, he won't be happy when he hears you say that. He always did, he, not... did he take yeah, a yeah. Preceptor? Oh. Yeah, he did, yeah. Yeah, he did. Maybe he was the only one. He did it for uh, a bit with his... I think he swapped it. I think he weapon swapped it back to a Gallant most of the time, but I've seen him... But yes, it. I, I saw him run the Gallant all the time. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, but and... I, think he, I definitely think he ran it as a Preceptor now and again. Yeah, I think the Gallant's probably always been my favourite um, out of a lot. Plus, I do love the Dominus class uh, ones as well, so... Cool. Yeah. I think I, I think overall, at the end of the day, what they've done, they've taken knights, they've 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 toned down some of the stuff that was maybe a little bit too oppressive from it before, which is intriguing in the current landscape of the game because a lot of the times they've been up waiting the oppressiveness, but in this instance they've kind of reduced it a bit. But then they've essentially given them tools that mean that they can perform more appropriately within the confines of ninth edition, which I suppose is what people wanted. Um, I think, as I say, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of a punch to them, especially when you look at things like nids. I mean, there's a thing like a carnifex will absolutely, you know, like do ridiculous things comparatively. But that's the thing. It's like when you look at what the nids were, and you look at what their big monsters were able to do. You then look at the knights and go, oh, huh? like, what? Really? Um, but again, it's you know, I'll let you know how I get on. Obviously, over the weekend, um, I'll be sure. I haven't used my Instagram in so long. I'll, I'll post some stuff on post, Instagram. Post some pictures or send it to me, and I'll stick it up on the lookouts. Uh, uh, the more valuable, okay. yeah, social media. My um, own social media is I, a waste of time. I, I, I was going to say. So I, I suspect, based on when we read through it, that the the army build of choice is a couple of big knights and some armagers, and it feels like. If you're just having the big nights, you're probably handicapping yourself, which is a shame because I feel like you should be able to just run them uh, or you little can, ones. But you're not gonna, yeah, you're not. Do as you're well. not do I mean, yes, you, yes, you can, but it feels like you're actually missing out if you don't take armages because armages have a lot of innate abilities like obsec. They, they, there's more bodies they can do actions. Um, so it feels like, yeah, it feels like. You've almost got to take armages if you want to play knights properly, let's say. Yeah, no, I agree. You you definitely have to have armages in your list. I think that is a essential element. So there we go. Thank you very much, everyone. We hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I haven't obviously edited this at the point where I'm saying it, uh, so I'm intrigued to know what this overall episode will come in at. It's probably going to be another five-hour saga. Um, tell us, tell us what army you managed to paint in the time that you listened to this episode. Exactly, exactly. And there, there, there's still more to come because we've got the outro to come as well. Well, exactly. We're now going to talk about uh, the Warhammer Fest online thing. So we better get on with that transitional noise. Hey everyone, it's the end of the show, and you know what that means. Myself and Phil will talk about more general topics uh, that we weren't utterly able to uh, discuss throughout the main body of content, this week being Codex Imperial Knights. Uh, We still have a bunch of Warhammer Day, Warhammer Fest, that's the word I can find. Warhammer Fest online extra bits that we didn't cover. Last episode we managed to talk about uh, the Warhammer 40,000 specific bits, but we didn't get into all the other fun extra bits uh, that are Warhammer 40,000 adjacent. Uh, so if it's not Warhammer 40,000 or Warhammer 40,000 adjacent, we're not talking about it. So Age of Sigmar, Warcry, that stuff, not so interested in discussing. However, things like Necromunda, Kill Team, and of course, Horus Heresy, uh, are things that are, I believe, Warhammer 40,000 adjacent, and thus worthy of at least some commentary, wouldn't you say so, Phil? 100%. Lovely, lovely stuff. Now, I have to be honest, I haven't taken the time to open up all the tabs just yet, 
Uh, Phil has done so. So I'm going to lean on him to tell me what is the first of the things that we need to address from the Warhammer Fest that was. We, we're going to be talking about, so the first one, which was the Friday, which was the sort of specialist games slash skirmish games. So we're going to talk about Kill Team. They've released a brand new box set or previewed a brand new box set. Uh, Kill Team Morok, which is clearly the latest war zone, which comes with Chaos Traitor Guardsmen and Pretty cool. Phobos Space Marines, which is really just an upgrade sprue. Which is exactly what we had predicted. We predicted that we would get one new thing and an upgrade sprue. I had expected that it would be the forces of the Death Watch um because i thought like the death watch would be a really cool marine thing to add to kill team um but in this instance uh i mean obviously well it this could one could be, be death watch. yeah could be could be death watch but it's just more general phobos space marines of the infiltrator persuasion it seems moreover yeah, the uh for the upgrade for the incursor infiltrator kit, which is something I think we did actually speculate because they're they're the obvious choice for kill team because they are the scouty kill team uh models. Mm. Uh, should we should we talk about those first? What do you think Why not, about mate? some of the the little gribbly upgrades that you can get? We're gonna do upgrades or we're gonna do the traitorous guardsman. Okay, let's talk about traitor guardsman because I think oh, we'll get out on to them. two. I think out of the two, Traitor Guardsmen are the better ones. I would agree with that statement. I think, you know, ultimately we've got some new sculpts in there. We've got some reused oldies but goodies. The uh, chaotic Commissar uh, and its uh, Ogren buddy. Uh, that is of Black uh, Fortress. Yeah. Blackstone right? Fortress, yeah. They That's were it. one of the expansions where you could buy just those two minis on their own. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now you can buy them along with the Traitor Guardsmen, which are of the same visual aesthetic as the ones that came in Black Zone Fortress, uh, but obviously they're, they're all brand new sculpts, which all look very nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very happy with them. It's good to see that they are uh, adding a bit more of a kind of uh, smooch boosh. Uh, one day I'll look up what that word actually means. Uh, but <laughs> in this instance, I presume it means a mix of things. Um, they are like a Mad Max style evil biker gang, which is a look are. I can 100% get behind. They've got that going on. But then even then, there's a few more kind of interesting, uh, interesting kind of little elements. I love uh, the gentleman with the plasma gun, at least as modeled here. Just the sort of worldly old geezer wielding a plasma gun who's just obviously... Uh, gone ah whatever i'm gonna get involved in this chaos business uh, which is quite very, funny very, because yeah. he looks too old to be wielding a plasma gun uh he obviously keeps uh he obviously doesn't overcharge his plasma gun he's uh got into a nice right bold retirement age by playing it safe let's say that or perhaps that is the you know aging effect of the plasma gun maybe just that morning he was a youthful you know fella looking like he was in his early 20s and then upon grabbing the Chaos uh, Plasma Gun, he immediately aged uh, and grew himself a nice long white beard, like um, Tim Allen in The Santa Claus. Yes, where it just magically appears. Yes, maybe with that Plasma Gun, he killed Santa Claus and thus became him. I, I can imagine that being the case. Exactly, that's yeah. how it is. It's uh, very likely to have been his reality. But no, I think... There's a lot of really great personality and a lot of nice little touches. Uh, very, very promising for what might be down the line for yet more guard-related things. Um, yeah. My favourite like is the is the guy with the shotgun and the shield. Oh, yes, I uh, like him, the old riot the police that, style one. Yeah, and it clearly used to have the Imperial symbol on it, and they've clearly chipped it away and put a chaos symbol on top, which I think is a very nice touch. Also, as well, though, it's actually a really awesome thing to see because one of the things that is quite difficult when you are in an attempt of, you know, scrubbing out any kind of imperial iconography in your conversions, often it's difficult to completely remove it without a lot of work. Whereas now it's almost like they've given you carte blanche to 
express that within your own conversions when you're trying to scrub away the Aquila. It's acknowledged that uh, you could still have little remnants of it and that would be utterly acceptable, right? Mm, yeah. You don't need yeah. to go out and buy a Dremel, just sort of shave away at it with your craft knife carefully. Um, and, you know, near as darn it, you're, uh, you'll do well enough. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Um, and obviously, I think the comms arm, the Ogryn, still hold up. They're still wearing really great good minis. sculpts. Great minis. Um, yeah, like, I th- I think, actually, you know, it's it's rare we say this because we, we sometimes are a bit critical of some of the stuff. Often. I think these are all fantastic sculpts. There's I agree. Not a, there's not a thing that I don't really like about them. They're all, no. they're all good. Yeah. No, In fact, I want Great personality, them. great, you know, poseability, interesting weapon selection, you know, really good personality and all the characters. And, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because obviously you can tell that there's a kind of chaotic element to them. You can tell that they're not following the Imperial creed, as it were. But at the same time, they still maintain a level of orderliness, as it were. It's not the same as when you're looking at the cultists. The cultists have a certain kind of feral, maddening kind of expression to them. Whereas this is more kind of, sinister professionalism almost it's uh, yes yeah it's, it's interesting visual. because their armor isn't quite cadian flak armor it actually weirdly reminds me of the black templars armor because you know how their torso plates are really smooth mm. um th- theirs is like that basically but obviously in human scale uh, obviously similar paint job as well which probably helps uh give it that uh look but it's, it's interesting that it's a distinct armor type from the Cajun sculpts, yeah. um, which I think is cool. Yeah, it's really nice. Um, yeah, as I said, everything's great. And then on the Phobos side of things, I actually really like um, the Infiltrator kit. I uh, had some reservations about the face mask. At first, the weird, I think I, or you, or someone at the time kind of compared it to fish-faced uh, kind of masks. Uh, um, maybe, yeah, it's it's like a, it's like the old uh, Mark Eight. Uh, also Mark Seven face grill, but mm. like even smaller, like a yes. teeny tiny version. Yeah, um, yeah. What's interesting though, and I, and again, I was going to say this is the uh, new kind of uh, mask variant of it. The ones that have got the, um, the 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 kind of half helmet where they've got like the uh, lower half of their Primaris helmet, and then the top half has been kind of removed. They seemingly have mistakenly put the regular Primaris helmet type over the the, the grill, as it were, the the, the mask, uh, the lower face mask yeah. area, uh, yeah. and not op- actually giving them the proper one. Because if you look at uh, Eliminators, the uh, Primaris sniper unit, they have those kind of respirator uh, face mask, uh, you know, um, grills. And those are in the style of the Phobos infiltrator okay. armor, and but just kind of smaller. Whereas this is more akin to, yeah, what a regular Primaris Marine without the top half of his uh, yeah, it's, helm would yeah, look it's like. the standard um, sort of intercessor. Was it Tacticus armor? I think it's called. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah that, this feels like a, a little bit of a boo boo. Um, because <laughs> e- either those were heads for uh, you know an upgrade for for regular mark armor, and they've just used it on the Phobos pattern as a mistake. Uh, I, I mean, that's all it can be, really. Surely, like it seems odd that they would have used the wrong type. I mean, um, one of the other telltale signs is they are the only mask types that they have that don't also feature the um, antenna, which is also a uh, aspect of uh, the Phobos helmet. So, you know, the, the, the Phobos helm will feature an additional Oh, even when the head's off. Uh, even when the head's off in most other instances. I mean, if you, you even look yes. at others. So the guy with the servo skull hasn't has got the antenna, even though he hasn't mm. even got anything. He's got the left-hand side of the mask um, mm. to go with his bionic eye. Mm. Um, and he's got what looks like the antenna there. Yeah. Yeah. So typically, I mean, that being said, though, they seem to have added some new sculpts uh, which have the right kind of helmet there that doesn't have it. So it's not a guaranteed thing that it's going to be there. I mean, obviously, there's a degree of flexibility. I will also say um, that the uh, Phobos Lieutenant 
from Shadow Spear that had this same grill, this same lower face mask. Uh, the, so the, the one that was covered one. in knives. Uh, no, no, no. It had the you know the the this style because um, there's two Phobos lieutenants. There's the one that's clearly inspired by the Reavers, and then there's the one that's more um, in line with the Incursors um, rather than this. Uh, yeah, because I guess Reavers have the skull mask. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so, so you saying he's with got? A knife that's yeah. The Reaver you're one. saying he's got the Phobos style? Um, no, he's got grill. the Tactica style. Grill. Tactica he's style. Got the, yeah, okay, he's got so there is precedent one. for it, I guess. Yeah, it's just an interesting mm. little thing. I don't know what. It's just odd the inconsistencies because you would have assumed that it would have been if they're all, you know, infiltrators, that it would have been similar to what has already been seen. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe you, could, you, you would have thought you could make the justification that if it's a whole helmet, it could have this weird um, sort of grill style. And then if not, they just use their default uh, Tactica style half helmet option. Uh, but as you said, if the snipers have the, the correct version of the, of the mini grill half helmet, then it is odd that these guys... Um, Unless, of course, they're the ones that are wrong. Oh, I mean, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's that's how it could be. Exactly. Um, it, it, one thing that seems a little odd with this upgrade set is it doesn't really feel like it's adding any new equipment or options to the kits. I mean, they talked about it on the stream about there being a medic, but it's like there already is a medic yes. in that kit, but the, yeah. are they just upgrading him to look more medic-y? And the rest I mean, just seems to be heads and servo skulls. And there doesn't seem to be any new weapon options or loadout I mean, the options. servo skull is obviously something that I'm guessing gives a certain level of opportunity. I mean, he's got a scanner, so it's almost like a, almost like a tech marine, I suppose, if you will. Mm, obviously not yeah. on the same scale as a tech marine. And I, I think he's going to be like a sort of scout ahead servo skull. And, you know, maybe he can remote control him to to spy on people hidden in cover or something yeah and they've also interestingly they've also gone for uh different kind of backpack uh or power pack upgrades so there's a guy with binoculars and a kind of um a scope that is similar to what the incursors have um not quite the same because theirs is a bit more blocky but uh he's got he's got binoculars and this um uh, this red kind of sensor array that's different from the usual comms array that the uh, yes. have. So there might yeah, be something yeah. to him. I assume they're going to do something with the smoke grenade. There's a guy with a massive purity seal, uh, and he actually he, he might just has be a, a bunch of knives. Or something. No, well, yeah, he's, he he's does, got a load yeah. of extra knives. So I imagine he's like their stabby stabby. May as well be in cursor fella. And obviously the commander guy there's got a new almost iron halo esque. Thing. So it's very minor, I, but there are. I like those little backpack upgrades because I do that a lot on all of my guys uh, mm. for my uh, squad leader when I do combat squads. Um, so I use that to denote uh, them. So so stuff like that I will love, and I would love to get hold of those uh, bits. Plus the servo skulls, I always love a servo skull. I always add one to every squad that I've got. So. I'll be trying to source those bits, but I actually <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of Phobos armor. Um, I've got some Reavers, and even then I'm hesitant to keep them because I prefer the other marks of armor, basically. So, yeah, I don't think I necessarily want this kit, uh, but I, I want some of the upgrades at least yeah, to use. I don't hate it, but I don't love it. It's it, it is what it is. It's you know it's a series of relatively meaningless upgrades to a squad that up until the release of the new Space Marine Codex in a few months' time, is, you know, so-so. Um, I think, you know, obviously there's every chance that they're going to do a rules PDF to update your infiltrators to maybe make them like this. And it could certainly be interesting to have a unit like the infiltrators have access to even greater levels of customization because, mm. as we all know, Space Marines definitely need more options in their troop section. Uh, it's a miracle they can make do with the uh, five or six variants they uh, they have currently. No, um, no. How many have they got these days? Tactical? 
Assault Intercessor, Intercessor, Infiltrator, Incursor, Heavy Intercessor. Yes, six uh, at the moment, unless I'm missing any. And in terms of non uh, primaris only, yeah, I think that's. Yeah, right. well, I think I did Tactical Squad as well in that one. Oh, aren't scouts? Or did they move? No, them? they moved to Elite. Oh, uh, okay, they did. Do you know, Scout them. only has one wound still. Well, it's because he's not a full Space Marine, so it makes yeah, it's sense. It's weird, isn't it? It's very mm. weird. Anyway, they are well rubbish these days. Um, the terrain is nice, though. Yeah, the, the terrain looks great. And I, it, it, basically, if it wasn't for the fact that it's Phobos armor, I'd actually be really tempted to buy the box because mm. uh, the upgrades for the Space Marines are great. Uh, the Traitor Guardsmen, I think, are wonderful conversion opportunities for like uh, oh, really Inquisitor good. Really stuff. Um, and actually, I really like the terrain. It's super thematic, and it's one of the rare cases where it's like great it's not ruins it's something interesting and it feels like they do stuff um what i find odd with this is that they've already released the terrain and that you can already buy them mm. whereas normally these are exclusives to the box set initially well that However, hasn't been true of the last couple because the last one was um Sector Mechanicus, yeah, sort of, of re- Sector Imperialis. Yeah, recycling old ones, but I mean, if we go back to the original Kill Team. The original uh, one, for sure. When they did it, um, that was all brand new stuff. Yeah, I, so fair point on that one. Um, however, uh, before we recorded, I was saying some words when I discovered just how much these kits sell for. Uh, so, how, how, how much you mean? What, the individual actual units uh the so the terrain is made up of three different kits that right, you can okay. buy separately so you've got the landing pads the landing pad own, right the landing pad you've then got the um the effectively like the radar and the antennae that's another thing so vox antenna and orspec shrine and then you've got the uh, frontierist hab bunker which is the big blocky building how much do you suspect all of that sells for? Well, to be on the ball, I just looked it all up. So I, I don't oh. want to. I know. I apologize. I didn't realize you were going to ask me how much it was all was. I, I did. I was looking it up. But yeah, it's quite pricey. It's it's basically around about £130 for the terrain alone. So mm. no matter how much this kit costs to buy the, the kill team, um, it, it's a it's technically a bargain because it will be worth it for the terrain alone because it, it, chances are it'll be even if it's 120 pounds and then it's discounted from um independent places to say 100 quid you you're already making a saving just on the terrain i didn't realize it was so expensive it's basically 50 quid 40 to 50 quid for one bit of terrain which is just madness is that is get, how get, expensive games workshop is. games workshop terrain is expensive but then oh, i know because you're only to going to honest, buy one of them is there is going to be their their argument ever so i think, I think all up. all terrain like i i've bought uh quite a lot of um the uh the battlefield in a box stuff and that's actually quite affordable to be fair that's not too uh over the original obscene. yes that that one's not too bad it is weird actually because terrain is the one thing that they don't produce in-house and they actually farm out to china so technically it should actually be the cheapest out of a lot like realistically mm. um but but obviously they've got like crazy markup markup on it and it's I mean, what, what's it, really interesting is like because this is the thing right if you want to get um the uh kill zone octarius which is the orc terrain which is wonderful terrain by the I've gone all in on that and bought a, a, a table's worth of Octarius because I was like, this is this is great. It, it's a, just a really nice functional kit that that can be cut, you know, many, many different ways. That box set is £67.50 by official Games Workshop prices. I was able to pick up um, a couple boxes at uh, £50 each. Um, and, and that felt like a really good deal. Uh, the uh, Kill zone Halanaf is sixty seven fifty as well. Um but yeah, but, you're right. This this box, if you buy it as just the terrain, is 135. But so. that so so I was looking at the individual prices is around about 130. 
but yeah, they actually sell it as a battle zone box, which is 135, which does include a playmat. Um, so you're paying an extra fiver for the playmat. Oh, thereabouts. I mean, I, I was just averaging out, but you're right, 135. So that's God, that's like double, tw- effectively, yeah, twice for ultimately the same size or amount the same function for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, arguably, you may be getting less. But the thing is, it's completely new. It's actually maybe a lot more interesting. I mean, does new justify double? No, because like, yeah, if they're Mm. sixty-seven fifty for the for for the old set. So bear in mind the old set, right? Like, it includes some pretty reasonable pieces that are quite hard to come by. Well, you can't get them, I think, by any other methods. Uh, Oh no, you can. But the Octarius one, the Octarius one is all new stuff. It's really good stuff. Yes, yeah, that was. And that's I, I, I think I think the reason maybe why that's cheap is because they did it originally as the the big kill team box, which was maybe like a bit of a loss leader type. Still though, uh, even though it would never been a loss leader, but it was it was the initial kit would have been like much more value for money in terms of what you're getting out of it. So. Yeah, I don't know. You're right. I, is a lot for this. Yeah, for that terrain. It, the thing is, it's also it feels like the least compatible kits and i mean that in terms of it doesn't really feel like you can kit bash it too much like or have different layouts it's like you've got walls which you can move around but otherwise you've got basically four blocks of buildings um that can't really interact with each other you can't really join them together to form bigger things i mean maybe you could put the radar uh sort of on the building on the landing pad to sort of make it a taller centerpiece. But like with all the walls and the ruins of either the Octarius or the Chownaf stuff, you can like put them next to each other and, or turn it into like a fortress or it feels like they're a lot more modular is what I'm trying to say. Whereas mm. uh, the Nakaman one seems the least modular out of the lot, but I would, you know, argue it is the best it's most interesting and it's certainly the most different from what we've seen before. It's just not ruins, which is great. It, it's think. remarkably similar to the old, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the set, but there was a kill zone or kill team zone with similar kind of scaled terrain. Uh, well, that was the riser ruins, um, yeah, yeah, which yeah. had a complete um, hab bunker as well, which this is effectively a, Kind of not a copy, but it's it's meant to be part of the similar kind of um, style. It's it's the STC hab bunkers, and they were um, the rise of ruins were effectively STC, you know, buildings as well. So they've got very similar visual look to them. With those, I think there was only one kill zone. I think the actual kill zone box was the only way you could buy the complete building. Every other version of it was ruins. So, mm. in at least in this one. Oh, and actually, to its credit, looking at the picture of the the full box where you buy it all, you get two versions of the bunkers, not just one. Now, actually, let's just double check. When you buy a bunker, if you get sorry, not bunker, hab block. I mean, so the fifty pound oh, hab block. Say- do you, I, I, I suspect it will be uh, just one. Yeah. I mean, that's okay. A so, lot. so actually, you, you technically the make getting a saving by buying the um, buying them as the kind of yeah. So you're getting two hand itself blocks, two instead of one for ultimately a similar price. But this is the thing, though, right? It's like it is games workshop terrain is expensive versus. Um, versus Everything. potentially some other options. Well, it yeah. depends. I don't know. I always find that it's funny. People often well, grumble about games virtual prices, but I think the whole industry is kind of unfortunately expensive. Yeah, it's niche, I... right? But it depends what you're doing. The fact is, is 3D printing exists, and that's just infinitely more, you know, uh, attractive for those who are obviously able to do it. Uh, for terrain purposes, I think. Yeah, uh, I there is. A, I can't remember the name of the company from the top of my head, which is probably for the best. They do effectively 
not quite knockoff, but very similar uh, ruin kits to the old Forge World style. You love like a good Gothic. knockoff uh, 3D printing company, Aethel. Oh, yeah, that's a story in and of itself. Um, do you want to well, talk about a, that, or do you never the, want to mention that? We, no, we can talk about it at another point in the outro. Um, oh, okay. but this wasn't. This isn't 3D printed. I believe that they hand sculpted it. Um, but the, for like one one ruin piece. Which is quite large, but it is just one piece, like an L shape or something. That's like fifty quid. So it is as expensive, uh, and a, but it's a big, big old resin block as opposed to plastic. So mm-hmm. uh, you are right, actually. A lot of competitors, with the exception of MDF and probably three D printing, can be and quite often are just as expensive because they are, you know, hand cast in resin and things like this. Um, and, and they're big chunky sort of work. items, you know. It's like this is the problem. It's again, look, I, I'm not being a games workshop apologist. I agree that this is expensive, but at the same time, it's one of those things that it's an unnecessary expense, right? Like you'd have to be, you'd have to be pretty into setting up and owning your own table to want to chuck that money at that particular oh, position. Yeah, I mean, let's You'd be have honest. to have a like, very specific project in mind if that's what you were going for. Because if that was, say, let's say that Battlezone box was 50 quid like the others, or let's yeah. say 60 quid or 67 quid like the others, I would probably buy that because I don't have a huge amount of space to game on. That's probably about enough that I could fit it on to a, my, my kitchen table and, and have a game on. And it's the most interesting terrain. So I would actually be, I think, you know, I could play some fun narrative games uh, or Kill Team or what have you. Yeah, I could do that. And, you know, 50 quid, that sounds justifiable. Yeah. Because even if it just sits in a box and never gets opened, it's, it's 50 quid, which, you know, I know it's there sort of thing. But for 135, I'm like, no, no chance. Um, Because it, 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 yeah, it just seems so expensive uh for what it is and if i'm paying that sort of price i definitely want to make sure i'm going to get some use out of it it's not a box to park to play someday yeah it's uh yeah. I'm, i've got to get it open crack it open get painting straight away or i'm mm. yeah gonna feel, feel the pinch on that one no i absolutely agree with you i think yeah it's just it's, yeah, it's pricey. but overall i mean again we don't know what the price point of that box is going to be but if it comes in at 115 pounds which has been the box price for nutkmund um i can't remember what the original kill team box was but i think it wasn't far off that 115 yeah pro- probably a, around around about that i would say so if it comes in at that kind of value then you know this is obviously going to be quite a good deal um i think there will be a lot of space marine players out there who'll be interested just because Space Marines, and I think the, the, the addition of the uh, the Guardsman is pretty cool. I haven't played Kill Team yet, neither of you, Phil, unless you know. No, you we, we keep t- talking about it. I think we've got to make it happen soon, I think. Exactly, and no, I totally agree with that. But here's the thing. I would assume that these uh, these Traitor Guardsmen are in for a bad day. <laughs> but uh, but who knows? Oh, well, you know, they do but... have, I, th- I think, the, the fact that they've got the Ogren, I think that's the, their one saving grace in terms there of... The power level, let's say, of the opposing sides. Um, again, so I, again, I'm sure it's. I'm sure in terms of game stuff, they've. Uh, they've it's all balanced. It's all balanced. Oh yeah, because sure you won't be running a full squad of space means for for starters anyway. I imagine. Well, indeed. The um, the other thing that they kind of just sort of uh, put out as part of the specialist game stuff, or in fact, actually, it wasn't even anything at all. It was just happening the same day as they showed off a new Dark Angel character. But I think oh. we've spoken about that already. A new Dark Angel character for uh, for Horus Heresy. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, that was all. That right. was Heresy Heresy Thursday, which is a nice one. Um, this is the uh, the Dreadwing fella. Um, so we won't worry about him too much. I like him. Uh, he looks pretty. I happen to have a uh, Dark Angel Heresy collection, uh, so he might become part of that. Um, additionally, we saw more squats, didn't we, Phil? Yes, we, this is an interesting one. So squats, but not for forty k. These are what is referred to as actual squats, not leagues of Votan. Uh, so this is for Ash, uh, Ash Waste. These are some of the nomads. Um, they've effectively split off from the the Votan apparently thousands of years ago. Um, 
So these are the iron head uh, squat prospectors. Uh, look a bit more in keeping with what maybe people imagine squats would look like, other than, you know, we've only seen two stuff for uh, the 40K uh, version. These are quite interesting. I mean, mm. my my one criticism is I wish the helmets were round rather than oval-shaped. Um, other than that, I would say these are great and would, would be perfect in my mind. Um, and the artwork for them has a much rounder helmet. If they match my artwork, I mean, yeah, they'd be great. I think, yeah, overall, I, I, I really like these. Um, I think it's interesting because up till now, I've only seen two things like everyone else and a bit of artwork for Leagues of Old Hand. Uh, I don't like it. Uh, you know, I, it's not that, well, don't like it. It's a bit strong. I'm underwhelmed by it. It just, I, you know, I just don't know how to feel about it at this stage. Whereas this, it seems all right. It seems like a, it seems like a good direction to take it. Feels, I, I like the look. Yeah, it feels much more like classic squats. There's a real like 80s sort of sci-fi mm. reference to them with like the visors on the helmets. Yeah. Um, like they've got proper like mining gear uh, and like the armor. It's very Caradron Overlords, which is sort of something I was like, yeah, that's probably what they would look like. So. Yeah, this yeah. lines up much more with my mental expectation of what squats would be and the fact they're calling them squats is like even better to an extent yeah. um yeah I, I i think it's an odd thing to do and it's either a stroke of genius or it's a bit of a mistake and a massive coincidence uh so if you remember when the Anne Ball came out for uh blackstone fortress and that mm. was done by the games workshop box team which is part of games workshop and then at the same time you had the ambot which was a robotic version like monster uh based on the amble design done by the ne for necromunda which was done by the forge world studio team and as far as i'm aware that was a complete coincidence that they came out around the same time. Mm. Uh, and they just so happened to both reference something from the law going back, you know, since Rogue Trader edition. Mm. And I wonder if that is the case of this, because it is very weird mixed messages to go, here is Leagues of Votan. This is our reimagining of what squat should be. And then at the same time, Necromunda comes out with a completely different thing and go, but this is our version of squats and what they should now be. I mean, that's super confusing and it already has shown itself to be the case because they, after this, they've done a reveal for the, the big kind of mech unit for the Necromunda squats, which is like their version of exosuit armor, which is like a, a big boy. Mm. Uh, and a lot of people looked at that and thought it was for 40k but it's not because it's the Necromunda version of squats. So very weird mixed messages. Uh, and I can't tell if it is a complete coincidence that they designed them independently and just so happen to both be releasing squats at the same time. Or it's a stroke of genius because if you don't like one of them, you, you've got another one. So if you don't like the Leagues of Votan because they're going in a kind of completely brand new direction, you can like the more classic style squats of necromunda mm. and it will be because technically i mean it'd be interesting to see if the two design teams who famous for working in silos and not really talking to each other if they actually both discussed like we're going to do squats right uh we're going to do a splinter of squats and you're going to do like the main leagues of votan but we're going to both have visual nods to the hereditary because uh, they both technically came from the same race thousands of years ago. So are they going to have these visual similarities that tie Necromunda squats to Leagues of Votan? Or are they not, which is what I suspect might be the case, in which case they were completely like just two completely different projects and not actually interlinked whatsoever. And obviously, yes, they've said here that, oh, yes, they split off from Leagues of Votan as a way of sort of justifying it. Of course, they would have to say something, right? They can't just say, ooh, we did an oopsie and we both designed squats at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I do actually really like the uh, the new squat big boy. I, I, it's There's something about it. It's got a very kind of 
eighties, early nineties uh, cartoon, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Bucky O'Hare type vibe. To it. <laughs> uh, it reminded yeah. me of uh, the uh, the Toad Air Marshal from uh, from Bucky O'Hare. Uh, it's got a very kind of uh, similar kind of uh, stature to it. I could imagine, uh, you know, this not looking out of place in my collection of action figures from that uh, from that period. But uh, no, I, I like it, and I like I like these new squat minis that they've they've done. I like these a lot more than what I've seen from leagues. Um, I think league doesn't quite, you know, communicate some of the more kind of grim, dark, almost kind of. Um, I don't know. They, they they just seem a little bit too high sci-fi, whereas this still kind of manages to yeah to, and to exude some of the oddities and some of the the the, the kind of griminess of, uh, of of what you would imagine. And and, and, and that might be the intention because they've said leagues of Votan are using the old SDC technology, so they have this high you know eighty sci-fi kind of look to them. Whereas mm. these Necromunda squats have been working and trading with the Imperium for thousands of years, so they've adopted a lot more of the Imperium's technology. Mm. Um, but then that isn't necessarily the case because if you look at all their guns, yeah, they don't look anything like the Imperium stuff either. So, yeah, no, I think also with this, we've seen a whole unit, right? We've seen uh, a whole unit, some artwork, and then they've also, uh, you know, as we've just talked about, released a, a new bigger model. And all we've really seen is one model uh, from a, a standard unit of the Leagues of Votan plus the biker, which is very Marmite for a lot of people. Um, so if they had also released a whole unit of uh, the, the Leagues of Votan, maybe we would similarly be excited. Because I did like that mini, like the infantry guy I thought looked really cool. Um, yeah, uh, but the trike didn't do it for me at all. So, but these guys, these are these are very promising, and they they do have lots of nods and winks back to the original um, minis that I haven't quite seen as much. Other than they've gone, well, we've just reimagined a trike. Um, but I other like than that, the, there's uh, nothing really visual that's. Similar. I like the guns that I see here way more than the League of Votan ones. Well, this is all, yeah, d double barreled guns or a triple barreled. Yeah, um, like, yeah. Oh, no, it's all double barreled, actually. I think the, even the stubbers sort of like double barreled. Yeah. So they've, they've doubled up on everything, which is a cool, like, visual t way of making them just obviously look different from the Imperial. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Um, it's just the just... way that they're kind of encased in these really kind of functional kind of stubby yeah uh, it, it's and it's it... like old like the heavy weapons guy he's got the armor that you sort of not armor, like, almost like a suit like an astronaut when they've got to go into space or they've got a you know when you stick your arms into a, a biohazard lab you've got i mean weird... i haven't done it personally but, no, I mean, but you've, I, I... you've seen on movies and stuff i've they, seen the they movies stick their yeah. arms in and they're in these big chunky ribbed um black yeah. plastic things so on old got... uh old crystal maze games you remember where they yes. used to have to yeah. work the sticks yeah so don't so, fall yeah. into the infinite vacuum of space <laughs> funny i had an accordion on me and uh, not an accordion what did he play the um harmonica the... harmonica that's the word i couldn't find thank you yeah yeah. Um, but yeah, these these guys are really cool, and I, I suspect if you want squats and you don't like leagues of Votan, you'll just buy these and convert them up. And you know they were pains to say there are no rules for this in 40k. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see how people kit bash or take these off, or how popular these ones will be versus leagues of Votan. Um, I don't yeah. like squat. I, sorry, I don't want squats, and I don't like leagues of Votan. But I'm glad that these exist. These are good. It shows that. Someone over there knows what they're doing. Um, just unfortunately, they happen to be sat in the wrong chair. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, there you go. Oh, well, again, I say that. That's based on two initial sculpts. From me. I am reserving the right to become excited by them at a later date. It just hasn't happened yet. Um, yeah, well, Horace Heresy. Yeah. Do we so... want to talk about everything that went on over the weekend that was with Horace Heresy? Do we even have an opinion on that? I noticed that a handful of influencers needlessly bombarded me with selfies, um, and that didn't really do much to excite me. Um, but I kind of feel like Games Workshop didn't give them much to do, or if they did, they didn't know what they were doing. 
Uh, the models are nice. I like that Games Workshop have just done an article that makes up why everyone can have Mark VI. But before we get into all that, I should probably ask Phil, what was his vibe on all the, the influencers and things doing their thing? I think some were great. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was a bit of an odd one because obviously they built it up to be, yeah, there's going to be all these influencers at the event and, it, you know, you can do a meet and greet with them if you were there. You know, let's, I'll, I'll, I'll state now. Ne- neither neither of us were there so we were just uh living is that a dig phil are we are we are we exhibiting sour grapes is that what oh sorry i don't mean there as influencers i just mean neither of us bought tickets to even like go Do you consider us influencers i've never thought of myself that way in this context because i don't think we're big enough i think no, you know I, it's fair I, to I, assert that people i suppose out there maybe not you specifically the person listening to this but maybe you specifically the other person listening to this maybe one of you, out of the many that listen, consider us as an influential thing. I heard that uh, some people went to the RFW event off the back of us saying it was good. So I suppose we do wield some influence, but at the same time, I don't really look at us that way. I like to think that we're keeping it real, Phil. Phil? Phew, you know what I'm saying. We're keeping yes. it real. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, a couple of people did say, oh, were you going to be at the, the weekends uh, oh, that's as, nice. as an influencer? And I was like, no, we're not no, that influential. No. Um, no, we're not I, those people. Ex- exactly, we're not. Um, would we want to be, Phil? Would we? I suppose we would. I, I. This is the thing. I throw shade. I'd be on those selfies straight away. You know, I'll be there. Oh yeah. Well, but Finger there was guns. definitely a, a mix of people that were there taking a lot of selfies, uh, <laughs> and there were there were a lot of influencers there taking no selfies. So Ash Barker from Guerrilla Miniature Wargaming. Uh, from America, he sort of rocked up and no one really even knew he was there. I mean, in terms of the old Instagram feed or what have you, uh, he did yeah, like yeah. one or two posts to say he he was there when he was finally there. But, you know, we weren't eating, sorry, we weren't seeing him eat his lunch every day or anything yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. like that. So some people, you know, just were there and just, you know, in the moment. But that's say. what they do though, right? Like that's their content, out of their stream. And I can't, Again, I never want to necessarily come across like I'm being unfair. I think the thing is, is that, again, I, I just try to work out what the plan was for him. It just seems like Games Workshop were like, we should have influencers go to this thing. Cool. What are they going to do? Meet, meet and greets? Break yeah, NDAs? From, um. Well, yeah. So that's worth talking about as well. So it, it, it sounded like the influencers that were there on the Saturday event didn't really have anything to do beyond the meet and greet. Uh, they obviously can't talk about anything that they've done or seen. Uh, and it sounds like they've done a lot of promo work that will be coming out at a later date yeah, uh, that enough. they will be able to talk about. But uh, sort of, you know, someone sat at home watching both the Warhammer Fest and then seeing stuff happening on Instagram. It seems like they didn't actually add anything to the conversation or to uh, is part of the reveals. And I I mean, the only interesting thing that we did get to see was uh, some photos from the cabinets where all the influencers had painted up the minis uh, in different marks of armor. Some painted up the Horus Heresy army, some painted up Primarchs, um, which was cool to see, but odd that they haven't done a social post showing off those models. Uh, although I think in the Imperial Fist one, they actually showed off the SM Battle Reports uh legion that they had painted up so that's cool that they got their shown off but they could have done something like that on the saturday as part of the reveals to be like here's a load of cool photos um yeah because it feels like a massive whiff to have had those guys there and not to have created a full schedule of programming content to make it really exciting it's like we could have had interviews with the guys talking about how they approach painting their army how, you know, like little, little, uh, you know, tidbits, little videos of, hey, I'm so and so, and this is my world eaters. This is how I approached it. This is how I did it. You know, and this is it. Really exciting for Horace Heresy for X, Y, Z reason. Boosh. And then maybe do like developer interviews, talk more about systems. Because I think that's the thing that was lacking, right? I mean, in terms of what was revealed, everyone out there, I assume, listening to this knows what was revealed. We saw the contents of the box set, which we'd all seen a year ago or whenever it leaked. Uh, they told us that they're doing new plastic rhinos, new plastic 
um, may as well be a Sakaran, but a bigger Sakaran. Uh, the Kratos, uh, which was the thing that w- the big thing that was leaked on the Friday, which we'd talk about in a minute. I oh, was that Squig? Uh, no. no, that was um, Mani- M- no, Miniac. Miniac, that's who's his a, name, yes. A uh, painter on YouTube. Well, Squig uh, Bar there, Squig Bar. He's quite good, isn't he? I quite enjoy his diorama videos at the moment. I don't know. I like his transitions, how he does the video transition where he goes like swoosh with his hand and then the camera moves and it's all mm. very cool. Mm. He's a good, he's all right, his old Squig Bar. But I don't really know Mimi, 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 Mimi. What was it again? Miniac. Uh, I think it's Miniac. Yeah. Miniac. I don't know Miniac too well. Uh, so I think I've seen some of his stuff. Doesn't he paint stuff? I assume. Yes. He he's a painter, and he I think he does a podcast. Paint on plastic. I think, I think that's I've what watched it's a couple of vids of his. Yeah. It's got like a really like. I'm just looking at his stuff now, actually, right now. Here we are. Yes. No. I I know this guy. Yes. So he got in trouble, didn't he? he leaked a bunch of stuff. Uh. Yeah. So apparently, when accidentally, did he... he did a Instagram story. Uh. I believe. Uh. That. Uh. He then deleted, but it had automatically been shared to Facebook that he forgot to delete. So obviously, a bunch of people screenshot it and spread it around. Uh, uh-huh. So he got asked to leave, and he had his sort of NDA whole agreement. Um. With Games Workshop terminated, and basically had to had to leave straight away which is mm. sad but also understandable because you just broken the nda and leaked the biggest reveal of the event uh because that was a really cool mini to see and but somewhat put a bit of a sour note on it because i was like oh I've, I, I, saw, I saw a picture of this yesterday that's taken the shine off of the event because it's like i didn't really want to see any spoilers uh, for that event, but but unfortunately, saw a couple. You know, influencers aside, I think the release looks cool. I think it's interesting that Games Workshop have just put out a statement or an article today justifying Mark VI as a viable option for everything. It's like, <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> yeah, well, it, prior to uh, Warhammer Fest, when they it actually. Um you know people were obviously talking about the box set and stuff and had seen some photos of it and stuff um but basically there from what i gather there was a bit of a hoo-ha from advocates of the law uh that they had already said that mark six wasn't really available for every legion that a lot of armor marks are somewhat more faction specific and i you know it's one of those things where yeah some every legion might have an amount of each mark of armor so yes sons of horus who traditionally wouldn't have mark six still might have some and you could be representing that force um but it's that thing of apparently a lot of that armor got diverted to uh things like people like raven god and uh, most of the loyalist chapters because horus wanted some of the older marks which were seen to be um uh, better for want of a better word uh, from that that's my vague understanding of it um so lots of people were like well they wouldn't have had this mark of armor it shouldn't be for everyone um and it's uh that thing of people treat horus heresy as a bit more of a historical game not just a fantasy game so mm. they want to dig into the law and find uh you know make things as law accurate as possible uh which they wouldn't necessarily do with 40k although i do that i did my deep dive into minor tools to find out you know you know what every kind of company should look like or um you know how the markings on the armor should work and stuff so you can do that to an extent but it's, it's a bit more difficult and but funnily enough that does relate to a forge world one which is what horus heresy is as well so i can understand people wanting to do that and then yeah because it's a box set that games workshop wants to sell they've effectively retconned it to justify everyone's got Mark Six armor or can have it uh, because this is going to be the new kit to buy if you want to get into Horus Heresy. I mean, it, again, it speaks to the, and it's a consistent situation that we've seen exhibited all the time in this uh, you know, business end of the hobby, as it were, that Games Workshop, the business, often demonstrates that they don't often care that much about 
the details of their world if it gets in the way of selling more kits. If they perceive that people won't be buying these Mark VI kits because years and years, I mean, we're getting close to 20 years of Horace Heresy novels have essentially outlined that, uh, you know, these marks of armors were worn by these legions in greater abundance. And there's a lot of, you know, actual documentation and fluff that has kind of created that prefaced that games, which have obviously come along and go, yeah, but we've done a new kit of Mark six and this is going to be the thing. So turns out retcon and it's like, Oh, okay, cool. Just moving the goalposts because you've got a new thing to sell. But again, I'm going to be intrigued to see how the kind of Horus Heresy purists kind of take to it. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, people who join Heresy in the year 2022 start being referred to as like 22ers uh, by the... The, uh, the beakies. Yeah, um, by, the, by the hardcore kind of community that's been with it for years. Yeah, I, I think there's... Um some people that might be seen as snobs for wanting to follow what they perceive as like the law and canon mm-hmm. of the, the armors and the preference for our, uh, certain marks of armor by certain legions. And then there are other people that be like, just do whatever you want. Like it's just a game, right? Like, yeah. uh, but I think most people can agree is so long as it's not primaris, you, you're good to go. Uh, but even then, I, I I've seen it was a White Dwarf article maybe a year or so ago where someone did a Horus Heresy army using Primaris minis. So, you know, and that managed to get into White Dwarf. So, some people will love that and be like, "Cool, do what you want. It's your 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 models, your army." But other people, as purists, might absolutely hate that. Um, mm. I'm not necessarily sure as a right or wrong. Maybe, I think as long as you made a bit of effort to make it look a bit more Heresy, then it's fine. Um, I think that's been overly exemplified by the two new captain slash Praetorians or whatever they're called, the, the new leaders that they've added to the box set. I mean, they're such a diversion or such a diversion, sorry, from anything. From, from anything. It's like, I, this is mad, but we've already extensively spoken about these kits, so I'm not going to tread yeah, over that. Again. In, in very, summary, very they look like Age of Sigma Stormcast. Yeah, very um, odd. Really odd. Love the Contemptor. Love the Contemptor. Well, here's the thing. That Contemptor is exactly the, well, with the exception of the missile launchers, the resin version made manifest in plastic. <laughs> Pretty much the exact, and because I've been painting up my two Contemptors. Uh, spoilers, if we've not talked about it already, I got them painted in time for the RFW2 well done, well event. Done. Um and yeah, because there was even one bit on the the notch on the hip armor. I was like, oh, that, that they've added that in. That bit's new. But then I double checked, and it's like, no, they've just edge highlighted it to make it more uh, pronounced. But even that still exists. Um, the only real change is the cyclo missile launcher on top. That that is a completely new design. Everything else, uh, actually, the weapon types as well differ ever ever so slightly. So when they did a contempt of specific post. Uh, so the auto cannons, las cannons, and uh, multi melters have some ever so slightly divergent detail, um, but the actual body of the contempt is exactly the same, from what I can tell. It'll be interesting to see, and they haven't talked about it, and no one at the weekend has talked about it. Like, how do the sprues look? How does it build? Can you magnetize it in the same way as? The resin ones, I assume so, because currently on Forge World, you can't buy any of the weapon upgrades, uh, but you can still buy the Legion specific bodies. So mm. I assume what you will have to do in future is buy a plastic contemptor, ignore the body, and buy the resin upgrade and use the plastic um plastic weapons i assume that's that all the uh, plastic contemptor comes with extra arms i mean could you imagine a situation where you know games workshop actually give you a kit that you can build a few different weapon variants and just magnetize i mean imagine that Ooh, yeah maybe maybe it depends I mean, on it how many happened. how many of the socket options they they give you basically with those yeah. uh weapon options uh whether you can then transpose them or if you'll be effectively missing one key nubbin 
and because of that you can't use it anywhere else but you could probably kit bash that bit maybe out of a bit of plastic card yeah, and, yeah. And, and and make it work um or 3d print it yes i guess so what what was interesting <laughs> so what one of the mo- one of the best looking contemptors on the day was um by colt's colt colt of paints, Cult of paints. Yep. um and I was like, "Oh, that theirs looks beautiful." And then yeah, post yeah. It's Warhammer kind of the, Fest, their thing. Yeah, but post Warhammer Fest, they actually released a tutorial of how to paint it, and it turns out that's actually a resin kit that they've had for years, uh, just lying around. And the guy was like, "Oh, I finally use this as an excuse to paint it up." So their one isn't even the plastic one that gave him the kit. There was just one that they already had. Well, fair enough. Either way, though, beautiful. Oh yeah, <laughs> um, no, hundred no, percent, absolutely stunning. Spartan's nice as well, but it's a Spartan. I mean, what do you want me to tell you? It's a Land Raider. It, it's it's well nice. Uh, yeah, the, the the thing to note that people are going not mad for, but just mentioning is the the guy in the top, uh, the gunner or the uh, uh, you know holding a little iPad uh, is plastic Crusade Mark II armor, which is the first of its kind. And I think when they previewed. Have they previewed the Rhino? I think they previewed the Rhino post they this have, event. Yes, as and again, the, no, they the same time. Uh, and again, he has uh, he's in Mark II Crusade armor, so that seems to be a thing. Um, as the only way of getting plastic Crusade armor at the moment is the little guys in the transports. Mm. No, the transports though, the new Rhino, which is the old Rhino, looks awesome. The new um, Kratos looks awesome. It, it's it's all really good. It's good stuff. I think the weekend and the content that came out of it could have been a little bit richer, a little bit fuller, a little bit more accessible. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, they've done what they've done. Um, and I think they'll take some learnings away from it. But overall, I'm broadly excited for Horus Heresy. I think I'm going to buy the box set, but I'm definitely not having anything to do with the characters, nor am I going to potentially be interested in having uh, all of those Mark VI. I think I'll probably just take 20 of those Mark VI's and have those, and then the remaining 10 and the two characters will go onto eBay or just be handed to one of well, my friends. So, so here's the thing. You get 40 uh, of the Mark VI guys, which is a lot oh, okay. of Okay, then 20 alters. of them will go away. But... But what they announce at the same time is they do weapon upgrades. So you effectively use those bodies and swap out the arms for the heavy mm. weapon teams. And the heavy weapon teams are interesting because you buy them in in a box with like 50 weapons in at a time uh, for like specialist weapons and stuff like that. And you get... I, I'd be interested to see how much they're going to cost because you get so much in there. It's only really value for money if you're effectively building like all of them, uh, unless they're dirt cheap, of course. Or mm. you some if you go, I want like twenty bolters, so twenty um, missile launchers. I get ten in this kit. Uh, my mate's also buying a kit, and I'm going to do swapsies if I want to, for some reason, just go all in on one type of specialist or heavy weapon. Um, the, there was one thing that they they did where they someone in the in the chat, I'm talking about the live stream here, asked if they're compatible with the old marks of armor, so the the three and four marks, and, th- and they didn't know, which I thought was a bit disappointing. And they said, "Oh yes, we will, we will mention it, and we 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 do an update on the Warhammer community articles in the future." And as far as far as I'm aware, they still haven't. And like that's a bit of an own goal. Like, sure, like if they're not uh, compatible, I, I give the impression they will be with a bit of work. But it's like the fact that they couldn't even say when they're announcing the models. It's like well, that's a bit weird, right? And if they haven't been designed to be compatible, why not? <laughs> yeah, it would be a bit of an own goal. But then at the same point, those kits, those old. Um, those old Mark of Armor kits already have heavy weapons on sprue. They already have special weapons. True. I guess you're not going to get just quite all the weapon options. Like, yeah, I think they come with like a missile launcher, but you know, missile you're not launcher get... or heavy bolter. Yeah. Yeah, but you're not going to get um, any of the others. I'm just going back to the post to see. It doesn't seem like they say um, what it is, but 
for example, yeah, if you buy the specialist weapon upgrade kit, it comes with 60 weapons. Mm -hmm. 60, which is a ton. It's like 10 of each, obviously. So you've got lots of uh, diversity, but you're just going to end up with an, a massive amount of spare bits, which could be cool. Which could be cool. Um, yeah. As long as it's reasonably I, priced is my thing. Well, I mean, yeah, TBD on that front, isn't it? But Because um... if you say, oh, I want one squad of 10 plasma guys and I've got to spend 60 quid to do that and you go, I don't want all the other specialist weapons because I don't need them, I just want those 10. That Yeah, that will that'll pinch quite a bit if it's... I mean, but who knows how much actually it's going to cost. Yeah, I think... Um... Fortunately for me, I already amassed uh, enough plasma guns to build my uh, support squad uh, of, uh, of Mark III um, or Mark IV, potentially. Either way, I'm going to um, definitely have a squad of those in the mix. But yeah, I, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Horus Heresy is one of those things that I'm like, I'm interested. I already own a bunch of it. So... We'll see what comes around the corner on it. I think right now uh, I'm not, you know, clawing at the walls to own it, but I will definitely. I think the box set's going to just be, uh, sub 200 pounds. It's just going to be too much of a value proposition to turn down. I don't want all of it, but I want the Terminators. I want the Spartan. I want the, I want the Terminators. I want the, the Terminators, most yeah. outdated looking models in the whole set. Want the Terminators for them? No, I, well, this is one thing that puts me off um, Horus Heresy to an extent. Is even though they're relatively new kits, the Cataphracta and Tartarus Terminators are dinky in comparison to even the, even the then made Space Marines, um, let alone the new ones, which are slightly bigger. Um, so yeah, I mean that sort of thing. Uh, puts me off slightly. Uh, I guess it's too much to ask that they re had redesigned the Terminators, or you know, if they wanted to do a really amazing release, if they had redone the According Terminators. To you. I mean, okay, let's be fair. That was the best reveals of the the week. Horus Heresy, 100%. phenomenal. Really loved it. Shame Kratos got leaked, but even so, great, uh, great day of reveals. It was mind blowing that they, with the amount that they had, um, the specialist games on Necromunda, uh, sort of forty k ish stuff like Kill Team, also felt like way more interesting than the actual forty k day, um, just because of the sort of the type of content and it was. Both of those were great. However, to, to have really knocked it out of the park for Horus Heresy. And this is complete wish listing. It would never happen because they're never going to redo relatively new sculpts. But if they had gone, here is Mark III, four and six armor all redone, and ideally both patterns of Terminator armor, like there, there could be no complaints. Everything is 100% compatible with each other. The scale is now going to be consistent across the board. People won't have to worry about scale creep and stuff like that. Like, that is how you and then people can pick and choose the armor they want it's like yeah mark six is only for loyalists but here's your loyalist box set and if you want you know to get a mark three box set we're doing that as well like they could have done that and there would effectively be no quibbles or complaints at all because it'd be impossible to however that is almost impossible that would never happen even though i don't actually think it's too unrealistic or too difficult for of them to have produced Mark three and Mark four armor again, like it's not outside the realms of possibility. Like it shouldn't have been that difficult, I would say, uh, considering the resources that the company could, in theory, but probably don't have. I think this is the thing, though, mate. I think at the end of the day, you've you know, you've got an existing range. You're adding stuff to it. Um, I want the Terminators. I know you're not a fan of the scale of them, or blah blah blah, but I want them anyway because they're the Terminators. Oh, they, they, they still look great, but I think yeah, yeah. On on in isolation on their own, they look amazing. When you see them next to other minis, I'm just a bit lackluster. Yeah, no, I understand that, but within the confines of Horus Heresy, I think they're fine. Um, and uh, yeah, so I want the Terminators. I want the Contemptor. I want twenty of the Beakies. Uh, everything else can go. Uh, and I want the rules and. That's it, you know. It's like you I want the Spartan and the Contemptor. Yeah, yeah, I said that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right, so I think yeah. you know. I mean, Spartan's going to be what, like a eighty quid kit when it's on oh, its own, probably. Yeah. And then 
the contemptor will be 40, 35, 40. So there's that. So that's 120 quid there. The the the, the 20 uh, beakies will be, you know, best part of 50 quid or something. And then the Terminator is the same. 10 Terminators will be 50 or quid. So at that point, I get the rules, get the whippy sticks. They bought those back. You see that? Yeah. Yeah, and and templates and stuff. Um, yeah, in in terms of the rules, this is one again from the model point of view. What they showed, amazing. I kind of wish they would talk about the rules a little bit. Oh uh, god, yeah. And that is the one thing. And they've been previewing rules. And but no horror... one understands what any of it well, means. If you're a horror yeah. society player, you will do. If you played Seventh Ed, you can vaguely remember what some of it remain, uh, means. So that's fine. But if you're a new player, which is what they're advertising to, they're previewing rules that make no sense to any of those people. And they haven't really gone, yes, they haven't given like a little primer as to what the rules are. They haven't done one of those really cool videos um where they explain what the rules are which would at least give people context for these previews i think that's one thing that that reveal show missed is just talking about what the what the rules are like i'm also terrified that they're going to make the game a 60 by 44 as in five foot 44 inch board i mean why wouldn't they because they've done that with every other game system because you like your six by fours it's not that I like it. It's that the mm, if it's seventh edition, if it's broadly seventh edition, the game is dare I say that the heresy of, of all it makes sense on six by four. You need the extra area to control ranges and uh, well, well, here's they're never going to muck it all up by making all the ranges ridiculously long. I don't uh, understand what it is about the philosophy of. Thing, everything being in range all the time and current 40k is like so stupid uh, what's interesting is so this box set is one of a few i mean some do but like there's no terrain in it right is that weird that there's no horus heresy specific terrain uh and also if you look at the two armies the imperial fists will win that any day of the week you've got a spartan with eight to was it up to ten las cannons it can have going up against a contemptor. It's like, well, I know which one's going to live turn one and which one won't. Um, the Terminators it, will mulch the. Uh, yeah, it, it just feels like a completely unbalanced army list. It's not intended to be balanced armies, Phil. Well, no, no one's really splitting that. People are just going to buy it and have it. Depends it depends what the missions are as well, though. Sometimes the they do a good job with the missions where they make the missions. Offer some balancing mechanics, like the 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 um, the the sons of Horus could be more, you know, raid orientated or something. Anyway, we've spoken enough about this. I think I think we're 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 pretty good on that. Look, we're not Horus Heresy podcast, but uh, but that's Horus Heresy in a nutshell. Looks good. Um, the you know influence a bit was funny. Uh, and yeah, I think the event was a bit of an own goal in some regards. I think it was a bit of a missed opportunity more accurately. Yeah, I, um, I think the the live stream was fantastic uh, in terms of... In the, the way reveals. that it always is. Yeah. It just was nothing special. But I think in terms of how it was presented, either for, from what I've heard from people that went there or the people like us that watched along from home uh, v- via people's Instagrams and stuff... I think that was the the bit of the thing that was most disappointing. It didn't really seem like much else was happening. And if you were there, it didn't seem like much else was happening beyond, uh, you know, looking at models in a cabinet, speaking to influencers during the meet and greet or painting a mini and getting to take it home with you where apparently lots of people stole a bunch. Well, they didn't steal a bunch. They were given a bunch. Oh, well, no, I think that you're meant to like paint one and take it home. And then some people just kept going back and got a bunch. Yes, they got given them. Mm, it, it did. Well, I, I li- listened to the uh, I've Horus podcast and that's where I heard it from. It sounded much more like it was theft rather than being given oh. Uh, oh. from the way they described it. Uh, but the, but one the thing, of those though, guys if you, actually. If you've went... not got, like, if you've not got. It would have been very easy for Games Workshop to have introduced like a drink token style mechanic where they went, redeem your token, get your mini, you know, 
would have been a really straightforward thing. But again, it's logistics and things that they probably didn't enjoy. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounded like lots of people went there. After a while, there wasn't much to do, so you milled around and drank in Bugman's. It might have been better to have maybe made it more like a timed ticketed event. So yeah, you go for two hours and then you get turfed out and then they could have had a lot more people go to the event over the course of the day. That would but, have been nice, yeah. But then if people are traveling up would you want to go just for two hours or is it more like i'm going up but i'm going for the whole day so therefore it's, it makes the travel work so it's the risk that you don't you don't sell out all the slots so say if you break it down into four well they, into they, slots. they sold out in like minutes if if less than that so i don't think that would be a problem but maybe yeah, they just don't that, want to run you don't know that, that. Risk. Like when you're trying to organize these things you, you don't know what's going to happen right so you can't bank on that running smoothly well that is true but anyway horace heresy fun 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 uh phil do you want to round things out by talking about someone ripping off your uh, designs with 3d printing or do you want to save that for another day no oh, no we can we can talk about it now um so i was ripping off phil everybody we, yeah we, so, we assume we don't know well we have to speak in that kind of way so i I can uh, basically someone let me know about post on facebook uh regarding uh, a cult's uh 3d print page where a guy had copied my internal sponsor and we assume uh, design uh and my cover plate designs that go on top uh all four of them just coincidentally happen to be exactly the same as mine oh down to the construction of how they all fit together and work as well. That is uh, a strange coincidence, I would say. Yeah, so I, I mean, I reported the page to to Colts because there's a little thing that you can do and basically like, I'm the owner of this copyright. Uh, and the page got actually taken down really quickly. So I thought that was quite good of them. Uh, and then I, I got emailed by, by today by a friend of the, the person in question. Um, basically, it's, it's, feigning ignorance that it was my design uh, and was wondering if I could support him in some way and come to some kind of compromise. I feel like you have come to the compromise, surely. Well, yes, I said I'm totally willing to support independent creators, um, but you need to come up with a kind of unique design that isn't based off of someone else's hard work. And likewise, he should also support independent creators. And if he wants one of my kits, you should buy it from me rather than just replicating it. Um, I, I said something to... Isn't that, that though, I mean, given that you're building something that is an accessory for Games Workshop stuff, though, isn't this you, you know, isn't this isn't this fair game given what you're doing? No, because what I'm doing <clears throat> is equivalent to creating a custom case for uh, like an Apple phone, right? Mm. I'm not copying the phone itself. I'm not copying yeah, the design of the phone. Uh, imagine I created some kind of amazing phone case with googly eyes and then someone else sees my design it, <laughs> and d- does just that. It's like, well, you've copied my design. Like what this person has done, unfortunately, has copied my design even you know said as much basically said oh i saw oh, they this actually admitted it okay. well they said that i saw it at a competition and then i looked it up online and, uh, then I, and, then I... and effectively it is a, a straight copy because it would be impossible to uh come up with you know in parallel uh not having seen my stuff at all for it to be a coincidence um because i mean like literally you can pretty much see that they are the same Oh yeah, if you do a side by side comparison, it's exactly it's the same. same. Yeah, okay. uh, it's not. Well, an, I mean, it's not an internal sponsor concept, but with a completely unique design to it. It is just, just lifting my design, which well, is which is quite upsetting for me because it's like well, I'm I'm trying to make a living out of trying to do this, so it's. Uh, I mean, it's not a good good thing to happen to anyone, really. No, and I and I sympathise with that, and I hope you understand that I was merely playing devil's advocate when I was. Uh... No, I, I I completely get that, and I feel like three D printing is the wild west of the uh, copyright law to, for a lot mm. of people, and harks back to the days of like LimeWire and stuff, where everyone was like, "I'm getting movies and music for free. It, I, I shouldn't have to pay for this. Why should I? It should all be for free because that's what the internet's about." And it feels like for a lot of people 
that is what 3D printing means, or it means I've seen a design and I have created it myself in 3D, you know, in a CAD program. Therefore, it is my design. And sadly, that's not how copyright works. If you've copied someone else's design, that design still belongs to that original design because they put the hard work into it. And it's like, mm. I'd, I've always been very... If I, if I was making Space Marine heads, but I, uh, you know, was putting the Minotaur chapter symbol on the helmet, for example, that's not really my design, is it? Like, oh, yeah, no, I've no. done it, but the Space Marine helmet design isn't mine. That's a copy of the Games Workshop one, and the Minotaur symbol is still theirs. It's a derivative of theirs, basically. Mm. If I came up with a completely new helmet design, that look nothing like a space means that it could work on any kind of head it could be a storm like trooper. those minotaur kind of spartan helmets that people have used for example to use your mind yeah space like that's for example in that case yeah that's a completely new design it's not based on anything done by games workshop or yeah, anyone yeah. else and i i'm very careful about when i'm doing stuff i make i make it compatible with games workshop stuff but i'm not doing anything that is a design of theirs that I'm mm. just replicating because I, I don't want to effectively be like a knockoff merchant. Like I want to create my own stuff. I want to, you know, aesthetically s similar enough that it can, it can, it can match in with the model and not look um, out of place. But at the same time, it still has to be completely unique at, at the same time as well. So that's a sort of fine balancing act uh, to do. There you go. Mate, look, you know, I mean, obviously, yeah, sucks to hear on that side of things. I mean, and again, in our own little way or your own little way, experiencing a micro microcosm of, I guess, what is happening to a lot of creators and, uh, you know, Games Workshop specifically. Right? Well, exactly. I mean, I think a lot of people justify doing it to Games Workshop because they're like a big monolith corporation that makes billions of pound profits every year. It's like, well, well I don't make that much money. So it, it hits me a bit harder in terms of that respect. But I don't think people should be doing it to Games Workshop either. In, uh, no, in I agree with that, that, that respect either. Like, I don't believe in recasting or anything like that, um, you know, even for out-of-print stuff. So, um, I mean, for what it's worth, mate, and, you know, I've not had a chance to really say it for a while, but that's definitely my position in the sense that, you know, I accept that Games Workshop make healthy profits, and I've stated on multiple occasions that there are instances even throughout this where, you know, their business interests has influenced what they've done from a kind of design perspective. However, you know, this is still a very niche hobby and it is ultimately a luxury item. It is not essential. Um, and as such, I am totally against, you know, 3D printing, replication, all of that sort of stuff of Games Workshop product because I personally, and this is my personal position, noting throughout all of this that I have no concern of those that choose to do otherwise. At the end of the day, everyone has to make peace with their own, you know, personal parameters of what they think is appropriate. But for me, you know, I want to support this hobby. I want to support the company through bad and good, you know, through, through you know, I've, I've gone through a lot of terrible additions. I've, I've, I've dealt with a lot of, you know, weirder times within the the kind of you know, games workshop history, but I've still supported them and still supported their product ranges because you know the hobby means a lot to me, um, and as such, that's what I try and do. Um, but yeah, there we go. Um, well, that's an interesting note, a more serious uh, way to end an episode of the Lookout Sir Warhammer Forty Thousand podcast. But end it we must. Um, because this thing is yet again going to be another epic saga so uh, yeah thanks very much guys Phil any closing thoughts on this or how, how are you feeling all good no no I, I, I'm all good we can we can sign off happy bunnies alright no worries well look guys thank you very much for checking out the show hopefully you made it this far if you didn't then you probably won't be hearing this bit but if you have thank you consider we have a patron it keeps us from not advertising which is something we don't like to do and we'll continue not to do thanks to the lovely people that do support us on Patreon. Uh, we have merchandise. And that's it. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.